Chapter One of Still William. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Still William by Rick Mall Crompton. Chapter One: The Bishop's Handkerchief. Until now, William had taken no interest in his handkerchiefs as toilet accessories. They were grayish once white squares useful for blotting ink or carrying frogs or making lifelike rats to divert the long hours of afternoon school but otherwise he had had no pride or interest in them but last week ginger a member of the circle known to themselves as the outlaws of which william was the leader had received a handkerchief as a birthday present from an aunt in london william on hearing the news had jeered but the sight of the handkerchief had silenced him it was a large handkerchief larger than william had conceived it possible for handkerchiefs to be it was made of silk and contained all the colours of the rainbow round the edge green dragons sported upon a red ground ginger displayed it at first deprecatingly fully prepared for scorn and merriment and for some moments the fate of the handkerchief hung in the balance but there was something about the handkerchief that impressed them kinder funny said henry critically jolly big isn't it said douglas uncertainly it's more like a sheet said william wavering between scorn and admiration ginger was relieved at any rate they had taken it seriously they had not wept tears of mirth over it that afternoon he drew it out of his pocket with a flourish and airily wiped his nose with it the next morning henry appeared with a handkerchief almost exactly like it and the day after that douglas had one william felt his prestige lowered he the born leader was the only one of the select circle who did not possess a coloured silk handkerchief that evening he approached his mother i don't think white ones is much use he said don't scrape your feet on the carpet william said his mother placidly i thought white ones were the only tame kind not that i think your father will let you have any more you know what he said when they got all over the floor and bit his finger i'm not talking about rats said william i'm talking about handkerchiefs oh handkerchiefs white ones are far the best they launder properly they come out a good colour at least yours don't but that's because you get them so black but there's nothing better than white linen personally said william with a judicial air i think silk's better than linen and white's so tiring to look at i think a kind of colour's better for your eyes my eyes do ache a bit sometimes i think it's probably with keep looking at white handkerchiefs don't be silly william i'm not going to buy you silk handkerchiefs to get covered with mud and ink and coal as yours do mrs brown calmly cut off her darning wool as she spoke and took another sock from the pile by her chair william sighed oh i wouldn't do those things with a silk one he said earnestly it's only because they're cotton ones i do those things linen corrected mrs brown linen and cotton's the same said william it's not silk i just want a silk one with colours on so on that's all that's all i want it's not much just a silk handkerchief with colours surely i'm not going to buy you another thing william said mrs brown firmly i had to get you a new suit and new collars only last month and your overcoat's dreadful because you will crawl through the ditch in it william resented this cowardly change of attack i'm not talking about suits and collars and overcoats and so on he said i'm talking about handkerchiefs i simply ask you if if you want a silk handkerchief william said mrs brown decisively you'll have to buy one well said william aghast at the unfairness of the remark well just fancy you saying that to me when you know i've not got any money when you know i'm not even going to have any money for years and years and years 
you shouldn't have broken the landing window said mrs brown william was pained and disappointed he had no illusions about his father and elder brother but he had expected more feeling and sympathy from his mother determinedly but not very hopefully he went to his father who was reading a newspaper in the library you know father said william confidingly taking his seat upon the newspaper rack i think white ones is all right for children and so on what i mean to say is that when you get older colored ones is better really said his father politely yes said william encouraged they wouldn't show dirt so either not like white ones do and they're bigger too they'd be cheaper in the end they wouldn't cost so much for laundry and so on exactly murmured his father turning over the next page well said william boldly if you'd very kindly buy me some or one would do or, or i could buy them or if you'd just give me and i haven't the remotest idea what you're talking about said his father i don't see how i can would you be so very kind as to remove yourself from the newspaper rack for a minute and let me get the evening paper i'm so sorry to trouble you thank you so much handkerchiefs said william impatiently i keep telling you it's handkerchiefs i just want a nice silk colored one cause i think it would last longer and be cheaper in the wash that's all i think the ones i have make such a lot of trouble for the laundry i just though deeply moved by your consideration for other people said mr brown as he ran his eye down the financial column i may as well save you any further waste of your valuable time and eloquence by informing you at once that you won't get a halfpenny out of me if you talk till midnight william went with silent disgust and slow dignity from the room next he investigated robert's bedroom he opened robert's dressing-table drawer and turned over his handkerchiefs he caught his breath with surprise and pleasure there it was beneath all robert's other handkerchiefs larger silkier more multicolored than ginger's or douglas's or henry's he gazed at it in ecstatic joy he slipped it into his pocket and standing before the looking-glass took it out with a flourish shaking its lustrous folds he was absorbed in this occupation when robert entered robert looked at him with elder brother disapproval i told you that if i caught you playing monkey tricks in my room again he began threateningly glancing suspiciously at the bed in the apple pie arrangements of which william was an expert i'm not robert said william with disarming innocence honest i'm not i just wanted to borrow a handkerchief i thought you wouldn't mind lending me a handkerchief well i would said robert shortly so you can jolly well clear out it was this one i thought you wouldn't mind lending me said william i wouldn't take one of your nice white ones but i thought you wouldn't mind me having this old colored dirty looking one uh, did you well give it back to me reluctantly william handed it back to robert how much you'll give it me for he said shortly well how much have you said robert ruthlessly uh, nothing not just at present admitted william but i'd do something for you for it i'd do anything you want done for it you just tell me what to do for it and i'll do it well you can um, uh, you can get the bishop's handkerchief for me and then i'll give mine to you uh, the trouble with robert was that he imagined himself a wit the trouble with william was that he took things literally the bishop was expected in the village the next day it was the great event of the summer he was a distant relation of the vicar's he was to open the sale of work address a large meeting on temperance spend the night at the vicarage and depart the next morning the bishop was a fatherly simple-minded old man of seventy he enjoyed the sale of work except for one thing wherever he looked he met the gaze of a freckled untidy frowning small boy he could not understand it the boy seemed to be everywhere the boy seemed to follow him around he came to the conclusion that it must be his imagination but it made him feel vaguely uneasy then he addressed the meeting on temperance 
his audience consisting chiefly of adults but in the very front seat the same earnest frowning boy fixed him with a determined gaze when the bishop first encountered this gaze he became slightly disconcerted and lost his place in his notes then he tried to forget the disturbing presence and address his remarks to the middle of the hall but there was something hypnotic in the small boy's gaze in the end the bishop yielded to it he fixed his eyes obediently upon william he harangued william earnestly and forcibly upon the necessity of self-control and the effect of alcohol upon the liver and william returned his gaze unblinkingly after the meeting william wandered down the road to the vicarage he pondered gloomily over his wasted afternoon fate had not thrown the bishop's handkerchief in his path but he did not yet despair on the way he met ginger ginger drew out his interminable colored handkerchief and shook it proudly uh, do you mean to say he said to william that you still use those old white ones william looked at him with cold scorn i'm too busy to bother with you just now he said ginger went on william looked cautiously through the vicarage hedge nothing was to be seen he crawled inside the garden and round to the back of the house which was invisible from the road the bishop was tired after his address he lay outstretched upon a deck chair beneath a tree over the head and face of his lordship was stretched a large superfine linen handkerchief william's set stern expression brightened on hands and knees he began to crawl through the grass towards the portly form his tongue protruding from his pursed lips crouching behind the chair he braced himself for the crime he measured the distance between the chair and the garden gate one two three then suddenly the portly form stirred the handkerchief was firmly withdrawn by a podgy hand and a dignified voice yawned and said hey oh at the same moment the bishop sat up william from his refuge behind the chair looked wildly round the door of the house was opening there was only one thing to do william was as nimble as a monkey like a flash of lightning he disappeared up the tree it was a very leafy tree it completely concealed william but william had a good bird's-eye view of the world beneath him the vicar came out rubbing his hands you rested my lord he said i'm afraid i've had forty winks said his lordship pleasantly just dropped off you know i dreamt about that boy who was at the meeting this afternoon what boy my lord asked the vicar well, i noticed him at the sale of work and the meeting he looked uh, he looked a soulful boy I, I dare say you know him the vicar considered i can't think of any boy around here like that he said the bishop sighed he may have been a stranger of course he said meditatively it seemed an earnest questing face as if the boy wanted something needed something i hope my little talk helped him without doubt it did my lord said the vicar politely i thought we might dine out here the days draw out so pleasantly now up in his tree william with smirks and hand-rubbing and mincing though soundless movements of his lips kept up a running imitation of the vicar's speech for the edification apparently of a caterpillar which was watching him intently the vicar went in to order dinner in the garden the bishop drew the delicate handkerchief once more over his rubicund features in the tree william abandoned his airy pastime and his face took on again the expression of soulful earnestness that had pleased the bishop the breast of the bishop on the lawn began to rise and sink the figure of the vicar was visible at the study window as he gazed with fond pride upon the slumbers of his distinguished guest william dared not descend in view of that watching figure finally it sat down in a chair by the window and began to read a book then william began to act he took from his pocket a bent pen attached to a piece of string this apparatus lived permanently in his pocket because he had not given up hope of catching a trout in the village stream 
he lowered this cautiously and drew the bent pen carefully on to the white linen expanse Phew, said the bishop bringing down his hand heavily not on the pen but near it the pen was loosened william drew it back cautiously up into the tree and the bishop settled himself once more to his slumbers again the pen descended again it caught <laughs> said the bishop testily shaking the handkerchief and again loosening the pen leaning down from his leafy retreat william made one last desperate effort he drew the bent pin sharply across it missed the handkerchief and caught the bishop's ear the bishop sat up with a scream william pin and string withdrew into the shade of the branches crumbs said william desperately to the caterpillar talk about bad luck the vicar ran out from the house full of concern at the sound of the bishop's scream i've been badly stung in the ear by some insect said the bishop in a voice that was pained and dignified some virulent tropical insect i should think very painful very painful indeed my lord said the vicar i am so sorry so so very sorry a, a thousand pardons can I, I procure some remedy for you of vaseline ammonia of cold cream up in the tree the pantomimic imitation of him went on much to william's satisfaction no 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 snapped the bishop this must be a bad place for insects that's all even before that some heavy creatures came banging against my handkerchief i put my handkerchief over my face for a protection if i'd failed to do that i should have been badly stung shall we dine indoors then my lord said the vicar oh no 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 said the bishop impatiently the vicar sat down upon his chair william collected a handful of acorns and began to drop them one by one upon the vicar's bald head he did this simply because he could not help it the sight of the vicar's bald head was irresistible each time an acorn struck the vicar's bald head it bounced up into the air and the vicar put up his hand and rubbed his head at first he tried to continue his conversation on the state of the parish finances with the bishop but his replies became distrait and incoherent he moved his chair slightly william moved the position of his arm and continued to drop acorns at last the bishop noticed it the acorns seem to be falling he said the vicar rubbed his head again oh don't they he said rather early commented the bishop isn't it he said as another acorn bounced upon his head the bishop began to take quite an interest in the unusual phenomenon i shouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of blight in that tree he said it would account for the premature dropping of the acorns and for the insects that attacked me exactly said the vicar irritably as yet another acorn hit him william's aim was unerring here a diversion was caused by the maid who came out to lay the table they watched her in silence the vicar moved his chair again and william after pocketing his friend the caterpillar shifted his position in the tree again to get a better aim do you know said the bishop i believe that there is a cat in the tree several times i've heard a slight rustling it would have been better for william to remain silent but william's genius occasionally misled him he was anxious to prevent investigation to prove once for all his identity as a cat he leant forward and uttered a re-echoing meow as imitations go it was rather good there was a slight silence then it is a cat said the bishop in triumph excuse me my lord said the vicar he went softly into the house and returned holding a shoe this will settle his feline majesty he smiled then he hurled the shoe violently into the tree shoo scoot he said as he did it william was annoyed the shoe narrowly missed his face he secured it and waited i hope you haven't lost the shoe said the bishop anxiously no oh, no the gardener's boy or someone will get it for me it's the best thing to do with cats it's probably scared it on to the roof he settled himself in his chair comfortably with a smile 
William leant down, held the shoe deliberately over the bald head, then dropped it. "'Damn!' said the vicar. "'Oh, excuse me, my lord.' Hmm, said the bishop, ah, yes, most annoying. It lodged in a branch for a time, probably, and then obeyed the force of gravity. The vicar was rubbing his head. William wanted to enjoy the sight of the vicar rubbing his head. He moved a little further up the branch. He forgot all caution. He forgot that the branch on which he was was not a very secure branch, and that the further up he moved, the less secure it became. There was the sound of a rending and a crashing, and on to the table between the amazed vicar and bishop descended William's branch, and William. The bishop gazed at him. Why, that's the boy, he said. William sat up among the debris of broken glasses and crockery. He discovered that he was bruised and that his hand was cut by one of the broken glasses. He extricated himself from the branch and the table, and stood rubbing his bruises and sucking his hand. Crumbs, was all he said. The vicar was gazing at him speechlessly. You know, my boy, said the bishop in mild reproach, that's a very curious thing to do, to hide up there for the purpose of eavesdropping. I know that you are an earnest, well-meaning little boy, and that you were interested in my address this afternoon, and I dare say you were hoping to listen to me again. But this is my time for relaxation, you know. Suppose the vicar and I had been talking about something we didn't want you to hear. I'm sure you wouldn't like to listen to things people didn't want you to hear, would you? William stared at him in unconcealed amazement. The vicar, with growing memories of acorns and shoes and dams, and with murder in his heart, was picking up twigs and broken glass. He knew that he could not, in the bishop's presence, say the things to William, and do the things to William that he wanted to do and say. He contented himself with saying, "'You'd better go home now. Tell your father I'll be coming to see him tomorrow.' "'Oh, a well-meaning little boy, I'm sure,' said the bishop kindly. "'Well-meaning, but unwise, <laughs> unwise. But your attentiveness during the meeting did you credit, my boy, did you credit?' William, for all his ingenuity, could think of no remark suitable to the occasion. "'Hurry up,' said the vicar. William turned to go. He knew when he was beaten. He had spent a lot of time and trouble, and had not even secured the Episcopal handkerchief. He had bruised himself and cut himself. He understood the vicar's veiled threat. He saw his already distant chances of pocket money vanish into nothingness when the cost of the vicar's glasses and plates was added to the landing window. He wouldn't have minded if he got the handkerchief. He wouldn't have minded anything if— "'Don't suck your hand, my boy,' said the bishop. "'An open cut like that is most dangerous. Poison works into the system by it. You remember I told you how the poison of alcohol works into the system?' Well, any kind of poison can work into it by a cut. Don't suck it. Keep it covered up. Haven't you a handkerchief? Oh, here, take mine. You needn't trouble to return it. It's an old one. The bishop was deeply touched by what he called the bright spirituality of the smile with which William thanked him. William, limping slightly, his hand covered by a grimy rag, came out into the garden, drawing from his pocket, with a triumphant flourish, an enormous, violently colored silk handkerchief. Robert, who was weeding the rose bed, looked up. Here, he called, you can jolly well go and put that handkerchief of mine back. William continued his limping, but proud, advance. It's all right, he called airily. The bishop's is on your dressing table. Robert dropped the trowel. Gosh, he gasped, and hastened indoors to investigate. William went down to the gate, smiling very slightly to himself. Oh, the days are drawing out so pleasantly, he was saying to himself in a mincing accent. Uh, Vaseline, uh, ammonia, uh, co cold cream, uh, damn. He leant over the gate, took out his caterpillar, satisfied himself that it was still alive, put it back, and looked up and down the road. In the distance he caught sight of the figure of his friend. "'Ginger!' he yelled in hideous shrillness. 
he waved his colored handkerchief carelessly in greeting as he called then he swaggered out into the road end of chapter one chapter two of still william by rick mall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two henri learns the language it was joan who drew william and the outlaws from their immemorial practice of playing at pirates and red indians i'm tired of being a squaw she said plaintively and i'm tired of walking a plank and i want to be something else and do something else joan was the only girl whose existence the outlaws officially recognized it was partly owing to joan's own personal attractiveness and partly to the fact that an admiration for joan was the only human weakness of their manly leader william thus joan was admitted to all such games as required the female element the others she was graciously allowed to watch they received her outburst with pained astonishment well said ginger coldly what else is there to do and be ginger felt that the very foundation of the society of outlaws was being threatened the outlaws had played at red indians and pirates since their foundation let's play at being ordinary people said joan ordinary people exploded douglas there's no playin and bein ordinary people what's the good let's be jasmine villas said joan warming to her theme we'll each be a person in jasmine villas william who had so far preserved a judicial silence now said i don't mind playin ordinary people as long as we don't do ordinary things oh no william said joan with the air of meekness with which she always received william's oracles we needn't do ordinary things then bags me be old mr burwash and me miss milton next door said joan hastily the outlaws were beginning to see vague possibilities in the game and me mr luton said ginger and me mr buck said douglas henry the remaining outlaw looked round him indignantly jasmine villas only contained four houses and what about me he said oh you be a policeman what walks about outside said william henry mollified began to practice a commanding strut in the field behind the old barn that was the scene of most of their activities they began to construct jasmine villas by boundary lines of twigs each inhabitant took up their position inside a twig encircled enclosure and henry paraded officiously around now we'll just have a minute to think of what things to do said william and then i'll begin william was sitting in his back garden thinking out exploits to perform that afternoon in the character of mr burwash the game of jasmine villas had taken on beyond all expectations mr burwash stole miss milton's washing during her afternoon siesta mr buck locked up mr luton in his coal cellar and ate up all his provisions and always the entire population of jasmine villas was chased round the field by henry the policeman several times during a game often some of them were arrested tried condemned and imprisoned by the stalwart henry to be rescued later by a joint force of the other inhabitants of jasmine villas william sitting on an inverted flower-pot absent-mindedly chewing grass and throwing sticks for his mongrel jumble to worry was wondering whether in his role of mr burwash it would be more exciting to go mad and resist the ubiquitous henry's efforts to take him to an asylum or marry miss milton the only drawback to the latter plan was that they had provided no clergyman however perhaps a policeman would do finally he decided that it would be more exciting to go mad and leave miss milton to someone else hello a thin lugubrious face appeared over the fence that separated william's garden from next door garden hello replied william throwing it a cold glance and returning to his pastime of entertaining jumbo i wish to learn ze english 
went on the owner of the lugubrious face my godmother here she talks the correct english it is the idiomatic english i wish to learn how you call it the slang you talk the slang is it not william gave the intruder a devastating glare gathering up his twigs and with a commanding high jumble set off round the side of the house oh william william sighed as he recognized his mother's voice this was followed by his mother's head which appeared at the open drawing-room window i'm busy jazz now said william sternly william mrs frame next door has a godson staying with her and he is so anxious to mix with boys and learn colloquial english i've asked him to tea this afternoon oh here he is the owner of the thin lugubrious face a young man of about eighteen appeared behind william i made a way of how you say or through a hole in the fence i wished to talk with the boy well now william said mrs brown persuasively you might spend the afternoon with henri and talk to him william's face was a study in horror and indignation i shan't know what to say to him he said desperately i can't talk his kind of talk i'm sure that'll be quite all right said mrs brown kindly he speaks english very well just talk to him simply and naturally she brought the argument to an end by closing the window and leaving an embittered william to undertake his new responsibility have you a holiday this afternoon began his new responsibility i have said william simply and naturally then we will talk said henri with enthusiasm we will talk and you will teach me the slang fraid i've got to play a game this afternoon said william icily as they set off down the road i will play said henri pleasantly i like the games i'm fraid said william with equal pleasantness there won't be no room for you i will watch then said henri i like to the watching henri who had spent the afternoon watching the game was on his way home he had enjoyed watching the game he had watched a realistically insane mr burwash resist all attempts at capture on the part of the local policeman he had watched mr luton propose to miss milton and he had watched mr buck in his end house being gloriously and realistically drunk this was an accomplishment of douglas's that was forbidden at home under threat of severe punishment but it was greatly appreciated by the outlaws henri walked along jauntily practising slang to himself oh the crumbs oh the crikey oh the jolly well right o git out the bosh on the mug general moult fat and important-looking came breezily down the road ah henri how are you getting on the jolly well said henri been for a walk said the general yet more breezily no i been to jasmine villas oh the crumbs oh i see old mr Bouwash go oh how you say it off the head out of the jump what oh yes that henri and the englishman i come and try to take him away and fight and fight and the policeman they go for help the general's mouth was hanging open in amazement b -b 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 are you sure he gasped oh yes said henri cheerfully i been there i have the jolly well watch eat but good heavens said the general and hastened in the direction of jasmine villas henri sauntered on by himself the only aunt all right the booze he murmured softly at the corner of the road he ran into mr graham graham mr graham graham was tall and lank with pince-nez and an earnest expression mr graham graham's earnest expression did not belie his character he was among other things the president of the local temperance society he had met henri with his godmother the day before well henri he said earnestly and how have you been spending your time i have been to jasmine villas said henri ah yes a tomb henri interrupted i have seen mr buck oh the crumbs oh you say tight boozed the, the, the drunk mr graham graham paled never he said 
Mr. Buck was the secretary of the local temperance society. Oh, yes, it's the only aunt, said Henri. is the policeman. I help him into the house. He was, uh, how you say, you were uh, ruling. This is impossible, said Mr. Graham Graham sternly. I have seen it, said Henri simply. I laugh. Oh, see, crikey, how oh, I laugh. Mr. Graham Graham turned upon Henri a cold, condemning, silent glance, then set off in the direction of Jasmine Villas. Henri wandered homewards. He met his godmother coming out of her front gate. We're going to Mrs. Brown's to tea, you know, Henri, she reminded him. Oh, all right, said Henri, all right, oh. He accompanied her to Mrs. Brown's and did you spend the afternoon with william said mrs brown pleasantly oh yes yeah, said henri as he sat down comfortably by the fire as the jasmine villes mr luton he kissed miss milton in the garden henri's godmother dropped her buttered scone nonsense she said he did said henri calmly i have seen him and she gave him how oh, you say the bash on the mug but she tell me she going to marry him right oh she told you gasped mrs brown oh yes said henri she tell me to herself both mrs brown and henri's godmother were pale uh, do you think she doesn't know that he's married and separated from his wife said henri's godmother i don't know said mrs brown i feel that i can't eat a thing now someone ought to tell her at once let's go said henri's godmother suddenly before she tells anyone else the poor woman they went out quickly leaving henri alone in the drawing-room henri chose a large sugared cake and began to munch it ze jolly well good he commented contentedly the general approached mr burwash's house cautiously there was no sign of a disturbance evidently the policeman had not yet returned with help the general entered the garden and went on tiptoe to the morning-room window. He was full of curiosity. There was the madman. He was sitting at a table with his back to the window. There was a mad look about his very back. The general was suddenly inspired by the idea of making the capture single-handed. It would be a glorious page in the annals of the village. The front door was open. The general entered and walked very slowly down the hall. The morning-room door was open. It was here that the general made the painful discovery that his boots squeaked. The squeaking would undoubtedly attract the attention of the lunatic as he entered. The general had another inspiration. He dropped down upon his hands and knees. He could thus make his way, unseen and unheard, to the back of the madman, then spring to his feet and overpower him. He entered the room. He reached the middle of the room. Then Mr. Burwash turned round. Mr. Burwash was met by the sight of the general creeping gingerly and delicately across his morning-room carpet on hands and knees. Mr. Burwash leapt to the not unreasonable conclusion that the general had gone mad. Mr. Burwash knew that a madman must be humoured. He also dropped upon his hands and knees. Bow wow, he said if the general thought he was a dog the general must be humoured bow wow promptly replied the general the general also knew that madmen must be humoured they continued this conversation for several minutes then mr burwash intent on escape made a leap towards the door and the general intent on capture made a leap to intercept him they leapt about the room excitedly uttering short shrill barks the general never quite knew what made him change into a cat it was partly that he was tired of barking and partly that he hoped to lure mr burwash after him into the more open space of the hall and there overpower him mr burwash's pursuit was realistic and the general violently chased into the hall decided to leave the capture to the police after all and made for the hall door but a furiously barking mr burwash cut off his retreat the general still meowing unconsciously in a high treble voice scampered on all fours up the stairs and took refuge in a small room at the top slamming the door against the pursuing lunatic the key was turned in the lock from outside 
at the top of the stairs mr burwash stood trembling slightly and wiped his brow a violent sound of kicking came from the locked room mrs brown and henri's godmother heard vaguely the distant sounds of the kicking next door but their delicate interview with miss milton was taking all their attention miss milton who had been to see a girl whom she was engaging as housemaid for mr luton was just taking off her things miss milton kept a purely maternal eye upon mr luton you know dear said henri's godmother we felt we had to come and tell you as soon as we heard the news he's got one already who said miss milton angular and severe looking mr luton he might have told me said miss milton but she's left him put in mrs brown then i'd better see about providing him with another said miss milton she uh, she's not divorced gasped mrs brown well i should hope not said miss milton primly i'm always most particular about that sort of thing but when we heard he's been kissing you said henri's godmother miss milton gave a piercing scream me she said yes when we heard that mr luton had been seen miss milton gave a still more piercing scream slanders she shrieked the vampires she advanced upon them quivering with rage i'm so sorry gasped mrs brown retreating precipitately uh, quite a mistake a uh, misunderstanding liars hypocrites snakes in the grass screamed miss milton still advancing mrs brown and henri's godmother fled trembling to the road miss milton's screams still rent the air there two curious sights met their eyes the general and mr graham graham were making their exits from the two end houses in unconventional fashion mr graham graham fell down the steps and rolled down the garden path to the road an infuriated mr buck watched his departure i'll teach you to come and insult respectable people shouted mr buck drunkard indeed and i've been secretary of the temperance society for forty years you're drunk let me tell you mr graham graham still sitting in the road put on his hat i'm not drunk he said with dignity i'll have the law on you shouted mr buck as libel that's what it is mr graham graham gathered together his collar ends and tried to find his stud i merely repeat what i've heard he said mr buck slammed the door and mr graham graham staggered to his feet then he stood open-mouthed his eyes fixed on the other end house the stout figure of the general could be seen emerging from a small first-floor window and making a slow and ungraceful descent down a drain-pipe it was noticed that he had no hat and that his knees were very dusty once on the ground he ran wildly across the garden into the road almost charging the little group who were watching him with pale horror-struck faces the four of them gazed at each other henri told me all four began simultaneously then stopped D -d do come and ha have some tea said mrs brown hysterically william was leading his outlaws quietly round from the front gate to the back of the house passing the drawing-room window on tiptoe suddenly william stopped dead gazing with interest into the drawing-room the expected tea-party was not there only henri still eating sugar-cakes was there william put his head through the open window i say he said in a hoarse whisper uh, they've been a gone oh yes smiled henri uh, they've been a gone right o come on said william to his followers they crept into the hall and then guiltily into the drawing-room william looked at the plates of dainty food with widening eyes surely he remarked plaintively if they've been and gone they don't mind us just finishing up what they've left surely william made this statement less at the dictates of truth than at the dictates of an empty stomach just uh, just look out of the window henri he said and tell us if any one comes henri obligingly took up his position at the window and the outlaws gave themselves up wholeheartedly to the task of finishing up they finished up the buttered scones and they finished up the bread and butter and they finished up the sandwiches and they finished up the biscuits and they finished up the small cakes and they finished up the two large cakes 
i'm just a bit tired of this old jasmine villas game said william his mouth full of sugar cake i votes we go back to pirates and red engines to-morrow the outlaws who were still busy agreed with grunts i think began douglas but just then henri at the window ejaculated shrilly oh is you holy aunt the outlaws hastily joined him four people were coming down the road the general could it be the general the drain-pipe had been very dirty mr graham graham his collar open his tie awry henri's godmother with her hat on one side and mrs brown her usual look of placid equanimity replaced by a look that was almost wild they were certainly coming to the brown's house william looked guiltily at the empty plates and cake stand except upon the carpet for the outlaws were not born drawing-room eaters there was not a crumb to be seen perhaps said william hastily to his friend perhaps uh, we'd better go now his friends agreed they went as quietly and unostentatiously as possible by way of the back regions henri remained at the window he watched the curious quartet as they came in at the gate details of their appearance unnoticed before became clear as they drew nearer the grands en zikraiki ejaculated henri it was uh, two hours later william sat disconsolately upon the upturned plant pot throwing stones half-heartedly at the fence jumble sat disconsolately by him snapping half-heartedly at flies the outlaws had nobly shared the sugar cakes with jumble and he was just beginning to wish that they hadn't suddenly henri's face appeared at the top of the fence hello he said hello sighed william ze talk to me said henri sadly oh ze talk to me just because i tell him about your little game yes said william bitterly and ow they talk to me just cause we finished up a few old cakes and things left over from tea you'd think to hear em that they'd have been glad to come home and find me starved dead henri uh, leant yet further over the fence but ze looked uh, oh ze looked there was silence for a moment while the mental vision of oh ze looked came to both then william's rare laugh unmusical and penetrating rang out mrs brown who was suffering from a severe headache as the result of the events of the afternoon hastily closed the drawing-room window followed henri's laugh high-pitched and like the neighing of a horse henri's godmother tore herself with a groan from the bed on which she was indulging in a nervous breakdown and flung up her bedroom window henri are you ill she cried what is it oh ze nosings cried henri then leaning yet more dangerously over the fence was ze game you going to play to-morrow william pirates said william regaining his usual calm like to come oh ze jolly well right oh yes said henri end of chapter two chapter three of still william by rick mal crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the sweet little girl in white the hall stood empty most of the year but occasionally tenants reawoke the passing interest of the village in it this summer it was taken by a mr and mrs bott with their daughter mr bott's name decorated most of the hoardings of his native country on these hoardings citizens of england were urged to safeguard their digestion by taking bott's sauce with their meat after reading bott's advertisements one felt convinced that any food without bott's sauce was rank poison one even felt that it would be safer to live on bott's sauce alone on such feelings had mr bott as rubicund and rotund as one of his own bottles of sauce reared a fortune sufficient to enable him to take the hall for the summer without as the saying is turning a hair william happened to be sitting on the fence by the side of the road when the motor containing mr and mrs bott both stout and overdressed and miss violet elizabeth bott and miss violet elizabeth bott's nurse flashed by william was not interested 
he was at the moment engaged in whittling a stick and watching the antics of his mongrel jumbo as he caught and worried each shaving but he had a glimpse of a small child with an elaborately curled head and an elaborately flounced white dress sitting by an elaborately uniformed nurse he gazed after the equipage scowling ah he said and it is impossible to convey in print the scorn of that monosyllable as uttered by william a girl then he returned to his whittling william's mother met mrs bod at the vicar's mrs bod who always found strangers more sympathetic than people who knew her well confided her troubles to mrs brown her troubles included her own rheumatism mr bott's liver and the carelessness of violet elizabeth's nerves always reading these here novelettes the girl is i hope you'll come and see me dear and didn't some one say you had a little boy do bring him i want violet elizabeth to get to know some nice little children mrs brown hesitated she was aware that none of her acquaintances would have described william as a nice little child mrs bott misunderstood her hesitation she laid a fat ringed hand on her knee oh, i know dear you're careful who the little laddie knows like me well now you needn't worry i brought up our violet elizabeth most particular she's a girly who wouldn't do your little boysie any harm <gasps> oh gasped mrs brown it's not that then you'll come dearie and to bring the little boysie with you won't you she took mrs brown's speechlessness for consent me said william indignantly me go to tea with that old girl me she is uh, she's a nice little girl said mrs brown weakly i saw her said william scathingly curls and things well you must come she's expecting you i only hope said william sternly that she won't expect me to talk to her she'll expect you to play with her i'm sure said his mother play said william play with a girl me uh -huh. william pale and proud and dressed in his best suit his heart steeled to his humiliating fate went with his mother to the hall the next week he was silent all the way there his thoughts were too deep for words mrs brown watched him anxiously an overdressed mrs bott was sitting in an overfurnished drawing-room she rose at once with an over-effusive smile and held out over-ringed hands so you've brought dear little boysy she began the over-effusive smile died away before the look that william turned on her uh, i hadn't thought of him quite like that she said weakly but i'm sure he's sweet she added hastily william greeted her coldly and politely then took his seat and sat like a small statue scowling in front of him his hair had been brushed back with so much vigour and application of liquid that it looked as if it were painted on his head would you like to look at a picture book boysy she said william did not answer he merely looked at her and she hastily turned away to talk to mrs brown she talked about her rheumatism and mr bott's liver and the incompetence of violet elizabeth's nurse then violet elizabeth entered violet elizabeth's fair hair was not naturally curly but as the result of great daily labour on the part of the much maligned nurse it stood up in a halo of curls round her small head the curls looked almost if not quite natural violet elizabeth's small pink and white face shone with cleanliness violet elizabeth was so treasured and guarded and surrounded with every care that her small pink and white face had never been known to do anything else except shine with cleanliness but the pièce de résistance about violet elizabeth's appearance was her skirts violet elizabeth was dressed in a white lace trimmed dress with a blue waistband and beneath the miniature blue waistband her skirts stood out like a tiny ballet dancer's in a filmy froth of lace trimmed petticoats from this cascade emerged violet elizabeth's bare legs to disappear ultimately into white silk socks and white buckskin shoes 
William gazed at this engaging apparition in horror. "'Good afternoon,' said Valid Elizabeth primly. "'Good afternoon,' said William in a hollow voice. "'Take the little boysie into the garden, Violet Elizabeth,' said her mother, "'and play with him nicely.' William and Violet Elizabeth eyed each other apprehensively. "'Come along, boy,' said Violet Elizabeth at last, holding out a hand. William ignored the hand, and, with the air of a hero bound to his execution, accompanied Violet Elizabeth into the garden. Mrs. Brown's eyes followed them anxiously. "'What's your name?' said Violet Elizabeth. She lisped. She would, thought William bitterly, with those curls and those skirts, she would. He felt at any rate relieved that none of his friends could see him in the unmanly situation, talking to a kid like that, all eyes and curls and skirts. William Brown, he said distantly, looking over her head as if he did not see her. How old are you? Eleven. My name's Violet Elizabeth. He received the information in silence. I'm thick. He made no comment. He examined the distant view with an abstracted frown. Now you must play with me. William allowed his cold glance to rest upon her. I don't play little girls' games, he said scathingly. But Violet Elizabeth did not appear to be scathed. Don't you know any little girls? she said pityingly. I'll teach you little girls' games, she added uh, pleasantly. I don't want to, said William. I don't like them. I don't like little girls' games. I don't want to know them. Violet Elizabeth gazed at him, open-mouthed. Don't you like little girls? she said. Me, said William, with superior dignity. Me? I don't know anything about em. Don't want to. D -d -d don't you like me? quavered Violet Elizabeth in incredulous amazement. William looked at her. Her blue eyes filled slowly with tears. Her lips quivered. I like you, she said. Don't you like me? William stared at her in horror. You, you, you do like me, don't you? William was silent. A large shining tear welled over and trickled down the small pink cheek. You're making me cry, sobbed Violet Elizabeth. You are. You're making me cry because you won't say you like me. I, uh, I do like you, said William desperately. Uh, honest, I, I do. Uh, don't, don't cry. I, I do like you. Uh, honest. A smile broke through the tear-stained face. I'm so glad, she said simply. You like all little girls, don't you? She smiled at him hopefully. You do, don't you? William, pirate and red Indian and desperado, William, woman-hater and girl-despiser, looked round wildly for escape and found none. Violet Elizabeth's eyes filled with tears again. You do like little girls, don't you? She persisted with quavering lip. You do, don't you? It was a nightmare to William. They were standing in full view of the drawing-room window. At any moment a grown-up might appear. He would be accused of brutality, of making little Violet Elizabeth cry. And strangely enough, the sight of Violet Elizabeth, with tear-filled eyes and trembling lips, made him feel that he must have been brutal indeed. Beneath his horror, he felt bewildered. "'Yes, I do,' he said hastily. I, "'I do, honest, I do.' She smiled again radiantly through her tears. "'You with you was a little girl, don't you?' "'Er, uh, yes, uh, honest, I do,' said the unhappy William. "'Kith me,' she said, raising her glowing face. William was broken. He brushed her cheek with his. "'That's not a kith,' said Violet Elizabeth. "'It's my kind of a kiss,' said William. "'All right, now let's play fairy. I'll show you how.' On the way home, Mrs. Brown, who always hoped vaguely that little girls would have a civilizing effect on William, asked William if he had enjoyed it. William had spent most of the afternoon in the character of a gnome, attending upon Violet Elizabeth in the character of the fairy queen. Any attempt at rebellion had been met with tear-filled eyes and trembling lips. He was feeling embittered with life. 
if all girls are like that said william well when you think of all the hundreds of girls there must be in the world well it makes you feel sick never had liberty and the comradeship of his own sex seemed sweeter to william than it did the next day when he set off whistling carelessly his hands in his pockets jumble at his heels to meet ginger and douglas across the fields you didn't come yesterday they said when they met they had missed william the leader no he said shortly went out to tea where they said with interest eh, nowhere in particular said william inaccurately a feeling of horror overcame him at the memory if they knew if they'd seen he blushed with shame at the very thought to regain his self-respect he punched ginger and knocked off douglas's cap after the slight scuffle that ensued they set off down the road what'll we do this morning said ginger it was sunny it was holiday time they had each other and a dog boyhood could not wish for more the whole world lay before them let's go trespassin said william the lawless where inquired douglas hall woods and take jumble that old keeper said he'd tell our fathers if he caught us in again said ginger i'll let him said william with a daredevil air slashing at the hedge with a stick he was gradually recovering his self-respect the nightmare memories of yesterday were growing faint he flung a stone for the eager jumbo and uttered his shrill unharmonious war-hoop they entered the woods william leading he swaggered along the path he was william desperado and scorner of girls yesterday was a dream it must have been no mere girl would dare even to speak to him he had never played at fairies with a girl he william the pirate king the robber chief william he turned his proud smile frozen in horror a small figure was flying along the path behind them a bare-headed figure with elaborate curls and very short lacy bunchy skirts and bare legs with white shoes and socks william darling i saw you from the nursery window coming along the road and i escaped nurth was reading a book and i escaped oh william darling play with me again do it was so nice yesterday william glared at her speechless he was glad of the presence of his manly friends yet horrified as to what revelations this terrible young female might make disgracing him forever in their eyes go away he said sternly at last we aren't playing girls games we don't like girls said ginger contemptuously william duff she said indignantly he said he did he said he liked all little girls he said he with ye what the little girl he kissed me and played fairies with me a glorious blush of a rich and dark red overspread william's countenance oh he ejaculated as if astounded at the depth of her untruthfulness but it was not convincing oh you did said violet elizabeth somehow that was convincing ginger and douglas looked at william rather coldly even jumble seemed to look slightly ashamed of him well come along said ginger we can't stop here all day talking to a girl but i want to come with you said violet elizabeth i want to play with you we're going to play boys games you wouldn't like it said douglas who was somewhat of a diplomatist i like boys games pleaded violet elizabeth and her blue eyes filled with tears please let me come all right said william we can't stop you coming don't take any notice of her he said to the others she'll soon get tired of it they set off william for the moment abashed and deflated followed humbly in their wake in a low-lying part of the wood was a bog the bog was always there but as it had rained in the night the bog to-day was particularly boggy it was quite possible to skirt this bog by walking round it on the higher ground but william and his friends never did this they preferred to pretend that the bog surrounded them on all sides as far as human eye could see and that at one false step they might sink deep in the morass never to be seen again 
come along said william who had recovered his spirits and position of leadership come along my brave fellows a tread carefully or instant death will be your fate and don't take any notice of her she'll soon have had enough for violet elizabeth was trotting gaily behind the gallant band they did not turn round or look at her but they could not help seeing her out of the corners of their eyes she plunged into the bog with a squeal of delight and stamped her elegant white-clad feet into the black mud isn't it lovely she squealed doth it feel nice oh squithy between your toes isn't it lovely i like boys games they could not help looking at her when they emerged as fairy-like as ever above her feet were covered with black mud up to above her socks shoes and socks were sodden it's a lovely feeling she commented delightedly on the other side let's do it again but william and his band remembered their manly dignity and strode off without answering she followed with short dancing steps each of them carried a stick with which they smote the air or any shrub they passed violet elizabeth secured a stick and faithfully imitated them they came to a clear space in the wood occupied chiefly by giant blackberry bushes laden with fat ripe berries now my brave fellows said william take your fill tis well we found this bit of food or we would even have starved and don't help her or get any for her and let her get all scratched and she'll soon have had enough they fell upon the bushes violet elizabeth also fell upon the bushes she crammed handfuls of ripe blackberries into her mouth gradually her pink and white face became obscured beneath a thick covering of blackberry juice stain her hands were dark red her white dress had lost its whiteness it was stained and torn her bunchy skirts had lost their bunchiness the brambles tore at her curled hair and drew it into that state of straightness for which nature had meant it the brambles scratched her face and arms and legs and still she ate i'm getting more than any of you she cried i guess i'm getting more than any of you and i'm getting all of a mess isn't it fun i like boys games they gazed at her with a certain horrified respect and apprehension would they be held responsible for the strange change in her appearance they left the blackberry bushes and set off again through the wood at a sign from william they dropped on all fours and crept cautiously and as they imagined silently along the path violet elizabeth dropped also upon her scratched and blackberry stained knees look at me she shrilled proudly i'm doing it too just like boys oh shish william said fiercely violet elizabeth shished obediently and for a time crawled along contentedly are we playing bein animals she piped at last shut up hissed william violet elizabeth shut up except to whisper to ginger who was just in front i'm a snail what you ginger did not deign to reply at a sign from their leader that all danger was over the outlaws stood upright william had stopped we've thrown em off the scent he said scowling but danger surrounds us on every side we'd better plunge into the jungle and i bet she'll soon have had enough plunging into the jungle they left the path and plunged into the dense shoulder-high undergrowth at the end of the line plunged violet elizabeth she fought her way determinedly through the bushes she left remnants of her filmy skirts on nearly every bush long spidery arms of brambles caught at her hair again and pulled out her curls but violet elizabeth liked it isn't it fun she piped as she followed under a large tree william stopped now we'll be red indians he said and go hunting i'll be brave heart same as usual and ginger be hawk face and douglas be lightning eye and what shall i be said the torn stained and wild-headed apparition that had been a violet elizabeth douglas took the matter in hand what shall i be he mimicked shrilly what shall i be what shall i be violet elizabeth did not run home in tears as he had hoped she would she laughed gleefully it does sound funny when you say it like that she said delightedly oh it does say it again please say it again
douglas was nonplussed anyway he said you jolly well aren't going to play so there please let me play said violet elizabeth please no go away william and ginger secretly admired the firm handling of this female by douglas please douglas no violet elizabeth's blue eyes fixed pleadingly upon him filled with tears violet elizabeth's underlip trembled you're making me cry she said a tear traced its course down the blackberry stained cheek please douglas douglas hesitated and was lost oh well he said oh thank you dear douglas said violet elizabeth what shall i be well said william to douglas sternly now you've let her play i suppose she'd better be a squaw a squaw said violet elizabeth joyfully what sort of noise does it make it's an indian lady and it don't make any sort of a noise said ginger crushingly now we're going out hunting and you stay and cook the dinner all right said violet elizabeth obligingly kiss me good-bye ginger stared at her in horror but you must she said if you're going out to work and i'm going to cook the dinner you must kiss me good-bye they do i don't said ginger she held up her small face please ginger blushing to his ears ginger just brushed her cheek with his william gave a derisive snort his self-respect had returned douglas's manly severity had been overborne ginger had been prevailed upon to kiss her well they couldn't laugh at him now they jolly well couldn't both were avoiding his eye well go off to work dear william and douglas and ginger said violet elizabeth happily i'll cook gladly the hunters set off the red indian game had palled it had been a success while it lasted ginger had brought some matches and over her purple layer of blackberry juice the faithful squaw now wore a layer of black from the very smoky fire they had at last managed to make come on said william let's set out looking for adventures they set off single file as before violet elizabeth bringing up the rear jumble darting about in ecstatic searches for imaginary rabbits another small bog glimmered ahead violet elizabeth drunk with her success as a squaw gave a scream another squithy bath she said i want to be first she flitted ahead of them ran to the bog slipped and fell into it face forward she rose at once she was covered in black mud from head to foot her face was a black mud mask through it her teeth flashed in a smile i just slipped she explained a man's voice came suddenly from the main path through the wood at their right look at em the young rascals look at em and a dog bloster ar the last was a sound expressive of rage and threatening keepers said william run for your lives braves come on jumble they fled through the thicket please gasped violet elizabeth in the rear i can't run as fast as that it was ginger and douglas who came back to hold her hands for all that they ran fleetly dashing through the undergrowth where the keepers found it difficult to follow and dodging round trees at last breathlessly they reached a clearing and in the middle of it a cottage as small and attractive as a fairy tale cottage the door was open it had an empty look they could hear the keepers coming through the undergrowth shouting come in here gasped william it's empty come in and hide till they've gone the four ran into a spotlessly clean little kitchen and ginger closed the door the cottage was certainly empty there was not a sound isn't it a sweet little house panted violet elizabeth come upstairs said douglas they might look in here the four jumbo scrambling after them clattered up the steep narrow wooden stairs and into a small and very clean bedroom look out of the window and see when they go past commanded william then we'll slip out and go back douglas peeped cautiously out of the window he gave a gasp they're they're not going past he said they're they're, they're coming in at the door the men's voices could be heard below coming in here the young rascals look at their footmarks see what'll my old woman say when she gets home they've gone upstairs too look at the marks blarst em 
William went to the window, holding Jumbo beneath his arm. We can easily climb down by this pipe, he said quickly. Then we'll run back. He swung a leg over the window sill, prepared to descend with Jumbo clinging round his neck, as Jumbo was trained to do. Jumbo's life consisted chiefly of an endless succession of shocks to the nerves. Ginger and Douglas prepared to follow. The men's footsteps were heard coming upstairs, when a small voice said plaintively, "'Pleath, pleath, I can't do that. Pleath, you're not going to leave me, are you?' William put back his foot. We, uh, we can't leave her, he said. Ginger and Douglas did not question their leader's decision. They stood in a row facing the door while the footsteps drew nearer. The door burst open and the two keepers entered. Now, you young rascals, we've got your... Into Mr. Bott's library were ushered two keepers, each leading two children by the neck. One held two rough-looking boys, the other held a rough-looking boy and a rough-looking little girl. A dejected-looking mongrel followed the procession. "'Trespassin', sir,' said the first keeper. "'Trespassin' and a damagin' of the woods. Old Anne's, too. Seen him at it before, but never caught him till now. And a dog, too. It's an example makin' of what they want, sir. They want prosecutin', if I make so bold, a damaging of the woods and a bringin' of a dog.' Mr. Bott, who was new to squiredom and had little knowledge of what was expected of him, and, moreover, was afflicted at the moment with severe private domestic worries, cast a harassed glance at the four children. His glance rested upon Violet Elizabeth without the faintest flicker of recognition. He did not recognize her. He knew Violet Elizabeth. He saw her at least once or almost once a day. He knew her quite well. He knew her by her ordered flaxen curls, pink and white face, and immaculate bunchy skirts. He did not know this little creature, with the torn, stained, bedraggled dress, there was nothing bunchy about it now, whose extremely dirty face could just be seen beneath the tangle of untidy hair that fell over her eyes. She watched him silently and cautiously. Just as he was going to speak, violet elizabeth's nurse entered it says much for violet elizabeth's disguise that her nurse only threw her a passing glance violet elizabeth's nurse eyes were red-rimmed please sir mrs bott says is there any news no said mr bott desperately tell her i've rung up the police every minute since she sent last how is she please sir she's in hysterics again mr bott groaned Ever since Violet Elizabeth's disappearance, Mrs. Bott had been indulging in hysterics in her bedroom and taking it out of Violet Elizabeth's nurse. In return, Violet Elizabeth's nurse had hysterics in the nursery and took it out of the nursery maid. In return, the nursery maid had hysterics in the kitchen and took it out of the kitchen maid. The kitchen maid had no time for hysterics, but she took it out of the cat. "'Please, sir, she says she's too ill to speak now. She told me to tell you so, sir.' Mr. Bott groaned again. Suddenly he turned to the four children and the keepers. "'You've got their names and addresses, haven't you? Well, see here, children. Go out and see if you can find my little gal for me. She's lost. Look in the woods and round the village and, and everywhere, and if you find her, I'll let you off. See?' They murmured perfunctory thanks and retired followed by Violet Elizabeth, who had not uttered one word within her paternal mansion. In the woods they turned on her sternly. "'It's you he wants. You're her.' "'Yeth,' agreed the tousled ragamuffin, who was Violet Elizabeth, sweetly. "'Ith me. Well, we're going to find you and take you back.' "'Oh, please, I don't want to be found and took em back. I like being with you.' "'Well, we can't keep you about with us all day, can we?' argued William sternly. "'You've got to go home sometime, same as we got to go home sometime. "'Well, we jolly well want our dinner now, and we're jolly well going home, "'and we're jolly well going to take you home. "'He might give us something, and—' "'All right,' agreed Violet Elizabeth, holding up her face. "'If you'll all kiss me, and I'll be found, and took em back.' The four of them stood again before Mr. Bott's desk. William and Ginger and Douglas took a step back, and Violet Elizabeth took a step forward. "'We found her,' said William. "'Where?' said Mr. Bott, looking round. 
if me piped violet elizabeth mr bott started you he repeated in amazement yes father if me but but oh, god bless my soul he ejaculated peering at the unfamiliar apparition it's impossible then he rang for violet elizabeth's nurse is this violet elizabeth he said yes if me said violet elizabeth again violet elizabeth's nurse pushed back the tangle of hair oh the poor poor child she cried the poor child god bless my soul said mr bott again take her away i don't know what you do to her but do it and don't let her mother see her till it's done and you boys stay here oh my lamb sobbed violet elizabeth's nurse as she led her away my poor lamb in an incredibly short time they returned the mysterious something had been done violet elizabeth's head was a mass of curls her face shone with cleanliness dainty lace-trimmed skirts dug out ballet dancer wise beneath the pale blue waistband mr bott took a deep breath now fetch her mother he said like a tornado entered mrs bott she still heaved with hysterics she enfolded violet elizabeth to her visibly palpitating bosom oh my child she sobbed oh my darling child a what a squaw said violet elizabeth it doesn't make any sort of a noise it's a lady how did you began mrs bott still straining violet elizabeth to her these boys found her said mr bott oh how kind how noble said mrs bott and one's that nice little boy who played with her so sweetly yesterday give them ten shillings each body well but hesitated mr bott remembering the circumstances in which they had been brought to him botty screamed mrs bott tearfully don't you value your darling child's life at even thirty shillings hastily mr bott handed them each a ten shilling note they tramped homewards by the road well it's turned out all right said ginger lugubriously but fingering the ten shilling note in his pocket but it might not have cept for the money it jolly well spoilt the morning girls always do said william i'm not going to have anything to do with any old girl ever again it's all very well saying that said douglas who had been deeply impressed that morning by the inevitableness and deadly persistence of the sex it's all very well saying that it's them what has to do with you and i'm never going to marry any old girl said william it's all very well saying that said douglas again gloomily but some old girl probably marry you end of chapter three chapter four of still william by rick mal crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four william turns over a new leaf william had often been told how much happier he would be if he would follow the straight and narrow path of virtue but so far the thought of that happiness had left him cold he preferred the happiness that he knew by experience to be the result of his normal wicked life to that mythical happiness that was prophesied as the result of a quite unalluring life of righteousness suddenly however he was stirred an old boy had come to visit the school and had given an inspiring address to the boys in which he spoke of the beauty and usefulness of a life of self-denial and service william for the first time began to consider the question seriously he realized that his life so far had not been strictly speaking a life of self-denial and service the old boy said many things that impressed william he pictured the liver of the life of self-denial and service surrounded by a happy grateful and admiring family circle he said that every one would love such a character william tried to imagine his own family circle as a happy grateful and admiring family circle it was not an easy task even to such a vivid imagination as william's but it was not altogether impossible after all nothing was altogether impossible while the headmaster was proposing a vote of thanks to the eloquent and perspiring old boy 
William was deciding that there might be something in the idea after all. When the bell rang for the end of school, William had decided that it was worth trying at any rate. He decided to start first thing next morning, not before. William was a good organizer. He liked things cut and dried. A new day for a new life. It was no use beginning to be self-denying and self-sacrificing in the middle of a day that had started quite differently. If you were going to have a beautiful character and a grateful family circle, you might as well start the day fresh with it, not drag it over from the day before. It would be jolly nice to have a happy, grateful, and admiring family circle, and William only hoped that if he took the trouble to be self-denying and self-sacrificing, his family circle would take the trouble to be happy and grateful and admiring. There were dark doubts about this in William's mind. His family circle rarely did anything that was expected of them. Still, William was an optimist, and anything might happen and tomorrow was a whole holiday. He could give all his attention to it all day. He looked forward to the new experience with feelings of pleasant anticipation. It would be interesting and jolly. Meantime, there was a whole half of today left, and it was no use beginning the life of self-denial and service before the scheduled time. He joined his friends, Ginger, Henry, and Douglas, after school, and together they trespassed on the lands of the most irascible farmer they knew in the hopes of a pleasant chase. The farmer happened to be in the market town, so their hopes were disappointed as far as he was concerned. They paddled in his pond and climbed his trees and uttered defiant shouts to his infuriated dog and were finally chased away by his wife with a fire of hard and knobbly potatoes. One got William very nicely on the side of his head, but his head, being as hard and knobbly as the potato, little damage was done. Next they scouted each other through the village, and finally went into Ginger's house and performed military maneuvers in Ginger's bedroom, till Ginger's mother sent them away because the room just below happened to be the drawing-room and the force of the military maneuvers was disintegrating the ceiling and sending it down in picturesque white flakes into Ginger's mother's hair. They went next to Henry's garden, and there, with much labor, made a bonfire. Ginger and Douglas plied the fire with fuel, and William and Henry, with a wheelbarrow and the garden hose, wearing old tins on their heads, impersonated the fire brigade. During the exciting scuffles that followed, the garden hose became slightly involved, and finally four dripping boys fled from the scene, and from possible detection, leaving only the now swimming bonfire, the wheelbarrow, and hose to mark the scene of action. A long rest in a neighboring field in the still blazing sunshine soon partially dried them. While reclining at ease, they discussed the latest Red Indian stories which they had read, and the possibility of there being any wild animals left in England. "'I bet there is,' said Ginger earnestly. "'They hide in the daytime so's no one'll see em, and they come out at night. No one goes into the woods at night, so no one knows if there is or if there isn't. And I bet there is. Anyway, let's get up some night and take our bows and arrows and look for em.' I bet we'll find some. Let's tonight, said Douglas eagerly. William remembered suddenly the life of virtue to which he had mentally devoted himself. He felt that the nocturnal hunting for wild animals was incompatible with it. I can't tonight, he said with an air of virtue. Ah, you're afraid, taunted Henry, not because he had the least doubt of William's courage, but simply to introduce an element of excitement into the proceedings he succeeded when finally henry and william arose breathless and bruised from the ditch where the fight had ended douglas and ginger surveyed them with dispassionate interest william won and you're both in a jolly old mess henry removed some leaves and bits of grass from his mouth all right you're not afraid he said pacifically to william when will you come hunting wild animals william considered 
he was going to give the life of virtue of self-denial and service a fair day's trial but there was just the possibility that from william's point of view it might not be a success it would be as well to leave the door to the old life open well, i'll tell you to-morrow he said guardedly all right i say let's race to the end of the field on only one leg come on ready one two three go two william awoke it was morning it was the morning on which he was to begin his life of self-denial and service he raised his voice in one of his penetrating and tuneless morning songs then stopped abruptly case i disturb any one he remarked virtuously to his brush and comb his father frequently remarked that william's early morning songs were enough to drive a man to drink he brushed his hair with unusual vigour and descended to breakfast looking for william unusually sleek and virtuous his father was reading the paper in front of the fire good morning father said william in a voice of suave politeness his father grunted did you hear me not singin this morning father said william pleasantly it was as well that his self-denial should not be missed by the family circle his father did not answer william sighed some family circles were different from others it was hard to imagine his father happy and grateful and admiring but still he was going to have a jolly good try his mother and sister and brother came down william said good morning to them all with unctuous affability his brother looked at him suspiciously what mischief are you up to he said ungraciously william merely gave him a long silent and reproachful glance what are you going to do this morning william dear said his mother i don't mind what i do said william i just want to help you i'll do anything you like mother she looked at him anxiously are you feeling quite well dear she said with concern if you want to help said his sister sternly you might dig up that piece of my garden you and those other boys trampled down yesterday william decided that a life of self-denial and service need not include fagging for sisters who spoke to one in that tone of voice he pretended not to hear can i do anything at all for you this morning mother dear he said earnestly his mother looked too taken aback to reply his father rose and folded up his newspaper take my advice he said and beware of that boy this morning he's up to something william sighed again some family circles simply didn't seem able to recognize a life of self-denial and service when they met it after breakfast he wandered into the garden before long ginger douglas and henry came down the road come on william they called over the gate for a moment william was tempted somehow it seemed a terrible waste of a holiday to spend it in self-denial and service instead of in search of adventures with ginger douglas and henry but he put the temptation away when he made up his mind to do a thing he did it can't come to-day he said sternly i'm busy oh go on well i am and i'm just not comin and kindly stop throwin stones at our cat call it a cat thought it was an old fur glove that somebody'd thrown away in the furious defence of his household's cat whose life william in private made a misery william leapt to the gate the trio fled down the road william returned to his meditations his father had gone to business and ethel and robert had gone to golf his mother drew up the morning-room window william darling aren't you going to play with your friends this morning william turned to her with an expression of solemnity and earnestness i want to help you mother i don't want her play with my friends he felt a great satisfaction with this speech it breathed the very spirit of self-denial and service i'll try to find that bottle of tonic you didn't finish after whooping cough said his mother helplessly as she drew down the window william stared around him disconsolately it was hard to be full of self-sacrifices and service and to find no outlet for it nobody seemed to want his help then a brilliant idea occurred to him he would do something for each of his family something that would be a pleasant surprise when they found out he went up to his bedroom 
there in a drawer was a poem that he had found in robert's blotter the week before it began oh marion so young and fair with silken hair it must be marion dexter she was fair and well more or less young william supposed william didn't know about her hair being silken it looked just like ordinary hair to him but you never knew with girls he had kept the poem in order to use it as a weapon of offence against robert when occasion demanded but that episode belonged to his old evil past in his new life of self-denial and service he wanted to help robert the poem ended i should be happy i aver if thou my suit wouldst but prefer that meant that robert wanted to be engaged to her poor robert perhaps he was too shy to ask her or perhaps he'd asked her and she'd refused well it was here that robert needed some help william with a determined expression set off down the road three he knocked loudly at the door by a lucky chance marion dexter came to the door herself good afternoon she said good afternoon said william in a business-like fashion has robert ever asked you to marry him no what a peculiar question to ask on the front doorstep do come in william followed her into the drawing-room she shut the door they both sat down william's face was set and frowning he's deep in love with you he said in a conspiratorial whisper marion's eyes danced did he send you to tell me william ignored the question he's deep in love with you and wants you to marry him marion dimpled why can't he ask me then he's shy said william earnestly he's always shy when he's in love he's always awful shy with the people what he's in love with but he wants most awful bad to marry you do marry him please just for kindness i'm trying to be kind that's why i'm here i see she said are you sure he's in love with me deep in love writin poetry and carryin on not sleepin and not eatin and murmurin your name and puttin his hand on his heart and carvin your initials all over the house and sendin you flowers and things said william drawing freely on his imagination well i've never had flowers from him no they all got lost in the post said william without turning a hair but he's dyin slow of love for you he's gettin thinner and thinner if you don't be engaged to him soon he'll be stone dead he'll die of love like what they do in tales and then you'll probably get hung for murder good heavens said miss dexter well i hope you won't said william kindly and i'll do all i can to save you if you are but if an you kill robert with not getting engaged to him probably you will be does he know you've come to ask me said miss dexter no i wanted to be surprised to him said william it will be that murmured miss dexter you will marry him then said william hopefully oh certainly if he wants me to perhaps said william after a slight pause you'd better write it in a letter cos he'd like as not not believe me with eyes dancing and lips quivering with suppressed laughter miss dexter sat down at her writing-table dear robert she wrote at william's earnest request i promise to be engaged to you and to marry you whenever you like yours sincerely marion dexter she handed it to william william read it gravely and put it in his pocket thanks ever so much he said fervently oh don't mention it said miss dexter demurely quite a pleasure he walked down the road in a rosy glow of virtue well he'd done something for robert that ought to make robert grateful to him for the rest of his life he'd helped robert all right he'd like to know what service was if it wasn't that getting people engaged to people they wanted to be engaged to jolly hard work too now there remained his mother and ethel he must go home and try to find some way of helping them Four when he reached home ethel was showing out mrs helm a tall stern-looking lady whom william knew by sight i'm so frightfully disappointed not to be able to come ethel was saying regretfully but i'm afraid i must go to the morrisons i promised over a week ago thank you so much for asking me good morning 
william followed her into the dining-room where his mother was what did she want dear said mrs brown oh, go and wash your hands william she wanted me to go in this evening but i told her i couldn't because i was going to the morrisons thank heaven i had an excuse william unfortunately missed the last sentence as still inspired by high ideals of virtue he had gone at once upstairs to wash his hands while he splashed about at the hand basin an idea suddenly occurred to him that was how he'd help ethel he'd give her a happy evening she should spend it with the helms and not with the morrisons she'd sounded so sorry that she had to go to the morrisons and couldn't go to the helms he'd fix it all up for her this afternoon he'd help her like he'd helped robert he had hoped to be able to give robert miss dexter's note at lunch but it turned out that robert was lunching at the golf club with a friend directly after lunch william set off to mrs morrison's house he was shown into the drawing-room mrs morrison large and fat and comfortable looking entered she looked rather bewildered as she met William's stern, frowning gaze. "'I've come from Ethel,' said William aggressively. "'She's sorry she can't come tonight.' Mrs. Morrison's cheerful countenance fell. "'The girls will be disappointed,' she said. "'They saw her this morning, and she said she was looking forward to it.' Some explanation seemed necessary. William was never one to stick at half-measures. "'She's been took ill since then,' he said oh dear said mrs morrison with concern nothing serious i hope william considered if it wasn't serious she might expect ethel to recover by the evening she'd better have something serious well, i'm afraid it is he said gloomily dear dear said mrs morrison Tita, what is it william thought over all the complaints he knew none of them seemed quite serious enough she might as well have something really serious while he was about it then he suddenly remembered hearing the gardener talking to the housemaid the day before. He'd been talking about his brother, who got, uh, what was it, uh, epi, uh, epi, uh, epilepsy, said William suddenly. What? screamed Mrs. Morrison. William, having committed himself to epilepsy, meant to stick to it. Epilepsy, the doctor says, he said firmly. Good heavens, said Mrs. Morrison, when did you find out? will he be able to cure it is the poor girl in bed how does it affect her what a dreadful thing william was flattered at the impression he seemed to have made he wondered whether it were possible to increase it the doctor says she's got a bit of consumption too he said casually but he's not quite sure mrs morrison screamed again heavens and she always looks so healthy the girls will be so distressed william do tell me when did your mother realize there was something wrong william foresaw that the conversation was becoming complicated he did not wish to display his ignorance of the symptoms of epilepsy and consumption just soon after lunch he said with rising cheerfulness now i better be going i think good afternoon he left Mrs. Morrison still gasping upon the sofa, and in the act of ringing for her maid to fetch her smelling salts. William walked down the road with a swagger. He was managing jolly well. The next visit was easier. He simply told Mrs. Helm's maid at the front door to tell Mrs. Helm that Ethel would be able to come tonight after all. Thank you very much. Then he swung off to the woods with Jumble, his faithful dog. In accordance with his new life of virtue, he walked straight along the road, without burrowing in the ditches or throwing stones at telegraph posts. His exhilaration slowly vanished. He wondered where Ginger and Henry and Douglas were, and what they were doing. It was jolly dull all alone, but still the happiness and gratitude and admiration of his family circle, when they found out all he had done for them, would repay him for everything at least he hoped it would his mother he had done nothing for his mother yet he must try to do something for his mother five when he returned home it was almost dinner time his mother and ethel and robert were still out the cook met him with a lugubrious face now master william she said can i trust you to give a message to your ma yes cook said william virtuously 
me cold in me eds that bad i can't stand on my feet no longer that ussy ellen wouldn't give up her night out to help me not she and yet her ma and if i'd leave things earl ready to wash up i might go and rest after dinner if i felt bad well she'll be hen any minute now and just tell her it's all ready to dish up tell her i haven't made no puddin but i've opened a bottle of stewed pears all right cook said william cook took the paper-backed copy of a mill girl's romance from the kitchen dresser and slowly sneezed her way up the back stairs william was to all intents and purposes alone in the house he wandered into the kitchen there was a pleasant smell of cooking several saucepans simmered on the gas stove on the table was a glass dish containing the stewed pears his father hated cold stewed fruit he often said so suddenly william had yet another brilliant idea he'd make a proper pudding for his father it wouldn't take long the cookery book was on the dresser you just did what the book told you it was quite easy he went over to the gas stove all the gas rings were being used he'd better get one clear for his pudding he supposed his pudding would need a gas ring same as all the other things there were two small saucepans each containing dark brown stuff they might as well be together thought william with a business-like frown he poured the contents of one of the saucepans into the other he had a moment's misgiving as the mingled smell of gravy and coffee arose from the mixture then he turned to his pudding he opened the book at random at the puddings any would do beat three eggs together he fetched a bowl of eggs from the larder and got down a clean basin from the shelf he'd seen cook doing it just cracking the eggs and the egg slithered into the basin and she threw the shells away it looked quite easy he broke an egg the shell fell neatly onto the table and the egg slithered down william onto the floor he tried another and the same thing happened william was not easily balked he was of a persevering nature he went on breaking eggs till not another egg remained to be broken and then and then only did he relinquish his hopes of making a pudding then and then only did he step out of the pool of a dozen broken eggs in which he was standing and literally soaked in egg from the waist downward go to replace the basin on the shelf his thirst for practical virtue was not yet sated surely there was something he could do even if he couldn't make a pudding yes he could carry the things into the dining-room so that they could have dinner as soon as they came in he opened the oven door a chicken on a large dish was there good burning his fingers severely in the process william took it out he'd put it on the dining-room table all ready for them to begin just as he stood with the dish in his hands he heard his mother and robert come in he'd go and give robert miss dexter's letter first he looked round for somewhere to put the chicken the table seemed to be full he put the dish and the chicken onto the floor and went into the hall closing the door behind him robert and his mother had gone into the drawing-room william followed well william said mrs brown pleasantly had a nice day without a word william handed the note to robert robert read it he went first red then pale then a wild look came into his eyes marion dexter he said you're in love with her aren't you said william you've been writing poems to her not to marion dexter screamed robert she's an old woman she's nearly twenty-five it's marion heatherly i uh, well how was i to know said william in a voice of irritation you should put their surnames in the poems i thought you wanted to be engaged to her i've took a lot of trouble over getting her to write that robert was reading and re-reading the note my god he said in a hushed voice of horror i'm engaged to marion dexter robert said mrs brown i don't think you ought to use expressions like that before your little brother whoever you're engaged to i'm engaged to marion dexter repeated robert in a tone of frenzy me chained to her for life when i love another 
robert dear said mrs brown if there's been any mistake i'm sure that all you have to do is go to miss dexter and explain explain said robert wildly how can i explain she's accepted me how can any man of chivalry refuse to marry a woman who oh, it's too much he sat down on the sofa and held his head in his hands it's the ruin of all my hopes he's simply spoilt my life he's always spoiling my life i shall have to marry her now and she's an old woman she was twenty-four last birthday i know well i was trying to help said william i'll teach you to help said robert darkly advancing upon him william dodged and fled towards the door there he collided with ethel ethel with a pale distraught face it's all over the village mother she said angrily as she entered william's told everyone in the village that i've got epilepsy and consumption i didn't said william indignantly i only told mrs morrison but william said his mother sitting down weakly on the nearest chair why on earth well ethel didn't want to go to the morrisons to-night she wanted to go to the helms i did not said ethel i was glad to get out of going to the helms well how was i to know said william desperately i had to go by what you said and i had to go by what robert wrote i wanted to help i've took no end of trouble living a life of self-sacrifice and service all day without stopping once instead of being grateful and happy and admiring but william said mrs brown how did you think it was going to help anyone to say that ethel had epilepsy and consumption i'd rather have epilepsy and consumption said robert who had returned to the sofa and was sitting with his head between his hands than be engaged to marion dexter i must say i simply can't understand why you've been doing all this william said mrs brown we must just wait till your father comes in and see what he makes of it and i can't think why dinner's so late ah she's gone to bed said william gloomily i'd better see to things then said mrs brown going into the hall epilepsy groaned ethel twenty-four twenty-four if she's a day and the sort of hair i've always disliked groaned robert william followed his mother to the kitchen rather than be left to the tender mercies of ethel and robert he began to feel distinctly apprehensive about the kitchen that pool of eggs those brown liquids he'd mixed mrs brown opened the kitchen door on the empty chicken dish on the floor sat jumbo surrounded by chicken bones the wishing bone protruding from his mouth looking blissfully happy six in his bedroom whither he had perforce retired supperless william hung up the outlaw's signal of distress a skull and crossbones in black and the word help in red at his window in case ginger or henry or douglas came down the road and then surveyed the events of the day well he'd done his best he'd lived a life of self-denial and service all right it was his family who were wrong they hadn't been happy or grateful or admiring they simply weren't worthy of a life of self-denial and service and anyway how could he have known that it was another marion and that ethel couldn't say what she meant and that jumbo was going to get in through the kitchen window a tiny pebble hit his window he threw it open there down below in the garden path were douglas henry and ginger oh my trusty mates said william in a penetrating whisper i'm pent up endurance vile sent to bed you know and i'm jolly hungry wilt kill some deer or venison or something for me right o said ginger and uh, yes gallant captain said douglas and henry as they crept off through the bushes william returned to his survey of his present position that old boy simply didn't know what he was talking about. He couldn't ever have tried it himself. Anyway, he, uh, William, had tried it, and he knew all there was to know about lives of self-denial and service, and he'd done with lives of self-denial and service, thank you very much. He was going back to his ordinary kind of life first thing tomorrow. A tiny pebble at the window. William leant out, below were ginger henry and douglas with a small basket 
oh crumbs said william joyfully he lowered a string and they tied the little basket onto it william drew it up fairly successfully it contained a half-eaten apple a bar of toffee that had spent several days unwrapped in henry's pocket which was covered with bits of fluff a very stale bun purloined from ginger's mother's larder and a packet of monkey nuts bought with ginger's last tuppence william's eyes shone oh i say he said gratefully thanks awfully and i say you'd better go now case they see you and i say i'll come huntin wild animals with you to-morrow night right o said the outlaws creeping away through the bushes downstairs william's family circle consumed a meal consisting of sardines and stewed pears they consumed it in gloomy silence broken only by mr brown's dry i suppose there must be quite a heavy vein of insanity somewhere in the family for it to come out so strong in william and by ethel's indignant and epilepsy why on earth did he fix on epilepsy and by robert's gloomy engaged to be married to her twenty-four engaged to her for life upstairs the cause of all their trouble sat on the floor in the middle of his bedroom with his little pile of eatables before him come on my gallant braves he said addressing an imaginary band of fellow-captives let us eat well and then devise some way of escape or ere dawn our bleached bones may dangle from yon gallows then quite happily and contentedly he began to eat the fluffy stick of toffee end of chapter four Chapter Five of Still William by Rick Mall Compton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: A Bit of Blackmail. Bob Andrews was one of the picturesque figures of the village. He lived at the East Lodge of the Hall and was supposed to help with the gardening of the Hall grounds. He was tall, handsome, white-bearded, and gloriously lazy. He had a roguish twinkle in his blue eye and a genius for wasting time both his own and other people's he was a great friend of william and the outlaws he seemed to them to be free of all the drawbacks that usually accompany the state of grown-upness he was never busy never disapproving never tidy never abstracted he took seriously the really important things of life such as cigarette card collecting the top season red indians and the finding of birds nests having abstracted a promise from them that they would take one egg and no more ye rascals he would show them every bird's nest in the hall woods he seemed to know exactly where each bird would build each year he had a family of two tame squirrels four dogs and seven cats who all lived together in unity he could carve boats out of wood make whistles and bows and arrows and tops he did all these things as if he had nothing else to do in the world he would stand for hours perfectly happy with his hands in his pockets smoking he would watch the outlaws organizing races of boats watch them shooting their bows and arrows taking interest in their marksmanship offering helpful criticism he was in every way an eminently satisfactory person he was paid a regular salary by the absent owner of the hall for occasionally opening the lodge gates and still more occasionally assisting with the gardening he understood the word assistance in its most literal sense that of standing by he also was generous with kindly advice to his more active colleagues it says much for his attractive personality that this want of activity was resented by no one mr bott the new owner of the hall was a business man he liked to get his money's worth for his money it was not for nothing that passionate appeals to safeguard their health by taking bott's sauce with every meal met england citizen in every town mr bott believed in getting the last ounce of work out of his work people that was what had raised mr bott from grocer's errand boy to lord of the manor 
when mr bott discovered that he had upon his newly acquired estate a man who drew a working man's salary for merely standing about and at intervals consuming the more choice fruit from the hothouses mr bott promptly sacked that man it would have been against mr bott's most sacred principles to do otherwise the outlaws avoided mr bott's estate for some time after their adventure with his daughter but having heard that she had departed on a lengthy visit to distant relatives the outlaws decided to return to their favorite haunts they entered the wood by crawling through the hedge for a time they amused themselves by climbing trees and turning somersaults among the leaves then they tried jumping over the stream the stream possessed the attraction of being just too wide to jump over the interest lay in seeing how much or how little of their boots got wet each time finally the outlaws wearied of these pursuits let's go and find bob said william at last scuffling shuffling dragging their toes along the ground whistling punching each other at intervals in the fashion of boyhood they made their way slowly to the east lodge bob stood at his door smoking as usual hello bob called the outlaws hello you young rascals i say bob make us some boats and let's have a race sure and i will said bob knocking out his pipe and taking a large penknife out of his pocket though it's wasting time you are as usual he took up a piece of wood and began to whittle how's the squirrel bob whine bob they're billing in the ivy on the old oak again sure and i knew that for you did me boy but though he whittled and whistled bob was evidently not his old self i say bob next month next month be boys i shall not be here they stared at him open-mouthed what what you going away for a holiday bob bob whittled away nonchalantly i'm going away me boys because the old devil up there has given me the sack god forgive him or i won't he ended piously but why they said aghast he says i don't work me he said indignantly me and me wearing my hands to the bone for him the way i do and he says i steal his fruit me that takes only the few peaches he come and give me with his own hands if he was a gentleman at all at all what a shame said the outlaws turning me and me animals out into the cold world may god forgive him said bob well here's your boats ye young rascals and don't you go near me pheasant's nest or i'll put the fear o god in ye we'd gotter do something said william when bob had returned smoking peacefully to his lodge we can't do anything said ginger despondently who'd listen to us who'd take any notice of us anyway william the leader looked at him sternly you just wait and see he said mr bott was very stout his stoutness was a great secret trouble to mr bott mr bott had made his money and now mr bott wished to take his proper place in society mr bott considered not unreasonably that his corpulency though an excellent advertisement of the nourishing qualities of bott's sauce yet detracted from the refinement of his appearance mrs bott frequently urged him to do something about it he had consulted many expensive specialists mrs bott kept finding new men for him the last new man she had found was highly recommended on all sides he practically guaranteed his treatment to transform a human balloon to a human pencil in a few months mr bott had begun the treatment it was irksome but mr bott was persevering had mr bott not been persevering he would never have attained that position of eminence in the commercial world that he now held every morning as soon as it was light mr bott decently covered by a large overcoat went down to a small lake in the grounds among the bushes there mr bott divested himself of his overcoat and appeared in small bathing drawers from the pocket of his overcoat mr bott would then take a skipping rope and with this he would skip five times around the lake then he would put away his skipping rope and do his exercises he would twist his short fat body into strange attitudes flinging his short fat arms towards heaven standing upon one short fat leg with the other thrust out at various angles and invariably overbalancing 
finally mr bott had to plunge into the lake it was not deep splash and kick and run around in it and then emerge to dry himself in a towel concealed in the other pocket of his overcoat shiveringly don the overcoat again and furtively return to the house for mr bott was shy about his treatment he fondly imagined that no one except mrs bott the new man and himself knew about his early morning adventures one chilly morning mr bott had skipped and leapt and twisted himself and splashed himself and emerged shivering and red-nosed for his overcoat then mr bott received a shock that was nearly too much for his much exercise system his overcoat was not there he looked all around the tree where he knew he had left it and it was not there it was most certainly not there with chattering teeth mr bott drew a glance of pathetic despair around him then above the sound of the chattering of his teeth he heard a voice i've got your coat up here mr bott threw a startled glance up into the tree whence the voice came from among the leaves a stern freckled snub-nosed wild-haired face glared down at him i'll give you your coat said william if and you'll promise to let bob stay mr bott clasped his dripping head with a dripping hand bob bob andrews what you're sending away for nothing mr bott tried to look dignified in spite of the chattering of his teeth and the water that poured from his hair down his face i have my reasons child he said of which you know nothing will you kindly give me back my coat i'm afraid you are a very naughty ill-behaved little boy to do a thing like this and if you aren't careful i'll tell the police about it i'll give you your coat if you'll promise not to send bob away said william again sternly i shall most certainly speak to your father and the police said mr bott you're a very impudent little boy give me my coat at once i'll give you your coat said william again if you'll promise not to send bob away mr bott's dignity began to melt away you young devil he roared you he looked wildly around and his eyes fell upon something upon which william's eye ought to have fallen before william had for once overlooked something vital to his strategy in the long grass behind the tree lay a ladder that had been left there long ago by some gardener and forgotten with a yell of triumph mr bott rushed to it oh crumbs said william among the leafage mr bott put the ladder against the tree trunk and began to swarm up it large dripping chattering with rage and cold william retreated along his branch still clinging to the overcoat mr bott pursued furiously you young road you young devil i'll teach you i'll the branch down which william was retreating pursued by mr bott was directly over the lake william alone it could easily have supported but it drew the line at mr bott with a creaking and a crashing above which rose a yell of terror from mr bott it fell into the water accompanied by two occupants the splash made by mr bott's falling body at first obscured the landscape before william could recover from the shock caused by mr bott's splash and yell and his own unexpected descent mr bott was upon him mr bott was maddened by rage and fury and wet and cold he ducked william and shook william and tore his wet overcoat from william william butted mr bott in his largest and roundest part then scrambled from the lake and fled dripping towards the gate mr bott at first pursued him then realizing that the path was taking him within sight of the high road turned back drew his soaked overcoat over his shoulders and fled chatteringly and shiveringly towards his resplendent mansion two hours later william met the other outlaws by appointment in the old barn where all their meetings were held well said the other outlaws eagerly william who was wearing his best suit looked pale and chastened but none the less determined it didn't quite come off admitted william something went wrong their faces fell but they did not question him well we've done all we can said ginger resignedly and we just can't help it 
i've got another idea said william grimly i've jolly well not finished yet they looked at him with awe and respect we'll have another meeting in three days said william with his stern frown and then well you just wait and see the next day was bright and sunny mr bott almost enjoyed his morning exercises he thought occasionally with indignation of the events of the previous morning that dreadful boy anyway he'd shown him he wasn't likely to come again after yesterday and most certainly bob andrews would go he'd like to see any fool boy dictating to him but mr bott could not feel bad-tempered for long it was such a bright sunny morning and he just discovered himself to be seven-eighths of an inch thinner around the waist than this time last week he leapt and skipped and gambled and splashed once he imagined he saw the horrible boy's face in the bushes but looking again he came to the conclusion that he must have been mistaken once too he thought he heard a snap or a click as if someone had stepped on a twig but listening again he came to the conclusion that he must have been mistaken he enjoyed his exercises for the next two mornings as well but on the third morning as soon as he had come down dressed and glowing to his study after his exercises to look at his letters before breakfast the butler threw open the door and announced they said it was important business sir and you knew about it i hope it's all right then four boys walked up to his desk one was the boy who had taken his overcoat up a tree two days before the butler had gone mr bott sputtered with rage reached out to the bell he was going to say kick these boys out when the worst of the boys the devil laid half a dozen snapshots on his desk mr bott looked at them and then sat rigid and motionless his hand still outstretched towards the bell then his rubicund face grew pale the first snapshot showed mr bott short fat and except for his microscopic bathing drawers naked skipping by the lake the angle of his legs was irresistibly comic the second snapshot showed mr bott still short and fat and almost naked balancing himself on one arm and one leg the other stuck out wildly in the air his eyes staring his tongue hanging out of his mouth the third snapshot showed Mr. Bott in the act of overbalancing in a rather difficult exercise. That was the gem of the collection. The fourth showed Mr. Bott lying on his back and kicking his legs in the air. The fifth showed Mr. Bott standing on two very stiff arms and stiff legs with an expression of acute suffering on his face. The sixth showed Mr. Bott splashing in the lake mr bott took out his handkerchief and wiped away the perspiration that was standing out on his brow if you burn em said william firmly we can get more we've got the films and we can make hundreds more and jolly good ones too mr bott began to stammer well, what are you g -g going to do with them he asked oh just show them to people said william calmly horrid visions passed before mr bott's eye he saw the wretched things in the local paper he saw them passed from hand to hand in drawing-rooms he saw strong men helpless with mirth as they seized on them his position in society well the less said about his position in society if those things became public the better william took a crumpled document from his pocket and laid it solemnly upon mr bott's desk that's a contract he said signed in all our life's blood saying that we'll keep em hid safely and never show em to any one so long as you let bob stay mr bott knew when he was beaten he moistened his lips all right he was all right i promise only only go away they went away mr bott locked the contract in his desk and pocketed the key mrs bott came in mr bott still sat huddled in his chair you don't look well bottie darling said mrs bott with concern in her voice no said mr bott in a hollow voice i don't know that this treatment's doing me any good isn't it ducky said mrs bott well i'll try to find you a new man that afternoon the outlaws passed bob 
he stood outside his lodge hands in pocket pipe in mouth handsome white-bearded gloriously lazy i found a grass snake for you my boys he sang out it's in a box in the yard behind uh, uh, bob andrews is not going me boys the sack is withdrawn the old devils realize me value glory be to god that night robert william's elder brother came downstairs with his camera in his hand i say he said i could have sworn i put this away with half a dozen films in it uh, when did you have it last dear said his mother William took a book from a shelf and sat down at the table, resting his head on his hands. Well, I put it away last autumn, till the decent weather came round, but I could have sworn I put it away with a roll of film in. His eye fell sternly and accusingly upon William. William looked up, met it unflinchingly, with an expression of patient endurance on his face. Robert, he said with a sigh, I wish you'd talk more quietly. I'm trying to learn my history dates. Robert's jaw dropped. Then he went quietly from the room, still gaping. There was simply no making head or tail of that kid. End of chapter 5Chapter six of Still William by Rickmall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six William the Money Maker. The rain poured ceaselessly upon the old barn where the outlaws were assembled. They had meant to spend the afternoon bird nesting, and they had continued to bird's nest in spite of the steady downpour, till Ginger had torn such a large hole in his knickers that, as he pathetically remarked, it's all very well for you, it's only raining on your clothes, but it's raining right on to me through my hole, and it's jolly cold, and I'm going home. His threat of going home was hardly serious. It was not likely that any of the outlaws would waste the precious hours of a half-holiday in a place so barren of any hope of adventure as home. All right, said William the leader, upon whose stern and grimy countenance the rain had traced little channels of cleanliness, testily. All right, my goodness, what a fuss you make about a bit of rain and your bare skin. What would you do if you was a red Indian and had to be out of doors all weathers and nearly all bare skin? Well, it doesn't rain in red Indian climates, said Ginger, so there. Don't you be too clever. Doesn't rain in red Indian climates. William was nonplussed for a moment. Then he summoned his fighting spirit. How do you know? he said. You ever been there? You ever been to a red Indian climate? Well, I didn't know you'd never been to a red Indian climate, but I'm very interested to hear it. It's very interesting and funny. You didn't get killed and eat, I must say. William's weapon of heavy sarcasm always proved rather bewildering to his friends. I don't see that it matters whether I've been to a red Indian climate or not said ginger stoutly it won't stop me feeling wet now if i had would it well what would you do if you was a diver went on william if you're so frightened of getting a bit wet perhaps what with knowing so much about red indian climates you'll say it's just not wet in the sea of course if you say it's not wet in the sea we'll all believe you oh yes we'll all believe you if you say it's not wet in the sea I suppose that's what you be saying next, that it's not wet in the sea, with knowing so much about red Indian climates. At this moment there came a redoubled torrent of rain, and turning up their sodden collars, the outlaws all ran to the old barn, which was the scene of many of their activities. I'm surprised to see you run like that, said Ginger to William. I should have thought you'd have liked getting wet the way you talk about divers and red Indians william shut the door of the barn and pushed his wet hair out of his eyes i thought it was you what knew all about red indian climates and the sea not being wet he said severely seems to me you don't know what you're talking about sometimes one minute you say the sea's not wet i never said the sea wasn't wet said ginger you simply don't listen to what i do say you just keep on talking and talking yourself and you don't listen properly what other folks say you get it all wrong you go on talking and talking about red indians and divers but henry and douglas the other two outlaws were tired of the subject 
oh do shut up said henry irritably who shut up said william aggressively both of you said douglas ginger and william hurled themselves upon the other two and there followed one of those scrimmages in which the outlaws delighted it ended up by ginger sitting on henry and william on douglas and all felt a little warmer and drier and less irritable the subjects of red indians and divers were by tacit consent dropped it was raining harder than ever the water was pouring in through the roof at the other end of the barn what'll we do said ginger disconsolately rolling off his human perch their afternoon so far had not been encouraging they had with characteristic optimism aimed at collecting forty eggs before tea they had all sustained severe falls from trees they were wet through they were scratched and torn and bruised and the result was one cracked thrush's egg from a deserted nest which ginger subsequently dropped and then inadvertently trod upon while climbing through a hedge this incident had made ginger unpopular for a time it had drawn forth the rough diamonds of william's sarcasm it's a very kind of you i'm sure yes we took all that trouble just so you could have the pleasure of treading on it oh yes we felt quite paid for all the trouble we took now that you've been so kind enough to tread on it can we get you anything else to tread on i'm sure it's very nice for the poor bird to think it had the trouble of laying that egg just for you to tread on this rhetoric had resulted in a fight between william and ginger at the end of which both had rolled into a ditch the ditch was not a dry ditch but they were both so wet already that the immersion made little difference do said henry indignantly just tell us what there is to do shut up in this old place do ah i know what we can do said william suddenly we can make up a tale turn and turn about they were sitting on the two wooden packing-cases with which they had furnished their meeting-place a small rivulet ran between having its source just beneath the hole in the roof at the other end of the barn and flowing out under the door the outlaws carelessly dabbled their feet in it as it passed their drooping spirits revived at william's suggestion all right said henry you start all right said william modestly i don't mind startin once there was a man what got cast upon a desert island why said ginger why was he cast upon a desert island ef you're gonna keep on interruptin askin silly questions began william sternly all right said ginger pacifically all right go on he was cast upon a deserted island repeated william and the deserted island was full of savage cannibals what chased him round and round the island till he climbed a tree and they all surrounded the tree uttering fierce yells what was they yelling said henry with interest how could any one tell what they was yelling without knowing the language said william impatiently do you know the cannibal language no and the man didn't so how could he tell what they was yelling well the one what's tellin the tale oughter know said henry doggedly you oughter know the one what's tellin the tale oughter know ever than in the tale well i do said william crushingly but i'm not going to tell you what there was yellin so there and when you've got all kindly finished interruptin i'll kindly go on they was all beneath the tree utterin fierce yells what i know what they meant but what i'm not going to tell you when he took a great big jump right off the tree splash into the sea again and caught hold of a whale what was just passin and got on its back and held tight on by its fins i don't think a whale's got fins said douglas dubiously i don't care whether other whales have got fins or not said william firmly this one had em anyway and he kept rearin up and turnin over so's to shake the man off but the man held tight and now henry go on all right said henry well he went on and on on the whale's back till he came on to a ship and he jumped up to it from the whale's back oh he couldn't a done said douglas firmly what said henry couldn't a done couldn't a jumped from a whale's back to a ship a ship's high well he did said henry so it's no use talking about whether he could or not if he did he could i should think william's sarcasm was infectious 
well he found it was a pirate ship and they put him in irons and made him walk the plank and just when he got to the end of the plank now ginger go on well uh, you've gotten in a nice mess i must say said ginger bitterly and i s'pose you want me to get out of it chased by cannibals and now walking a plank well you got em into it and i'm not going to bother with em i didn't start it and i don't like it i'd rather have soldiers and fightin and that sort of a tale and what can i do with him walkin the plank i'm just about tired of that man and he's not even got a name well just as he got to the end of the plank he fell in and the whale ate him up and he died it isn't fair said douglas indignantly getting him dead before i've had my turn what am i going to do you can tell about someone catching the whale and finding his dead body inside said ginger calmly oh can i said douglas well i'm not going to no cause you can't jeered ginger you can't finish it however we left it oh couldn't i said douglas they closed in combat william and henry watched dispassionately douglas's collar had completely broken loose from its moorings and two of the already existing tears in ginger's coat had been extended to meet each other they sat down again on the packing cases still raining said henry morosely i bet your mother says something about that tear said william to ginger severely well you bet wrong then said ginger cause she's gone to london to see the exhibition fancy going to london to see an old exhibition said william scornfully what she see there oh natives said ginger blackens you know and native places and jugs and things made by natives that all well there's amusements and things too but that's all really said ginger you pay money and just see em and that's all crumbs said william his face was set in deep scowling thought for a minute then a light broke over it i say he said let's have an exhibition let's get an exhibition up well if ginger's mother'll do all the way to london to see an exhibition it well it'd be savin folks money to give em an exhibition here we've done things like that said henry morosely we've got up shows and things and they always turn out wrong we've never got up an exhibition said william an exhibition's quite different it couldn't go wrong and we'd make ever so much money i don't believe in your ways of making money said henry something always goes wrong all right said william sternly don't be in it keep out of it oh no said henry hastily i'd rather be in it even if it goes wrong i'd rather be in a thing that turns out wrong than not be in anything at all where'll we get natives said ginger oh anyone can look like a native said william carelessly that's easy easy what do we call it said douglas the london one's called wembley said ginger with an air of pride in his wide knowledge what about the little wembley said henry well that's a silly thing to do said william sternly tellin em it's littler than wembley before they've come to it even if it is littler than wembley we needn't tell em so let's call it just wembley suggested douglas no said william it would be muddlin havin em both called by the same name folks wouldn't know which they were talkin about well i stayed with my aunt said ginger slowly there was a place called a picture palace de luxe let's call it wembley de luxe what's de luxe mean said william suspiciously i spect it means sort of good luck said ginger all right said william graciously that'll do all right for a name now how are we going to let people know about it how did they let people know about the other wembley said henry oh they put advertisements in the papers and things said ginger who was beginning to consider himself the greatest living authority on the subject of the wembley exhibition we can't do that said henry the papers simply won't print em if we wrote em i know cause i once sent something to a paper and they simply didn't print it well then said william undaunted we'll write letters to people they'll have to read em we'll stick em through their letter boxes and they'll have to read em in case they was something important and i say it's nearly stopped raining let's see if we can find any more eggs two a week later the outlaws were sitting round the large wooden table of the one-time nursery in ginger's house 
in a strained silence they wrote out the letter drafted by william a copy of which was before each of them the table was covered with ink stains their hair their faces their tongues their collars their fingers were covered with ink most of them wrote slowly and laboriously with ink-stained tongues protruding between ink-stained teeth dear sir or madam ran the copy on saturday we are going to have a wembley not the one in london but one here so as to save you fares and other expenses there will be natives in native costume with native pots and amusements and other things which are secrets till the day entrance will be one penny exit free amusements are one penny hopping to have the pleasure of your company yours truly the wembley committee p s it is a secret who we are p p s it will probably be in the field next the barn but notices will be put up later when the notes had been written the outlaws were both physically and mentally exhausted they could run and wrestle and climb trees all day without feeling any effects but one page of writing always had the peculiar effect of exhausting their strength and spirits as william said it's avin to hold an uncomfortable pen and keep on thinkin and lookin at paper and sittin without change it's well it'd rather be a red indian where there's no school the notice were distributed by the outlaws personally after dark in order the better to conceal their identity they did not deliver notices to their own families or the friends of their families their own families were apt to be suspicious and not very encouraging the outlaws regarded their families as stumbling blocks placed in their paths by a malicious fate at last spent and weary and ink-stained they bade each other good night well it oughter turn out right with all the trouble we're taken over it said ginger rather bitterly i feel wore out with writin and writin and walkin and walkin and stickin things through the letter boxes i feel simply wore out i think i'm going to be sick soon said henry with a certain gentle resignation swallerin all that ink well no one asks you to swaller ink said william whose position of responsibility was making him slightly irritable you talk as if we'd wanted you to swaller ink it's not done any good to us you swallerin ink if you've been wastin ginger's ink swallerin it then you don't need to blame us it's not ginger's fault they are swallered as ink is it yes and it is said henry it got all up his pen and on to my fingers and then i had to keep lickin em to get it off and that's what made me feel sick well ordinary ink don't do that it's something wrong with ginger's ink i should say it henry called an irate maternal voice through the dust when are you coming in it's hours past your bedtime the outlaws scattered hastily three the outlaws had decided to hold the exhibition in farmer jenks field behind the barn farmer jenks was the outlaws most implacable foe he frequently chased the outlaws from his fields with shouts and imprecations and stones and dogs he had once uttered the intriguing threat to william that he would cut his liver out that had deeply impressed the outlaws and william had felt proud of the fame it won him he could not resist haunting farmer jenks lands because the chase that always ensued was so much more exciting than an ordinary chase well he's not cut it out yet he used to say proudly after each escape but just now farmer jenks was away staying with a brother and mrs jenks was confined to bed and the farm labourers quite wisely preferred to leave the outlaws as far as possible to their own devices so the outlaws were coming more and more to regard that field of farmer jenks as their private property the afternoon of the exhibition was unusually warm the exhibition opened at two o'clock to the stile that led from the road was attached a notice this way to o emily and the ducks and on the hole in the hedge by which spectators were to enter farmer jenks field was pinned another notice this way to o emily de lux at two thirty which was the time advertised for the opening a small and suspicious-looking group of four school-children had gathered at the stile 
William, his face and bare legs thickly covered with boot blacking, and tightly clutching an old sack across his chest, met them frowning sternly. "'One penny each, please,' he said aggressively, "'and I'm part of the exhibition, and I'm a native, and come this way, please, and hurry up.' There was a certain amount of bargaining on the part of the tallest boy, who refused to give more than a halfpenny, saying that he could black himself and look in the looking-glass for nothing if that was all there was at an exhibition, and there was a small scene caused by a little girl who refused to pay anything at all, and yet insisted on accompanying them in spite of William's stern remonstrance, and finally followed in the wake of the party, howling indignantly, "'I'm not a cheat! You're a cheat, you nasty old black boy! I won't give you a penny, and I will come to your nasty old show, so there! Boo!' William shepherded his small flock through the hole in the hedge. Then he took his stand behind a little piece of wood on which were arranged pieces of half-dry plasticine tortured into strange shapes. With a dramatic gesture, William flung aside his piece of sacking and stood revealed in an old pale blue bathing costume that had belonged to his sister Ethel in her childhood. "'Now you're going to look at me first he said in a deeply unnatural voice i'm a native of south africa dressed in native costume and this here is native ornaments made by me and you can buy the ornaments for a penny each he added not very hopefully yes said the tallest boy and we can do without buyin and equally well yes and i just as soon you didn't buy em said william proudly but untruthfully cause they're worth more'n a penny and i'll very likely get a shillin each for em before the exhibition's over ah uh, said the boy scornfully well what's next it's not worth a penny so far if it been worth a penny so far said william do you think i'd have let you in at all for a penny why don't you try to talk sense the small girl at the tail of the procession was still sobbing indignantly i'm not a cheat boo and i won't give the nasty boy my saturday penny i won't i want to buy sweets with it and i'm not a cheat boo all right said the goaded william you're not then and don't then and shut up you're being very woot to me said the young pessimist with a fresh wail beyond william were three other sacking shrouded figures each behind a piece of wood on which were displayed small objects now i'm a guide said william returning to his hoarse unnatural voice this way please ladies and gentlemen and we'll all be grateful if the lady will kindly shut up this remark occasioned a fresh outburst of angry sobs on the part of the aggrieved lady this taking off the first sackcloth with a flourish and revealing ginger dressed in an old tapestry curtain the exposed parts of his person plentifully smeared with moist boot blacking this is a native of australia and these are native wooden ornaments made by him talk australian native the confinement under the sacking had been an austere one and the day was hot and streams of perspiration mingling with the blacking gave ginger's countenance a mottled look before him were wooden objects roughly cut into shapes that might have represented almost anything as examples of art they belonged decidedly to the primitive school go on ye native i mean talk australian commanded william monkey donkey fluky tim tim said ginger and crumbs in the hot all that australian said the audience indignantly well said william loftily he's naturally learned a bit of english coming over here then taking up one of the unrecognizable wooden shapes and handing it to the little girl here you can have that if you shut up and it's worth ever so much i can tell you it's valuable she took it beaming with smiles through her tears i expect some of you like to buy some said william his audience hastily and indignantly repudiated the suggestion. "'What do I do now?' said Ginger. "'You just wait for the next lot,' said William, covering him up with the sacking. Ginger sat down again, muttering disconsolately about the heat beneath his sacking. Henry was a Canadian, and Douglas was an Egyptian. Both were pasted with blacking, and both shone with streaky moisture.' 
henry wore a large creton cushion cover and douglas wore a smock that had been made for use in charades last christmas both obligingly talked in their native language douglas who was learning latin said bonus bona bonum bonum bonam bonum to the fury and indignation of his audience in front of henry were balls of moist clay in front of douglas were twigs tied together in curious shapes the sightseers refused all william's blandishing persuasions to buy well it's you i'm thinking of said william if you go home without taking these interesting things made by natives you'll be sorry and then it'll be too late and you mayn't ever again see em to buy em and you'll be sorry and if you bought em you could put em in a museum and, and, and they always be interested the smallest boy was moved by william's eloquence to pay a penny for a clay ball then promptly regretted it and demanded his penny back it was while this argument was going on that violet elizabeth appeared wanner be a native like ginger all black she demanded loudly william who was harassed by his argument with the repentant purchaser of native wear turned on her severely you ought to pay a penny coming into this show he said i came in a different hole a hole of my own so i'm not going to said violet elizabeth and i wanter be a native like ginger and henry and douglas all lovely and black well you can't be said william firmly tears filled her eyes and she lifted up her voice wanna be a native she screamed all right said william desperately be a native i don't care be a native get the blacking from ginger i don't care be one and don't blame me the next is the amusements ladies and gentlemen there were three amusements the first consisted in climbing a tree and lowering oneself from the first branch by a rope previously fastened to it by william the second consisted in being wheeled once round the field in a wheelbarrow by william the third consisted in standing on a plank at the edge of the pond and being gently propelled into the pond by william the entrance fee to each was one penny yes said the tallest boy indignantly and suppose we fall off the plank into the water well that's part of the amusement said william wearily the smallest boy decided after much thought to have a penny ride in a wheelbarrow four mrs bott was walking proudly up the lane she had in train not an earl exactly but distantly related to an earl at any rate he was county most certainly county so far county had persistently resisted the attempts of mrs bott to get in with it mrs bott had met him and captured him and was bringing him home to tea she had brushed aside all his excuses he walked beside her miserably looking round for some way of escape already in her mind's eye mrs bott was marrying violet elizabeth to one of his nephews she came to the reluctant conclusion that he himself would be rather too old when violet elizabeth attained a marriageable age and was killing off all his relations in crowds by earthquakes or floods or wrecks or dread diseases to make quite sure of the earldom ivory chemeuse for violet elizabeth of course and the bridesmaids in pale blue georgette suddenly they came to a paper notice pinned very crookedly on a stile in the hedge the distant relation to the peer of the realm brightened he stroked his microscopic moustache i say he said sounds rather jolly what mrs bott who had assumed an expression of refined disgust hastily exchanged it for one of democratic tolerance yours she said in her super country snaring accent doesn't it we we'll always try to take an interest in the activities of the village i say i think i'll just go in and see he said he hoped that it would throw her off but as a ruse it was a failure oh yas she said let's i think it's good for the village to feel the upper classes take an interest in them the hole in the hedge proved too small for mrs bott's corpulency but the depressed connection of the peerage found a larger one further up which afforded quite a broad passage when the hedge was held back they entered the field 
William, his blacking and perspiration falling in drops onto his pale blue native costume, had just finished the wheelbarrow ride. His hair stood up round his face in matted clusters. He scowled at the newcomers. "'You come to the exhibition?' he said sternly. "'Cause you gotta pay a penny if you have.' The Honourable Marmaduke Morency took out a sixpence and gave it to William. William unbent. "'If you come round with me,' he said, "'I'll guide you. I'm a guide. A native guide. I'm a South African, I am.' "'Rowley,' said the Honourable Marmaduke. "'How very quaint,' sighed Mrs. Watt, with a kindly smile. "'I do wish my little girl was here. She'd have loved it, but I don't let her mix with common children. She's so carefully guarded. She's in the garden with her nurse now. She's a beautiful child and guarded most carefully from childhood.' Henry's canvas was removed, and the Honourable Marmaduke smiled a weary smile, and Mrs. Bott imitated it carefully, uh, but not very exactly. Ginger was shown, and the Honourable Marmaduke's smile became less weary. Douglas was shown, and the Honourable Marmaduke almost, not quite, laughed. He certainly murmured, I say, by Jove, you, you know, isn't it? What? Even William realized that no higher praise could be expected of him than that. "'I do wish my valet Elizabeth was here,' said Mrs. Bott. "'She'd be so interested. But there I've always kept her guarded from common children.' Then the last shrouded figure threw off its covering and jumped excitedly into the air. It was dressed in stays and small frilled knickers. Hair, face, arms, and legs were covered with blacking. William had borrowed a good supply from the store cupboard. He was never a boy for half measures. "'I'm an Injun,' squeaked Violet Elizabeth, leaping up and down joyfully in her scanty attire. "'I'm a native Indian in a native Indian costume, and I'm going to do a native Indian dance. I'm an Indian, I'm an Indian.' With a scream that rent the very heavens, Mrs. Bott made a grab at her erring child. At that moment, from the other end of the field, came a bellow of rage that drowned even the voice of Mrs. Bott. The outlaws, paralyzed with terror, saw the dread form of their foe advancing upon them, wrathfully, across the field. Farmer Jenks had returned home unexpectedly. "'Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Come on. End of chapter 6. Chapter 7 of Still William by Rick Mall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The Haunted House. Well, you just tell me, demanded William. You just give me one reason why we shouldn't dig for gold. Cause we shan't find any, said Douglas simply. How do you know, said William, the ever hopeful. How do you know we shan't? You ever tried? You ever dug for gold? Do you know anyone that's ever dug for gold? Well, then, triumphantly, how do you know we shan't find any? That's cause why, said Douglas, with equal triumph, cause no one's ever done it. Cause they'd have done it if there'd been any chance. They didn't think of it, said William impatiently. They simply didn't think of it. In the fields and woods, for instance, no one can ever have dug there, and for all you know, it's full of gold and jewels and things. How can anyone tell till they've tried digging? People in England simply don't think of it, that's all. All right, said Douglas, tiring of the argument. I don't mind digging a bit and trying. You can't tell it at once, gold, said William importantly. You gotta wash it in water, and then it shows up suddenly, so we'd better start digging by some water. They began operations the next morning by the pond, and had dug patiently for two hours, before they were chased furiously from the spot by Farmer Jenks and a dog and a shower of sticks and stones. The washing of the soil had been the only part of the proceeding they had really enjoyed, and a good deal of the resultant mud still adhered to their persons. They wandered down the road. "'Well, we've not found much gold yet, have we?' said Douglas, sarcastically. "'Do you think the gold diggers in N. N. Williams' geography was rather weak, so he hastily slurred over the precise locality. "'Anyway, do you think the gold diggers found it in one morning?' I bet it takes weeks and weeks. Well, if you think I'm going to go and dig him for weeks and weeks, I'm not, said Douglas firmly. Well, where can we find some more water to dig by anyway, said Ginger, the practical. It's a silly idea, digging by water. I bet I'd see gold in the earth if there wasn't any without washing it, said Henry. And I bet you wouldn't, said William indignantly. I've been reading tales about it, and that's what it says. Do you think you're cleverer than all the gold diggers in, in, in those places? Yes, I do, if they can't see gold without washing it, said Henry. Where's some water anyway, said Ginger, again plaintively. They were passing an old house in a large garden. The house had been empty for more than a year, because the last owner had died in mysterious circumstances, but that fact did not affect the outlaws in any way. A stream flowed through the overgrown, neglected garden. William appeared through the hedge. Water, he cried excitedly. Come on and dig for gold here. Led by William, they scrambled through the hedge and trampled gleefully over the grass of the lawn that grew almost as high as their waist. Just like a jungle, shouted William. Now we can imagine we're in the real gold digging parts. They dug industriously for half an hour. William had a spade, borrowed from the gardener. The gardener was at that minute hunting for it through tool-house and greenhouse and garden. His thoughts were already turning William words in impotent fury. Ginger had a coal shovel with a hole in it rescued from the dustbin. Henry had a small wooden spade abstracted from his little sister when her attention was engaged elsewhere and Douglas had a piece of wood. They threw every spadeful of earth into the stream and churned it about with their spades. Seems a silly idea to me, objected Henry again, just making mud of it. Seems to me you're more likely to lose the gold, chucking it into the water every time. I shouldn't wonder if we've lost lots already, sinking down to the bottom among the pebbles. We've not found much anyway. Well, I tell you, it's the right way, said William impatiently. It's the way they do. I've read it. If it wasn't the right way, they wouldn't do it, would they? Do you think the gold diggers out in, uh, out in those places would do it if it wasn't right? Well, I'm getting a bit tired of it anyway, said Henry. He voiced the general opinion. Even William's enthusiasm was waning. It seemed a very hot and muddy way of getting gold, and it didn't even seem to get any. Douglas had already laid aside his sodden stick and wandered up to the house. 
he was pressing his nose against a dirty cracked window pane suddenly he shouted excitedly i see a, a rat there's a rat in this room the outlaws gladly threw away their spades and rushed to the window there was certainly a rat he sat up upon his hind legs and trimmed his whiskers staring at them impudently all thought of gold left the gold diggers open the window catch him get him crumbs get him the window actually did open with a yell of joy william raised it and half rolled half climbed over the sill into the room followed by the outlaws uttering wild war hoops after one stricken glance at them the rat disappeared down his hole but the outlaws were thrilled by the house they tramped about the wooden floors in the empty re-echoing rooms they slid down the dirty balusters they found a hole in a floor and delightedly tore up all the rotten boards around it they explored the bedrooms and the cistern aloft and the filthy airless cellars they met four rats and chased them with deafening shouts they were drunk with delight their hands and faces were covered with dust and their hair full of cobwebs then william and ginger claimed the upstairs as their castle and henry and douglas charged from below and they all rolled downstairs in a mass of arms and legs and cobwebs finally they formed a procession and marched from room to room stamping with all their might on the wooden floors and singing lustily in their strong and inharmonious voices they had largely forgotten their former avocation of gold digging i say said william at last hot and dirty and breathless and happy it'd be just the place for a meetin place wouldn't it better than the old barn yes but we'd have to be quieter said ginger or else people be hearin us and makin a fuss like what they always do all right said william sternly you've been makin more noise than any one and let's keep at the back said henry or old miss hatherley'll be seein us out of her window and comin and interferin william knew miss hatherley whose house overlooked the front of the empty house he had good cause to know her robert was deeply enamoured of marion miss hatherley's niece and miss hatherley disapproved of robert because he had no money and was still at college and rode a very noisy motorcycle and dropped cigarette ash on her carpets and never wiped his boots and frightened her canary she disapproved of william still more and for reasons too numerous to state the empty house became the regular meeting-place of the outlaws and the old barn was deserted they always entered cautiously by a hole in the garden hedge first looking up and down the road to be sure that no one saw them the house served many purposes besides that of meeting-place it was a smuggler's den a castle a desert island a battlefield and an indian camp it was william of course who suggested the midnight feast and the idea was received with eager joy by the others the next night they all got up and dressed when the rest of their households were in bed william climbed down the pear tree which grew right up to his bedroom window ginger got out of the bathroom window and crawled along the garden wall to the gate douglas and henry got out of the downstairs windows all were a thrill with the spirit of adventure they would not have been surprised to meet a red indian in full war paint or a smuggler with eye patch and daggers or a herd of lions and tigers or even despite their scorn of fairy tales a witch with a cat and broomstick walking along the moonlit road william had brought his pistol and a good supply of caps in case they met any robbers i know it wouldn't kill em he admitted but the bang ud make em think it was real one and scare em off makes a fine bang not that i'm frightened of em he said hastily ginger had brought a stick which he thought might be useful for killing snakes he had a vague idea that all roads were infested by deadly snakes at night they entered the house disturbing several rats who fled at their approach they sat around a stubby candle end thoughtfully provided by henry they ate sardines and buns and cheese and jam and cakes and a desiccated coconut on the dusty floor in the empty room whose paper hung in cobwebby strands from the wall while rats squeaked indignantly behind the wainscoting and the moon pale with surprise peeped in at the dirty uncurtained window they munched in happy silence and drank lemonade and licorice water provided by william 
let's do it to-morrow too said henry as they rose to depart and the proposal was eagerly agreed upon miss hatherley was a member of the society for the encouragement of higher thought the society for the encouragement of higher thought had exhausted nearly every branch of higher thought and had almost been driven to begin again at sublimity or relativity they didn't want to because in spite of a meeting about each they were all still doubtful as to what they meant but last week some one had suggested a psychical revelation and they had quite a lively meeting miss sluker had a cousin whose wife thought she had heard a ghost miss sluker who was conscientious added that the cousin's wife had never been quite sure and had admitted that it might have been a mouse mrs moot had an aunt who had dreamed of her sister and the next day her sister had found a pair of spectacles which she had lost for weeks but no one else had any psychic experience to record we must have another meeting and all collect data said the president brightly what's data said little miss simkey to her neighbor in a mystified whisper it's the french for ghost story said the neighbor oh said little miss simkey satisfied the next meeting was at miss hatchley's house the data were not very extensive miss euphemia barney had discovered that her uncle had died on the same day of the month on which he had been born but after much discussion it was decided that this though interesting was not a psychic experience miss watt spoke next she said that her uncle's photograph had fallen from its hook exactly five weeks to the day after his death they were moving the furniture she added and some one had just dropped the piano but still it was certainly data i'm afraid i've no personal experience to record said little miss simkey but i've read some very exciting datas in magazines and such like but i'm afraid they won't count then miss hatherley trembling with eagerness spoke i have a very important revelation to make she said i have discovered that colonel hank's old house is haunted there was a breathless silence the eyes of the members of the society for the encouragement of higher thought almost fell through their horn-rimmed spectacles on to the floor haunted they screamed in chorus and little miss simkey clung to her neighbour in terror listen said miss hatherley the house is empty yet i have heard voices and footsteps the footsteps resembling colonel hanks last night the round-eyed round-mouthed circle drew nearer last night i heard them most distinctly at midnight and i firmly believe that colonel hank's spirit is trying to attract my attention i believe that he has a message for me little miss simkey gave a shrill scream and was carried to the dining-room to have hysterics in comfort among the wool mats and antimacassars to-night i shall go there said miss hatherley and the seekers after higher thought screamed again oh don't dear said miss euphemia barney oh it sounds so unsafe and do you think it's quite proper proper said miss hatherley indignantly surely there can be no impropriety in a spirit uh, no dear of course you're right murmured miss euphemia barney clinching under miss hatherley's eye i shall go to-night said miss hatherley again with one more scathing glance at miss euphemia barney and i shall receive the message i want you all to meet me here this time to-morrow and i will report my experience the society for the encouragement of higher thought expostulated but finally acquiesced what a heroine how brave how psychic they murmured as they went homewards what a thrilling data it will make said little miss simkey who had now recovered from her hysterics and was feeling quite cheerful william was creeping downstairs it was too windy for him to use his pear tree and he was going out by way of the dining-room window he was dressed in an overcoat over his pyjamas and he held in his arms ten small apples which were his contribution to the feast and which he had secretly abstracted from the loft during the day bang rattle 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 three of them escaped his encircling arms and dropped noisily from stair to stair crumbs muttered william aghast no one however appeared to have heard the house was still silent and sleeping 
William gathered up his three apples and dropped two more in the process, fortunately upon the mat. He looked round anxiously. His arm seemed inadequate for ten apples, but he had promised ten apples for the feast, and he must provide them. His pockets were already full of biscuits. He looked round the moonlit hall. Ah, Robert's overflow bag! It was on one of the chairs. Robert had been staying with a friend and had returned late that night. He had taken his suitcase upstairs and flung the small and shabby bag that he called his overflow bag down on a chair. It was still there. Good! It would do to hold the apples. William opened it. There were a few things inside, but William couldn't stay to take them out. There was plenty of room for the apples, anyway. He shoved them in, took up his bag, and made his way to the dining room window. The midnight feast was in full swing. Henry had forgotten to bring the candles, Douglas was half asleep, Ginger was racked by gnawing internal pains as the result of the feast of the night before, and William was distrait, but otherwise all was well. Someone had, rather misguidedly, given William a camera the day before, and his thoughts were full of it. He had taken six snapshots and was going to develop them tomorrow. He had sold his bow and arrows to a classmate to buy the necessary chemicals. As he munched the apples and cheesecakes and chocolate cream and pickled onions and currants provided for the feast, he was in imagination developing and fixing his snapshots. He'd never done it before. He thought he'd enjoy it. It would be so jolly and messy, watery stuff to slosh about in little basins and that kind of thing. Suddenly, as they munched and lazily discussed the rival merits of catapults and bows and arrows, Ginger had just swapped his bow and arrow for a catapult, there came through the silent, empty house the sound of the opening of the front door. The outlaws stared at each other with crumby mouths wide open. Steps were now ascending the front stairs. Speak, called suddenly a loud and vibrant voice from the middle of the stairs, which made the outlaws start almost out of their skins. Speak! Give me your message! The hair of the outlaws stood on end. A ghost, whispered Henry with chattering teeth. Crikey, said William, let's get out. They crept silently out of the further door, down the back stairs, out of the window, and fled with all their might down the road. Meanwhile, upstairs, Miss Hatherley first walked majestically into the closed door, and then fell over Robert's overflow bag, which the outlaws had forgotten in their panic. Robert went to see his beloved the next day and to reassure her of his undying affection. She yawned several times in the course of his speech. She was beginning to find Robert's devotion somewhat monotonous. She was not of a constant nature. Neither was Robert. I say, she said, interrupting him as he was telling her for the tenth time that he had thought of her every minute of the day and dreamed of her every minute of the night and that he'd made up a lot more poetry about her but had forgotten to bring it. Do come indoors. They're having some sort of stunt in the drawing room. Aunt and the high thinkers, you know. I'm not quite sure what it is. Something psychic, she said, but anyway, it ought to be amusing. Rather reluctantly, Robert followed her into the drawing-room, where the higher thinkers were assembled. The higher thinkers looked coldly at Robert. He wasn't much thought of in high-thinking circles. There was an air of intense excitement in the room as Miss Hatherley rose to speak. "'I entered the haunted house,' she began in a low, quivering voice. "'And at once I heard voices!' Miss Simke clung in panic to Miss Luker. I proceeded up the stairs, and I heard <gasps> footsteps. Miss Euphemia Barney gave a little scream. I went on undaunted. The higher thinkers gave a thrilled murmur of admiration. And suddenly all was silent, but I felt a, a presence. It led me, led me along a passage. I felt it. It led me to a room, Miss Simke screamed again. And in the room I found this. With a dramatic gesture, she brought out Robert's overflow bag. I have not yet investigated it. I wish to do so first in your presence. How noble, murmured Miss Moot. I feel sure that this is what Colonel Hanks has been trying to show me. 
i am convinced that this will throw light upon the mystery of his death i am now going to open it if it's human remains quavered miss simpke i shall faint with a determined look miss atherley opened the bag from it she brought out first a pair of faded and very much darned blue socks next a shirt with a large hole in it next a bathing suit and lastly a pair of very grimy white flannel trousers the higher thinkers looked bewildered but miss hatherley was not daunted they're clues she said clues if only we can piece them together properly they must have some meaning ah here's a notebook this will explain everything she opened the notebook and began to read o oh, marion my lady fair has eyes of blue and golden hair her heart of gold is kind and true she is the sweetest girl you ever knew but oh a dragon guards this jewel a hideous dragon foul and cruel the ugliest old thing you ever did see is marion's aunt miss hatherley these socks are both marked robert brown suddenly squealed miss sluker who had been examining the clues miss hatherley gave a scream of rage and turned to the corner where robert had been but robert had vanished when robert saw his overflow bag he had turned red when he saw his socks he had turned purple when he saw his shirt he had turned green when he saw his trousers he had turned white and when he saw his notebook he had turned yellow when miss hatherley began to read he muttered something about feeling faint and crept unostentatiously out of the window marian followed him well she said sternly you've made a nice mess of everything haven't you what on earth have you been doing i can't think what you thought of those socks said robert hoarsely all darned in different coloured wool i never wear them i don't know why they were in the bag i didn't think anything at all about them she snapped they were walking down the road towards robert's house and the shirt he went on in a hollow voice with that big hole in it i don't know what you'll think of my things i just happen to have torn the shirt i really never wear things like that oh do shut up about your things i don't care what you wear but i'm sick with you for writing soppy poetry about me for those asses to read she said fiercely and why did you give her your bag you loony i didn't marion said robert miserably honestly i didn't it's a mystery to me how she got it i've been hunting for it high and low all to-day it's simply a mystery oh do stop saying that what are you going to do about it that's the point i'm going to commit suicide said robert gloomily i feel there's nothing left to live for now you're turning against me i don't believe you could said marian aggressively how are you going to do it i shall drink poison what poison i don't believe you know what are poisons what poison uh prussic acid said robert you couldn't get it they wouldn't sell it to you people do get poisons uh, robert said indignantly i'm always reading of people taking poisons well they've got to have more sense than you said marian crushingly they're not the sort of people that leave their bags and soppy poems all over the place for other people to find they had reached robert's house and were standing just beneath william's window i know heaps of poisons said robert with dignity i'm not going to tell you what i'm going to take i'm going to at that moment william who had been not very successfully fixing his snapshots and was beginning to clear up threw the contents of his fixing bath out of the window with a careless flourish they fell upon robert and marian for a moment they were both speechless with surprise and solution of sodium hyposulfate then marian said furiously you brute i hate you oh i say gasped robert it's not my fault marian i don't know what it is honestly i didn't do it some of the solution had found its way into robert's mouth and he was trying to eject it as politely as possible it came from your beastly house said marian angrily and it's ruined my hat and i hate you and i'll never speak to you again she turned on her heel and walked off mopping the back of her neck with a handkerchief as she went robert stared at her unrelenting back till she was out of sight then went indoors ruined her hat indeed 
what was a hat anyway it had ruined his suit simply ruined it and how had the old cat got his bag he'd like to know he wouldn't mind betting a quid that that little wretch william had had something to do with it he always had he decided not to commit suicide after all he decided to live for years and years and years to make the little wretch's life a misery to him if he could end of chapter seven chapter eight of still william by rick Mall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight william the matchmaker william was feeling disillusioned he had received as a birthday present a book entitled engineering explained to boys and had read it in bed at midnight by the light of a lamp which he had borrowed from his elder brother's photographic apparatus for the purpose the book had convinced william that it would be perfectly simple with the aid of a little machinery to turn a wooden packing case into a motor-boat he spent two days on the work he took all the elastic that he could find in his mother's work drawer he disemboweled all the clockwork toys that he possessed to supplement this he added parts of the works of the morning-room clock he completely soaked himself and his clothes in oil finally the thing was finished and william stern and scowling and tousled and oily deposited the motor-boat on the edge of the pond stepped into it and pushed off boldly it shot into the middle of the pond and promptly sank so did william he returned home wet and muddy and oily and embittered to meet a father who with a grown-up's lack of sense of proportion was waxing almost lyrical over the disappearance of the entrails of the morning-room clock it had been for william a thoroughly unpleasant day he was still dwelling moodily on the memory of it how was i to know the book was wrong he muttered indignantly as he walked along the road his hands deep in his pockets blame me cause the book was wrong if william had not been in this mood of self-pity he would never have succumbed to the overtures of violet elizabeth william at normal times disliked violet elizabeth he disliked her curls and pink and white complexion and blue eyes and lisp and frills and flounces and imperiousness and tears his ideal of little girlhood was joan dark-haired and dark-eyed and shy but joan was away on her holidays and william's sense of grievance demanded sympathy feminine sympathy for preference good morning william said violet elizabeth good morning said william without discontinuing his moody scowl at the road and his hunched up onward march violet elizabeth joined him and trotted by his side you feelin sad william she said sweetly any one that feels sad burst out william how was i to know a book didn't know what it was talkin about you'd think a book'd know wouldn't you blame me cause a book don't know what it was talkin about it's enough to make any one feel sad well you'd think a book about machinery you'd know just a bit about machinery wouldn't you sink of me in a mucky old pond and then when you think they'd be a bit sorry for me goin on as if it was my fault so i wrote the book this somewhat involved account of his wrongs seemed to satisfy violet elizabeth she slipped a hand in his and for once william the stern unbending despiser of girls did not repel her pa william said violet elizabeth sweetly i'm so sorry although william kept his stern frown still fixed on the road and gave no sign of his feelings the dulcet sympathy of violet elizabeth was balm to his wounded soul play games with me went on violet elizabeth soothingly william looked up and down the road no one was in sight after all one must do something what sort of games said william suspiciously transferring his stern frown from the road to violet elizabeth and contrary to his usual custom forbearing to mimic her lisp play house william said violet elizabeth eagerly it's such a nice game you and me be married red indians and you a squaw said william with a gleam of interest no said violet elizabeth with distaste not red indians pirates suggested william oh no william said violet elizabeth they're so nasty 
just an ordinary sort of married you go to the office and me go shopping and to matinees and thee to the dinner and that sort of thing william's dignity revolted from the idea if you think i'd play a game like that he began coldly please do william said violet elizabeth in a quivering voice the blue eyes fixed pleadingly on william swam suddenly with tears violet elizabeth exerted her sway over her immediate circle of friends and relations solely by this means even at that tender age she possessed the art so indispensable to her sex of making her blue eyes swim with tears at will she had on more than one occasion found that it was the only suasion to which the stern and lordly william would yield he looked at her in dismay oh all right he said hastily all right come on after all there was nothing else to do and one might as well do this as nothing together they went into the field where there was an old barn this must be the house said violet elizabeth her tears gone her pink and white face wreathed in smiles and now you go to the office darling william and i'll see to things at home good-bye and work hard and make a lot of money cause i want a lot of new clothes i've simply nothing fit to wear the office is the corner of the field you stay there and count a hundred and then come back to your dinner and bring me a box of chocolates and a large bunch of flowers if you think began william hoarse with indignant surprise i don't mean real wants william said violet elizabeth meekly i mean pretend wants thicks or grath or anything'll do or won't said william sternly if you think i'm going even to pretend to give presents to an old girl but i'm your wife william said violet elizabeth there was the first stage a suspicion of moisture of the swimming tears in the blue eyes and william hastily retreated all right i'll see he capitulated good-bye aren't you going to kiss me said violet elizabeth plaintively no said william i won't kiss you i'm afraid of giving you some sort of germ i don't think i'd better good-bye he departed hastily for the corner of the field before the tears had time to swim he was already regretting the rash impulse that had made him stoop to this unmanly game he waited in the corner of the field and counted fifty he could see violet elizabeth cleaning the window of the barn with a small black handkerchief then sallying forth with languid dignified gait to interview imaginary tradespeople then william suddenly espied a frog in the field beyond the hedge he scrambled through in pursuit and captured it and spent a pleasant quarter of an hour teaching it tricks he taught it as he fondly imagined to know and love him and to jump over his hands it showed more aptitude at jumping over his hands than in knowing and loving him it responded so well to his teaching in jumping that it finally managed to reach the ditch where it remained in discreet hiding from its late discoverer and trainer william then caught sight of an old nest in the hedge and went to investigate it he decided that it must have been a robin's nest and took it to pieces to see how it was made he came to the conclusion that he could make as good a one himself and considered the possibilities of making nests for birds during the winter and putting them ready for them in the hedges in the spring then he noticed that the ditch at the further end of the field was full and went there to see if he could find any water creatures he soaked his boots and stockings caught a newt but having no receptacle in which to keep it other than his cap which seemed to hold water quite well but only for a short time he reluctantly returned it to its native element then he remembered his wife and returned slowly and not very eagerly to the barn violet elizabeth was seated in the corner on an old box in a state of majestic sulks you've been at the office for more'n a day you've been there for months and years and i hate you well i forgot all about you william excused himself and anyway i'd a lot of work to do at the office and i kept waiting and waiting and thinking you'd come back every minute and you didn't well how could i said william how could i come back every minute how could anyone come back every minute and anyway as he saw violet elizabeth working up to her all-powerful tears it's lunchtime and i'm going home william's mother was out to lunch and ethel was her most objectionable and objecting 
She objected to William's hair and to William's hand and to William's face. "'Well, I've washed em and I've brushed it,' said William firmly. "'I don't see what you can do more with faces and hair than wash em and brush it. If you don't like the color, they wash and brush, so I can't help that. It's the color they was born with. It's their natural color. Can't do more than wash em and brush it.' yes you can said ethel unfeelingly you can go and wash and brush again under the stern eye of his father who had lowered his paper for the express purpose of displaying his stern eye william had no alternative but to obey some people he remarked bitterly to the stair carpet as he went upstairs don't care how often they make other people go up and down stairs tiring themselves out i shouldn't be surprised if i die in good lot sooner than i should have done with all this walkin up and down stairs tirin myself out and all because my face and hands and hair's naturally a color she doesn't like ethel was one of william's permanent grievances against life but after lunch he felt cheered he went down to the road and there was joan joan dark-eyed and dark-haired and adorable back from her holidays hello william she said William's stern, freckled countenance relaxed almost to a smile. "'Hello, Joan,' he replied. "'What are you doing this afternoon, William?' "'Nothing particular,' replied William graciously. "'Let's go to the old barn and see if Ginger or any of the others are there. I'm so glad to be back, William. I hated being away. I kept thinking about you and the others and wondering what you were doing. You especially.' William felt cheered and comforted. Joan generally had a soothing effect upon William." as they neared the stile that led to the field however william's spirits dropped for there looking her most curled and cleaned and possessive was violet elizabeth come on william and play house again she called imperiously well and i'm not going to said william bluntly and i'm not going to be married to you any more and if i play house i'm going to have joan you can't do that said violet elizabeth calmly can't do what can't change your wife it's divorce if you do and you get hung for it this nonplussed william for a moment and then he said i don't believe it you don't know you've never been married so you don't know anything about it i do know here's ginger and douglas and herbert lane you ask them ginger and douglas and hubert lane all loudly and redolently sucking bull's eyes were coming down the road hubert lane was a large fat boy with protruding eyes a superhuman appetite and a morbid love of mathematics who was only tolerated as a companion by ginger and douglas on account of the bag of bull's eyes he carried in his pocket he had lately much annoyed the outlaws by haunting the field they considered theirs and in spite of active and passive discouragement thrusting his unwelcome comradeship upon them hi william hailed them loudly from the top of the stile is it divorce if you change your wife and do you get hung for it she says it is so all she knows the second trio gathered round the first to discuss the matter it's called bigamy not divorce said ginger authoritatively i know cause our cousin's gardener did it and you get put in prison it's not big what you said said violet elizabeth firmly it's divorce and i know cut the friend of mine's uncle did it so there the rival champions of divorce and bigamy glared at each other and the others watched with interest do you think said ginger that i don't know what my own cousin's gardener did and do you think said violet elizabeth that i don't know what my own friend's uncle did here's mr march comin said douglas let's ask him mr march was a short stumpy young man with a very bald head and short sight he lived in a large house at the other end of the village and rather fancied himself as a wit he was extraordinarily conceited and not overburdened by any superfluity of intellect i say mr march yelled william as he approached is it divorce or bigamy if you change your wife and do you get hung for it or put in prison added ginger mr march threw back his head and roared ha <laughs> ha he bellowed which of you wants to change his wife which of you is not satisfied with his spouse excellent ha ha he went on down the road chuckling to himself he's a bit cracked commented ginger in a tone of kind impartiality but my mother says he's awfully rich said douglas and he's gone on your sister said ginger to william then he must be cracked 
said William bitterly. Anyway, said Violet Elizabeth, it is divorce, and I don't care if it isn't. If you don't play half with me, I'm screaming and scream till I'm thick. I can, she added with pride. William looked at her helplessly. Will you play house with me, Joan? said Hubert, who had been fixing admiring eyes upon Joan. All right, said Joan pacifically, and we'll live next door to you, William. Violet Elizabeth had gone to prepare the barn, and Joan and Hubert now followed her. William glared after them fiercely. That old Hubert, he said indignantly, come a messin' about in our field. I votes we chuck him out. Just simply chuck him out. Yes, objected Ginger, and he'll tell his mother, and she'll come fussin' like what she did last time, and tellin' our fathers, and exaggeratin' all over the place. Well, let's think of a plan, then, said William. Five minutes later, William approached Hubert with an unnatural expression of friendliness on his face. Hubert was politely asking Violet Elizabeth to have a bull's-eye, and Violet Elizabeth was obligingly taking three. "'I say, Hubert,' whispered William to Hubert, "'we've got her secret. You come over here and we'll tell you.' Hubert put a bull's-eye into his mouth, pocketed the packet, and accompanied William to where Ginger and Douglas were, his goggle eyes still more a-goggle with excitement. Joan and Violet Elizabeth were busying themselves in transforming the interior of the barn into two semi-detached villas with great exercise of handkerchief dusters and imagination. Douglas, whispered William confidentially, found out a secret about this field. He got it off a witch. Hubert was so surprised that his spectacles fell off. He replaced them and listened open-mouthed. There's a grass in this field that if you tread on it makes you invisible. Now we're just a goin' to tread about to bit and see if we can find it, and we don't want to leave you out of it so you can come and tread about it a bit with us case we find it. Hubert was thrilled and flattered. I bet I find it first, he squeaked excitedly. They tramped about in silence for a few minutes. Suddenly William said in a voice of great concern, I, I say, where's Hubert gone? I'm here, said Hubert, a shade of anxiety in his voice. William looked at him and through him. "'Where's Hubert gone?' he said again. "'He was here a minute ago.' Well, "'I'm here,' said Hubert again plaintively. Ginger and Douglas looked first at and through Hubert, and then all around the field. "'Yes, he seems to have gone,' said Ginger sadly. "'I'm afraid he must have found the grass.' Uh, "'I'm here,' squeaked Hubert desperately, looking rather pale. I'll just see if he's hiding over there, said William, and proceeded literally to walk through Hubert. Hubert got the worst of the impact and sat down suddenly and heavily. <laughs> he wailed, rising to his feet. He was promptly walked into by Ginger, and sat down again with another yell. It's most mysterious where he's got to, said William. Let's call him. They yelled Hubert about the field, callously disregarding that youth's sobbing replies. Whenever he rose to his feet, one of them walked through him, and he sat down again with a bump and a yell. "'Did the witch say anything about making them visible again?' said William anxiously. "'No,' said Douglas sadly. "'I'm afraid he'll always be invisible now, and he'll die slow of starvation, because no one'll ever see him to give him anything to eat.' Hubert began to bellow unrestrainedly. He rose to his feet, dodged both Ginger and Douglas, who made a dart in his direction, and ran howling towards the stile. Boo! I'm going home. Boo! I don't want to die. As soon as he reached the stile, Ginger and Douglas and William gave a shout. Why, there's Hubert at the stile. Hubert ceased his tears and hung over the stile. Can you see me now? He asked anxiously. Am I all right now? He wiped his tears and began to clean his spectacles and straighten his collar. He was a tidy boy. "'Yes, Hubert,' said the outlaws, "'it's all right now. We can see you now. You must have just trod on the grass. But it's all right now. Aren't you coming back to play?' Hubert placed one foot cautiously over the stile. "'Ginger,' said William excitedly, "'I believe he's beginning to disappear again.' With a wild yell, Hubert turned and fled, howling, down the road. "'Well, uh, we've got rid of him,' said William complacently, "'and if I'm not clever, I don't know who is.' Over-modesty was not one of William's faults. 
well i bet you're not quite as clever as you think you are said ginger pugnaciously how do you know that said william rising to the challenge how do you know how clever i think i am you must think yourself jolly clever if you think you know how clever i think i am the discussion would have run its natural course to the physical conflict that the outlaws found so exhilarating if joan and violet elizabeth had not at this moment emerged from the barn you have been making a noise said violet elizabeth disapprovingly where's the boy with the bullfife he's gone away said william unfeelingly i want a bullfight you're a nasty boy to let him go away when i want a bullfight well you can go after him said william less afraid of her tears now that he was surrounded by his friends but violet elizabeth was too angry for tears yes and i thou she said you're a nasty rude boy and i don't love you and i don't want you for a husband i want the boys with the bullfight what about divorce or big or whatever it is said william taken aback by her sudden and open repudiation of him what about that what about being hung if any one tries to hang me said violet elizabeth complacently i'll scream and scream and scream till i'm thick i can then she put out her tongue at each of the outlaws in turn and ran lightly down the road after the figure of hubert which could be seen in the distance well we've got rid of her too said william torn between relief at her departure and resentment at her scorn of him and she can play her silly games with him i've had enough of them let's go and sit on the stile and see who can throw stones farthest they sat in a row on the stile it counted ten to hit the telegraph post and fifteen to reach the further edge of the opposite field ethel who had been to the village to do the household shopping came past when the game was in full swing i'll tell father she said grimly to william he said you oughtn't to throw stones william looked her up and down with his most inscrutable expression if it comes to that he said distantly he said you oughtn't to wear high heels ethel flushed angrily and walked on william's spirits rose it wasn't often he scored over ethel and he feared that even now she would have her revenge he watched her go down the road coming back along the road was mr march as he met ethel a deep flush and a sickly smile overspread his face he stopped and spoke to her gazing at her with a sheep-like air ethel passed on haughtily he had recovered slightly when he reached the outlaws though traces of his flush still remained well he said with a loud laugh divorce or bigamy which is it to be <laughs> excellent he put his walking stick against ginger's middle and playfully pushed him off the stile backwards then he went on his way laughing loudly i said he was cracked said ginger climbing back to his perch it just about suit ethel then said william bitterly they sat in silence a few minutes there was a far away meditative look in william's eyes i say he said at last if ethel married him she'd go away from our house and live in his wouldn't she uh-huh agreed ginger absently as he tried to hit the second tree to the left of the telegraph post that counted five i wish there was some way of making em fall in love with each other said william gloomily oh there is william said joan we've been learning it at school someone called shakespeare wrote it you keep saying to both of them that the other's in love with them and they fall in love and marry i know we did it last term one of them was beatrice i forget the other you said it was shakespeare said william no he's the one that tells about it sounds a queer sort of tale to me said william severely couldn't you write to him and get a bit plainer what to do write to him jeered ginger he's dead fancy you not knowing that fancy you not knowing shakespeare's dead well how was i to know he was dead i can't know every one's name that's dead can i i bet there's lots of dead folks names that you don't know oh do you said ginger well i bet i know more dead folks names than you do he said that anyway interposed joan hastily and pacifically he said that if you keep on making up nice things and saying that the others said it about them they fall in love and marry it must be true because it's in a book there was a look of set purpose in william's eyes it'll take a bit of arranging was the final result of his frowning meditation but it might come off all right 
William's part was more difficult than Joan's. William's part consisted in repeating to Ethel compliments supposed to emanate from Mr. March. If Ethel had had the patience to listen to them, she would have realized that they all bore the unmistakable imprint of William's imagination. William opened his campaign by approaching her when she was reading a book in the drawing-room. "'I say, Ethel,' he began in a deep, soulful voice, "'I saw Mr. March this afternoon.' Ethel went on reading as if she had not heard. "'He says,' continued William mournfully, sitting on the settee next to Ethel, "'he says that you're the apple of his life. He says that he loves you with a most devouring passion. He says that you're absolutely the most beauteous maid he's ever come across.' "'Be quiet and let me read,' said Ethel, without looking up from her book. "'He says,' went on William in the same deep, monotonous voice, "'he says that he doesn't mind your hair being red, though he knows some people think it's ugly. That's noble of him, you know, Ethel,' he says. Ethel rose from the settee. "'If you won't be quiet,' she said, "'I'll have to go into another room.' She went into the dining-room, and sitting down in an armchair, began to read again. After a short interval, William followed, and, taking the armchair opposite hers, continued, he says, Ethel, that he's deep in love with you, and that he doesn't mind you being so bad-tempered. He likes it. Anyway, he specs he'll get used to it. He says he adores you, just like what people do on the pictures. He puts his hand on his stomach and rolls his eyes whenever he thinks of you. He says, Will you be quiet? said Ethel angrily. No, but just listen, Ethel, pleaded William. He says, Ethel flounced out of the room. She went to the morning-room, locked the door, and sitting down with her back to the window, continued to read. After a few minutes came the sound of the windows being cautiously opened, and William appeared behind her chair. "'I say, Ethel, when I saw Mr. March, he said—' Ethel gave a scream. "'If you mention that man's name to me once more, William, I'll—I'll I'll tell father that you've been eating the grapes in the hothouse.' It was a random shot— but with a boy of William's many activities, such random shots generally found their mark. He sighed and slowly retreated from the room by way of the window. Ethel's attitude made his task a very difficult one. Joan's task was easier. Joan had free access to her father's study and typewriter, and Joan composed letters from Ethel to Mr. March. William borrowed some of his father's notepaper for her, and she worked very conscientiously, looking up the spelling of every word in the dictionary, and retyping every letter in which she made a mistake. She sent him one every day. Each one ended, Please do not answer this or mention it to me, and do not mind if my manner to you seems different to these letters. I cannot explain, but you'll know that my heart is full of love for you. One letter had a P.S. I would be grateful if you would give half a crown to my little brother William when next you meet him, I am penniless, and he is such a nice, good boy. Anyone less conceited than Mr. March would have suspected the genuineness of the letters, but to Mr. March they seemed just such letters as a young girl who had succumbed to his incomparable charm might write. It was William who insisted on the P.S., though Joan felt that it was inartistic. It had effect, however. Mr. March met William on the road the next morning, and handed him a half-crown then, with a loud guffaw, and divorce or bigamy, <laughs> pushed William lightly into a holly bush, and passed on. Mr. March's methods of endearing himself to the young were primitive, but the half-crown compensated for the holly bush in William's estimation. He wanted to make the P.S. a regular appendage to the letter, but Joan firmly refused to allow it. After a week of daily letters written by Joan and daily unsuccessful attempts on the part of William to introduce imaginary compliments from Mr. March into casual conversation with Ethel, both felt that it was time for the denouement. The final letter was the result of a hard morning's work by William and Joan. Dear George, may I call you George now? Will you meet me by the river near Fisher's Lock tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock? will you wear a red carnation and i will wear a red rose as gauges of our love i want to tell you how much i love you though i am sure you know let us be married next monday afternoon 
do not speak to me of this letter but just come wearing a red carnation and i will come wearing a red rose as gauges of our love i hope you will love my little brother william too he is very fond of caramels yours with love ethel brown soon i hope to be march the reference to william had been the subject of much discussion but william had overborne joan's objections i really only want it put because it makes it seem more natural it's only natural she would want him to be kind to her brother i mean not knowing ethel as well as i do he'd think it natural the stage managing of the actual encounter was the most difficult part of all ethel's reception of her swain's supposed compliments had not been such as to make william feel that a request to meet him at fisher's lock would be favourably received he was feeling just a little doubtful about the working of joan's love charm in the case of ethel but with his usual optimism he was hoping for the best ethel he said at lunch gladys barker wants to see you this afternoon i met her this morning did she say any time said ethel soon after three said william why on earth didn't you tell me sooner said ethel the road to gladys barker's house lay by the river past fisher's lock is not tellin a story william informed his conscience i did meet her this morning and i don't know that she doesn't want to see ethel this afternoon she probably does about quarter to three a william came in from the garden carefully holding a rose he wore his most inscrutable expression i thought you might like to wear this ethel he said it goes nice with your dress ethel was touched oh thank you william she said she watched him as he returned to the garden humming discordantly she wondered if sometimes she misjudged william it was ten minutes past three on the path by the river near fisher's lock stood mr march with a red carnation in his buttonhole concealed in a tree just above his head were ginger douglas william and joan down the path by the river came ethel wearing her red rose mr march started forward well little girl he said with roguish tenderness ethel stopped suddenly and stared at him in amazement ah said mr march shaking a fat finger at her the time has come to drop the mask of haughtiness i know all now you know from your own sweet lips i mean your own sweet pen i know how your little heart beats at the thought of your george i know who is your ideal your beloved knight you all those sweet things you wrote to me now don't be frightened little girl i return your affection but not monday afternoon i don't think we can manage it quite as soon as that mr march said ethel are you ill ill my little precious ogled mr march no well my little popsy your dear loving letters have made me well i was so touched by them little ethelkins you thinking me so handsome and clever and you know i admire you too he touched the red rose she was wearing playfully the gauge of our love eh mr march said ethel angrily you must be mad i've never written to you in my life ah he replied do not deny the fond impeachment he took a bundle of typewritten letters out of his pocket and handed them to her you have seen these before she took them and read them slowly one by one i've never heard such rubbish she said at last i've never seen the idiotic things before you must be crazy mr march's mouth fell open you didn't write them he said incredulously of course not snapped ethel how could you be such a fool as to think i did he considered for a minute and then his expression of bewilderment gave place again to the roguish smile ah oh, naughty he said she's being very coy i know better i know he took her hand ethel snatched it back and pushed him away angrily he was standing on the very edge of the river and at the push he swayed for a second clutched wildly in the air then fell with a loud splash into the stream oh i say ethel expostulated william from his leafy hiding place don't carry on like that drownin him after all the trouble we've took with him he got a lot of money and a nice garden and a big house anyone think you'd marry him instead of carrying on like that at the first sound of his voice ethel had gazed round open-mouthed then she looked up into the tree and saw william 
"'You hateful boy!' she cried. "'I'm going straight home to tell father.' She turned on her heel and went off without looking back. Meanwhile, Mr. March was scrambling up the bank, spitting out water and river weeds and, fortunately, inarticulate expletives. "'I'll have damages off someone for this,' he said, as he emerged onto the bank. "'I'll make someone pay for this. I'll have the law on them. I'll—' He went off, dripping and muttering and shaking his fist vaguely in all directions. Slowly, the outlaws climbed down from their tree. "'Well, you've made a nice mess of everything,' said Ginger dispassionately. "'I've took a lot of trouble trying to get her married,' said William, "'and this is how she pays me. "'Well, she needn't blame me.' He looked at the indignant figure of his pretty nineteen-year-old sister, which was still visible in the distance, and added gloomily, "'She's turning out an old maid, and it's not my fault. "'I've done my best.' seems to me she's going to go on living in our house all her life till she dies and then that's a nice lookout for me isn't it seems to me that if she won't even get married when you practically fix it all up for her and save her all the trouble like this she won't ever marry and she needn't blame me cause she's an old maid i've done everything i can and you he transferred his stern eye to joan why don't you read books with a bit of sense in them this shake man simply doesn't know what he's talking about it's a good thing for him he is dead getting us all into a mess like this what are you going to do now said douglas with interest i'm going fishing said william and i don't care if i don't get home till bedtime it was a week later the excitement and altercations and retaliations and dealing out of justice which had followed william's abortive attempt to marry ethel were over ethel had gone into the morning-room for a book the outlaws were playing in the garden outside their strong young voices floated in through the open window now let's have a change william was saying ginger be mr march and joan be ethel now begin go on joan come on walkin kind of silly like ethel and ginger go to meet her with a soft look on your face that's it now start well little girl said ginger in a shrilled affected voice i know how your little heart beats at me i know i'm your knight and all that you've left a lot out said william you've left out where he said he wouldn't marry her on monday now you go on joan mr march squeaked joan in a piercing hauteur are you mad no corrected william are you feeling ill comes first let's start again and get it right ethel flounced out of the room and slammed the door she found her mother in the dining-room darning socks mother she said can't we do something about william can't we send him to an orphanage or something no darling said mrs brown calmly you see for one thing he isn't an orphan but he's so awful said ethel he's so unspeakably dreadful oh no ethel said mrs brown still darning placidly don't say things like that about your little brother i sometimes think that when william's just had his hair cut and got a new suit on he looks quite sweet End of chapter eight chapter nine of still william by rickmall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine william's truthful christmas william went to church with his family every sunday morning but he did not usually listen to the sermon he considered it a waste of time he sometimes enjoyed singing the psalm and hymns any stone-deaf person could have told when william was singing the psalms and hymns by the expression of pain on the faces of those around him william's singing was loud and uh, discordant it completely drowned the organ and the choir. Miss Barney, who stood just in front of him, said that it always gave her a headache for the rest of the week. William contested with some indignation that he had as good a right to sing in church as any one. Besides, there was nothing wrong with his voice. It was just like everyone else's. During the vicar's sermon, William either stared at the curate william always scored in this game because the curate invariably began to grow pink and looked embarrassed after about five minutes of william's stare 
or held a face-pulling competition with the red-haired choir-boy or amused himself with insects conveyed to church in a matchbox in his pocket still restrained by the united glares of his father and mother and ethel and robert but this sunday attracted by the frequent repetition of the word christmas william put his stag beetle back into its box and gave his whole attention to the vicar's exhortation what is it that poisons our whole social life said the vicar earnestly what is it that spoils even the holy season that lies before us it is deceit it is untruthfulness let each one of us decide here and now for this season of christmas at least to cast aside all deceit and hypocrisy and speak the truth one with another it will be the first step to a holier life it will make this christmas the happiest of our lives william's attention was drawn from the exhortation by the discovery that he had not quite closed the matchbox and the stag beetle was crawling up ethel's coat fortunately ethel was busily engaged in taking in all the details of marian hatherley's new dress across the aisle and did not notice william recaptured his pet and shut up the matchbox then rose to join lustily and inharmoniously in the first verse of onward christian soldiers during the other verses he employed himself by trying a perfectly new grimace which he had been practising all week on the choir boy it was intercepted by the curate who shuddered and looked away hastily the sight and sound of william in the second row from the front completely spoilt the service for the curate every sunday he was an aesthetic young man and william's appearance and personality hurt his sense of beauty but the words of the sermon had made a deep impression on william he decided for this holy season at least to cast aside deceit and hypocrisy and speak the truth one with another william had not been entirely without aspiration to a higher life before this he had once decided to be self-sacrificing for a whole day and his efforts had been totally unappreciated and misunderstood he had once tried to reform others and the result had been even more disastrous but he never made a real effort to cast aside deceit and hypocrisy and to speak the truth one with another he decided to try it at christmas as the vicar had suggested much to his disgust william heard that uncle frederick and aunt emma had asked his family to stay with them for christmas he gathered that the only drawback to the arrangement in the eyes of his family was himself and the probable effect of his personality on the peaceful household of uncle frederick and aunt emma he was not at all offended he was quite used to this view of himself all right he said obligingly you just go i don't mind i'll stay at home you just leave me money and my presents and i won't mind a bit william's spirits in fact soared sky-high at the prospect of such an oasis of freedom in the desert of parental interference but his family betrayed again that strange disinclination to leave william to his own devices that hampered so many of william's activities no william said his mother we certainly can't do that you'll have to come with us but i do hope you'll be good william remembered the sermon and his good resolution well he said cryptically i guess if you knew what i was going to be like at christmas you'd almost want me to come it happened that william's father was summoned on christmas eve to the sick bed of one of his aunts and so could not accompany them but they set off under robert's leadership and arrived safely uncle frederick and aunt emma were very stout and good-natured looking but uncle frederick was the stouter and more good-natured looking of the two they had not seen william since he was a baby that explained the fact of their having invited william and his family to spend christmas with them they lived too far away to have heard even rumors of the horror with which william inspired the grown-up world around him they greeted william kindly so this is little william said uncle frederick putting his hand on william's head and how is little william william removed his head from uncle frederick's hand in silence then said distantly uh, well um, thank you and so grateful to your uncle and aunt for asking you to stay with him aren't you william went on his mother 
william remembered that his career of truthfulness did not begin till the next day so he said still more distantly yes that evening ethel said to her mother in william's presence well he's not been so bad to-day considering you wait said william unctuously you wait till to-morrow when i start casting aside deceit and and to-day will be nothing to it william awoke early on christmas day he had hung up his stocking the night before and was pleased to see it fairly full he took out the presents quickly but not very optimistically he had been early disillusioned in the matter of grown-ups capacity for choosing suitable presents memories of prayer books and history books and socks and handkerchiefs floated before his mental vision yes as bad as ever a case containing a pen and pencil and ruler a new brush and comb a purse empty and a new tie a penknife and a box of toffee were the only redeeming features on the chair by his bedside was a book of church history from aunt emma and a box containing a pair of compasses a protractor and a set square from uncle frederick william dressed but as it was too early to go down he sat down on the floor and ate all his tin of toffee then he turned his attention to his church history book he read a few pages but the character and deeds of the saintly aden so exasperated him that he was driven to relieve his feelings by taking his new pencil from its case and adorning the saint's picture by the addition of a top hat and spectacles he completed the alterations by a moustache and by changing the book the saint held into an attache case he made similar alterations to every picture in the book st oswald seemed much improved by them and this cheered william considerably then he took his penknife and began to carve his initials upon his brush and comb william appeared at breakfast wearing his new tie and having brushed his hair with his new brush or rather with what was left of his new brush after his very drastic initial carving he carried under his arm his presents for his host and hostess he exchanged happy christmas gloomily his resolve to cast away deceit and hypocrisy and speak the truth one with another lay heavy upon him he regarded it as an obligation that could not be shirked william was a boy of great tenacity of purpose having once made up his mind to a course he pursued it regardless of consequences well william darling said his mother did you find your presents yes said william gloomily thank you did you like the book and instruments that uncle and i gave you said aunt emma brightly no said william gloomily and truthfully i'm not interested in church history and i've got something like those at school not that i want em he added hastily if i hadn't em william screamed mrs brown in horror how can you be so ungrateful i'm not ungrateful exclaimed william wearily i'm only being truthful i'm casting aside deceit and 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 hip, 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 what he said i'm only saying that i'm not interested in church history nor in these instruments but thank you very much for em there was a gasp of dismay and a horrified silence during which william drew his paper packages from under his arm here are your christmas presents from me he said the atmosphere brightened they unfastened their parcels with expressions of anticipation and christian forgiveness upon their faces william watched them his face registering only patient suffering it's very kind of you said aunt emma still struggling with a string it's not kind said william still treading doggedly the path of truth mother said i got to bring you something mrs brown coughed suddenly and loudly but not in time to drown the fatal words of truth but uh, uh, still uh, uh, very kind said aunt emma though with less enthusiasm at last she brought out a small pincushion oh thank you very much william she said you really oughtn't to have spent your money on me like this i didn't said william stonily i hadn't any money but i'm very glad you like it it was left over from mother's stall at the sale of work and mother said it was no use keeping it for next year cause it had got so faded again mrs brown coughed loudly but too late aunt emma said coldly i see yes uh, your mother was quite right but thank you all the same william 
Uncle Frederick had now taken the wrappings from his present and held up a leather purse. "'Ah, oh, this is a really useful present,' he said jovially. "'I'm afraid it's not very useful,' said William. "'Uncle Jim sent it to Father for his birthday, but Father said it was no use cause the catch wouldn't catch, so he gave it to me to give to you.' Uncle Frederick tried the catch. "'Um, uh, uh, uh,' he said. "'Your father was quite right. The catch won't catch. Oh, never mind. I'll send it back to your father as a New Year present. What?' As soon as the Brown family were left alone, it turned upon William in a combined attack. "'I warned you,' said Ethel to her mother. "'He ought to be hung,' said Robert. "'William, how could you?' said Mrs. Brown. "'When I'm bad, you go on at me,' said William with exasperation. "'And when I'm trying to lead a holier life and cast aside hip, 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 what he said, you go on at me. I don't know what I can be.' I don't mind being hung. I'd as soon be hung as keep having Christmas over and over again, simply every year the way we do. William accompanied the party to church after breakfast. He was slightly cheered by discovering a choir boy with a natural aptitude for grimaces and an instinctive knowledge of the rules of the game. The vicar preached an unconvincing sermon on unselfishness, and the curate gave full play to an ultra-Oxford accent, and a voice that was almost as unmusical as William's. Aunt Emma said it had been a beautiful service. The only bright spot to William was when the organist boxed the ears of the youngest choir boy, who retaliated by putting out his tongue at the organist at the beginning of each verse of the last hymn. William was very silent during lunch. He simply didn't know what people saw in Christmas. It was just like ten Sundays rolled into one, and they didn't even give people the sort of presents they'd like. No one all his life had ever given him a water pistol, or a catapult, or a trumpet, or bows and arrows, or anything really useful. And if they didn't like truth and cast him aside deceit and, and the other thing they could do without, but he was jolly well going to go on with it. He'd made up his mind, and he was jolly well going to go on with it. His silence was greatly welcomed by his family. He ate plentifully, however, of the turkey and plum pudding, and felt strangely depressed afterwards, so much that he followed the example of the rest of the family, and went up to his bedroom. There he brushed his hair with his new brush, but he had carved his initials so deeply and spaciously that the brush came in two with the first flourish. He brushed his shoes with the two halves with great gusto, in the manner of the professional shoe-black. Then, having nothing else to do, he turned to his church history again. The desecrated pictures of the saints met his gaze, and realizing suddenly the enormity of the crime in grown eyes, he took his penknife and cut them all out. He made paper boats of them, and deliberately, and because he hated it, he cut his new tie into strips to fasten some of the boats together. He organized a thrilling naval battle with them, and was almost forgetting his grudge against life in general, and Christmas in particular. He was roused to the sense of the present by sounds of life and movement downstairs, and thrusting his saintly paper fleet into his pyjama case, he went down to the drawing-room. As he entered, there came the sound of a car drawing up at the front door, and Uncle Frederick looked out of the window and groaned aloud. "'It's Lady Atkinson,' he said. "'Help! Help!' "'Now, Frederick, dear,' said Aunt Emma hastily, "'don't talk like that, and do try to be nice to her. "'She's one of the Atkinsons, you know,' "'and she explained with impressment to Mrs. Brown in a whisper "'as the lady was shown in. "'Lady Atkinson was stout and elderly "'and wore a very youthful hat and coat. "'A happy Christmas to you all,' she said graciously. "'The boy, your nephew, oh, William, how do you do, William? "'He stares rather, doesn't he? "'Ah, yes,' she greeted everyone separately with infinite condescension. "'I've brought you my Christmas presents in person,' she went on, "'in the tone of voice of one giving an unheard-of treat. "'Look!' she took out of an envelope a large signed photograph of herself. "'There, now, what do you think of that?' "'Murmurs of surprise and admiration and gratitude. "'Lady Atkinson drank them in complacently. 
it's very good isn't it uh, you l little boy uh, don't you think it's very like me william gazed at it critically it's not as fat as you are was his final offering at the altar of truth william screamed mrs brown how can you be so impolite impolite said william with some indignation i'm not trying to be polite i'm being truthful i can't be everything seems to me i'm the only person in the world that is truthful and no one seems to be grateful to me it isn't as fat as what she is he went on doggedly and it's not got as many little lines on its face as what she has and it's different looking altogether it looks pretty and she doesn't lady atkinson towered over him quivering with rage you nasty little boy she said thrusting her face close to his you nasty little boy then she swept out of the room without another word the front door slammed she was gone aunt emma sat down and began to weep she'll never come to the house again she said i always said he ought to be hung said robert gloomily every day we let him live he complicates our lives still worse i shall tell your father william said mrs brown directly we get home the kindest thing to think said ethel is that he's mad well said william i don't know what i've done except cast aside deceit and 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 the other thing what he said in church and speak the truth and that i don't know why everyone's so mad at me just cause of that you'd think they'd be glad she'll never set foot in the house again sobbed aunt emma uncle frederick who had been vainly trying to hide his glee rose i don't think she will my dear he said cheerfully nothing like the truth william absolutely nothing he pressed a half crown into william's hand surreptitiously as he went to the door a diversion was mercifully caused at this moment by the arrival of the post among it there was a christmas card from an artist who had a studio about five minutes walk from the house this little attention comforted aunt emma very much how kind of him she said and we never sent him anything but there's that calendar that mr frank sent to us and it's not written on perhaps william could be trusted to take it to mr fairley with our compliments while the rest of us go for a short walk she looked at william rather coldly william who was feeling the atmosphere indoors inexplicably hostile except for uncle frederick's equally inexplicable friendliness was glad of an excuse for escaping he got off with the calendar wrapped in brown paper on the way his outlook on life was considerably brightened by finding a street urchin's fight in full swing he joined in it with gusto and was soon acclaimed leader of his side this exhilarating adventure was ended by a policeman who scattered the combatants and pretended to chase william down a side street in order to vary the monotony of his christmas beat william looking rather battered and dishevelled arrived at mr fairley's studio the calendar had fortunately survived the battle unscathed and william handed it to mr fairley who opened the door mr fairley showed him into the studio with a low bow mr fairley was clothed in correct artistic style baggy trousers velvet coat and a flowing tie he had a pointed beard and a theatrical manner he had obviously lunched well as far as liquid refreshment was concerned at any rate he was moved to tears by the calendar how kind how very kind my dear young friend forgive this emotion the world is hard i'm not used to kindness it unmans me he wiped away his tears with a large mauve and yellow handkerchief william gazed at it fascinated if you will excuse me my dear young friend went on mr fairley i will retire to my bedroom where i have the wherewithal to write and indite a letter of thanks to your most delightful and charming relative i beg you to make yourself at home here use my house my dear young friend as though it were your own he waved his arms and retreated unsteadily to an inner room closing the door behind him william sat down on a chair and waited time passed william became bored suddenly a fresh aspect of his christmas resolution occurred to him 
If you were speaking the truth, one with another yourself, surely you might take everything that other people said for truth. He'd said, use this house, my dear young friend, as though it were your own. Well, he would. The man probably meant it. Well, anyway, he shouldn't have said it if he didn't. William went across the room and opened a cupboard. It contained a medley of paints, two palettes, two oranges, and a cake. The feeling of oppression that had followed William's Christmas lunch had faded, and he attacked the cake with gusto. It took about ten minutes to finish the cake, and about four to finish the oranges. William felt refreshed. He looked round the studio with renewed interest. A lay figure sat upon a couch on a small platform. William approached it cautiously. It was almost life-size and clad in a piece of thin silk. William lifted it. It was quite light. He put it on a chair by the window. Then he went to the little back room. A bonnet and mackintosh, belonging to Mr. Fairley's charwoman, hung there. He dressed the lay figure in the bonnet and mackintosh. He found a piece of black gauze in a drawer and put it over the figure's face as a veil and tied it round the bonnet. He felt all the thrill of the creative artist. He shook hands with it and talked to it. He began to have a feeling of deep affection for it. He called it Annabelle. The clock struck, and he remembered the note he was waiting for. He knocked gently at the bedroom door. There was no answer. He opened the door and entered. On the writing table by the door was a letter. Dear friend, many thanks for your beautiful calendar. Words fail me. Then came a blot, mingled ink and emotion, and that was all. Words had failed Mr. Fairley so completely that he lay outstretched on the sofa by the window, sleeping the sleep of the slightly inebriated. William thought he'd better not wake him up. He returned to the studio and carried on his self-imposed task of investigation. He found some acid drops in a drawer adhering to a tube of yellow ochre. He separated them and ate the acid drops, but their strong flavor of yellow ochre made him feel sick, and he returned to Annabelle for sympathy. Then he thought of a game. The lay figure was a captured princess, and William was the gallant rescuer. He went outside, opened the front door cautiously, crept into the hall, hid behind the door, dashed into the studio, caught up the figure in his arms, and dashed into the street with it. The danger and exhilaration of a race for freedom through the streets with Annabelle in his arms was too enticing to be resisted. As a matter of fact, the flight through the streets was rather disappointing. He met no one, and no one pursued him. He staggered up the steps to Aunt Emma's house, still carrying Annabelle. There, considering the matter for the first time in cold blood, he realized that his rescue of Annabelle was not likely to be received enthusiastically by his home circle, and Annabelle was not easy to conceal. The house seemed empty, but he could already hear its inmates returning from their walk. He felt a sudden hatred of Annabelle for being so large and unhideable. He could not reach the top of the stairs before they came in at the door. The drawing-room door was open, and into it he rushed, depositing Annabel in a chair by the fireplace with her back to the room, and returned to the hall. He smoothed back his hair, assumed his most vacant expression, and awaited them. To his surprise they crept past the drawing-room door on tiptoe, and congregated in the dining-room. "'A caller,' said Aunt Emma. "'Did you see?' "'Yes, in the dining-room,' said Mrs. Brown. "'I saw her hat through the window.' "'Curse,' said Uncle Frederick. "'The maids must have shown her in before they went up to change. "'I'm simply not going to see her. "'On Christmas Day, too. "'I'll just wait till she gets tired and goes, "'or till one of the maids comes down and can send her away.' "'Shh,' said Uncle Frederick. "'She'll hear you.' Aunt Emma lowered her voice. I don't think she's a lady, she said. She didn't look it through the window. Perhaps she's collecting for something, said Mrs. Brown. Well, said Aunt Emma, sinking her voice to a conspiratorial whisper, if we stay in here and keep very quiet, she'll get tired of waiting and go. William was torn between an interested desire to be safely out of the way when the denouement took place and a disinterested desire to witness the denouement. 
the latter won and he stood at the back of the group with a sphinx-like expression upon his freckled face they waited in silence for some minutes then aunt emma said well she'll stay forever it seems to me if someone doesn't send her away frederick go and turn her out they all crept into the hall uncle frederick went just inside and coughed loudly annabelle did not move uncle frederick came back deaf he whispered stone deaf someone else try ethel advanced boldly into the middle of the room good afternoon she said clearly and sweetly annabelle did not move ethel returned i think she must be asleep said ethel she looks drunk to me said aunt emma peeping round the corner i shouldn't wonder if she was dead said robert it's just the sort of thing you read about in books mysterious dead body found in drawing-room i bet i can find a few clues to the murder if she is dead robert reproved mrs brown in a shrill whisper perhaps you'd better fetch the police frederick said aunt emma i'll have one more try said uncle frederick he entered the room good afternoon he bellowed annabelle did not move he went up to her now look here my woman he began laying his hand on her shoulder then the denouement happened mr fairley burst into the house like a whirlwind still slightly inebriated and screaming with rage where's the thief where is he he's stolen my figure he's eaten my tea i shall have to eat my supper for my tea and my breakfast for my supper i shall be a meal wrong always i shall never get right and it's all his fault where is he he's stolen my charwoman's clothes he's stolen my figure he's eaten my tea wait till i get him he caught sight of annabel rushed into the drawing-room caught her up in his arms and turned round upon the circle of open-mouthed spectators i hate you he screamed and your nasty little calendars and your nasty little boys stealing my figure and eating my tea i'll light the fire with your nasty little calendar i'd like to light the fire with your nasty little boy with a final snort of fury he turned still clasping annabel in his arms and staggered down the front steps weakly stricken and for the moment speechless they watched his departure from the top of the steps he took to his heels as soon as he was in the road but he was less fortunate than william as he turned the corner and vanished from sight already two policemen were in pursuit he was screaming defiance at them as he ran annabel's head wobbled over his shoulder and her bonnet dangled by a string then no longer speechless they turned on william i told you said robert to them when there was a slight lull in the storm you wouldn't take my advice if it wasn't christmas day i'd hang him myself but you won't let me speak said william plaintively just listen to me a minute when i got to his house he said he said most distinct he said please use this william interrupted mrs brown with dignity i don't know what's happened and i don't want to know but i shall tell your father all about it directly we get home uncle frederick saw them off at the station the next day does your effort at truth continue to-day as well he said to william i suppose it's boxing day too said william he didn't mention boxing day but i suppose it counts with christmas i won't ask you whether you've enjoyed yourself then said uncle frederick he slipped another half-crown into william's hand buy yourself something with that your aunt chose the church history book and the instruments i'm really grateful to you about well i think emma's right i don't think she'll ever come again the train steamed out uncle frederick returned home he had been too optimistic lady atkinson was in the drawing-room talking to his wife of course she was saying i'm not annoyed i bear no grudge because i believe the boy's possessed he ought to be uh, exercised you know what you do with evil spirits it was the evening of william's return home his father's question as to whether william had been good had been answered as usual in the negative and refused to listen to details of accusation or defence ignoring williams but he said most distinct he said please use this and the rest of the explanation always drowned by the others he docked william of a month's pocket money but william was not depressed the ordeal of christmas was over normal life stretched before him once more his spirits rose 
he wandered out into the lane there he met ginger his bosom pal with whom on normal days he fought and wrestled and carried out deeds of daring and wickedness but who like william on festivals and holy days was forced reluctantly to shed the light of his presence upon his own family from ginger's face too a certain gloom cleared as he saw william well said william have you enjoyed it i had a pair of braces from my aunt said ginger bitterly a pair of braces well i had a tie and a church history book i put my braces down the well i chopped up my tie into little bits was it nice at your aunt's william's grievances burst out i went to church and took what that man said and i've been speaking the truth one with another and leading a higher life and well it jolly well didn't make it the happiest christmas of my life what he said it would it made it the worst everyone mad at me all the time i think i was the only person in the world speaking the truth one with another and they've took off my pocket money for it and you think for you speaking the truth yourself you might take what any one else said for truth and keep telling em that he said most distinct please use this house as if it were your own but they won't listen to me while i've done with it i'm going back to deceit and and uh, what's a word beginning with uh, i hypnotism suggested ginger after deep thought yeah that's it said william and i'm going back to it first thing tomorrow morning end of chapter nine chapter ten of still william by rickmall crompton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter ten an afternoon with william william's family was staying at the seaside for his summer holidays this time was generally cordially detested by william he hated being dragged from his well-known haunts his woods and fields and friends and dog for jumble was not the kind of dog one takes away on a holiday he hated the uncongenial atmosphere of hotels and boarding-houses he hated the dull promenades and the town gardens where walking over the grass and playing at red indians was discouraged he failed utterly to understand the attraction that such places seemed to possess for his family he took a pride and pleasure in the expression of gloom and boredom that he generally managed to maintain during the whole length of the holiday but this time it was different ginger was staying with his family at the same hotel as william ginger's father and william's father played golf together ginger's mother and william's mother looked at the shops and the sea together william and ginger went off together on secret expeditions though no cajoleries or coaxings would have persuaded william to admit that he was enjoying his holiday still the presence of ginger made it difficult for him to maintain his usual aspect of gloomy scorn they hunted for smugglers in the caves they slipped over seaweedy rocks and fell into the pools left by the retreating tide they carried on warfare from trenches which they made in the sand dug mines and countermines and generally got damp sand so deeply ingrained in their clothes and hair that as mrs brown said almost tearfully they simply defied brushing Today they were engaged in the innocent pursuit of wandering along the front and sampling the various attractions which it offered they stood through three performances of the punch and judy show laughing uproariously each time as they had taken possession of the best view and as it never seemed to occur to them to contribute towards the expenses the showman finally ordered them off they wandered off obligingly and bought two penny sticks of licorice at the next stall then they bought two penny giant glasses of biliously coloured green lemonade and quaffed them in front of the stall with intense enjoyment then they wandered away from the crowded part of the front to the empty space beyond the rocks ginger found a dead crab and william made a fire and tried to cook it but the result was not encouraging they ate what was left of their licorice sticks to take away the taste then went on to the caves they reviewed the possibility of hunting for smugglers uh, without enthusiasm 
William was feeling disillusioned with smugglers. He seemed to have spent the greater part of his life hunting for smugglers. They seemed to be an unpleasantly secretive set of people. They might have let him catch just one. They flung stones into the retreating tide and leapt into the little pools to see how high they could make the splashes go. Then they saw the boat. It was lying by itself, high and dry, on the shore. It was a nice little boat with two oars inside. "'Wonder how long it would take to get to France in it,' said William. "'Just no time, I expect,' said Ginger. "'Why, you can see France from my bedroom window. It must just be no distance, simply no distance.' They looked at the boat in silence for a few minutes. "'It looks as if it would go quite easy,' said William. "'We'd have it back before whosoever it is wanted it,' said Ginger. "'We couldn't do it any harm,' said William. "'It's simply no distance to France from my bedroom window,' said Ginger. The longing in their frowning countenances changed to determination. "'Come on,' said William. It was quite easy to push and pull the boat down to the water. Soon they were seated, their hearts triumphant, and their clothes soaked with sea water in the little boat, and were being carried rapidly out to sea. At first William tried to ply the oars, but a large wave swept them both away. "'Doesn't really matter,' said William cheerfully. "'The tide's taken us across to France all right, without bothering with oars.' For a time they lay back, enjoying the motion, and trailing fingers in the water. "'It's almost as good as being pirates, isn't it?' said William. At the end of half an hour, Ginger said with a dark frown, "'Seems to me we aren't going in the right direction for France. Seems to me, Captain, we've been swept out of our course. I can't see no land anywhere.' "'Well, we must be going somewhere,' said William, the optimist. "'And wherever it is, it'll be interesting. "'It mightn't be,' said Ginger, who was ceasing to enjoy the motion and was taking a gloomy view of life. "'Well, I'm getting jolly hungry,' said William. "'Well, I'm not,' said Ginger.' William looked at him with interest. "'You're looking a bit pale,' he said, with over-cheerful sympathy. "'Perhaps it was the crab.' Ginger made no answer. "'Or oh, it might have been the licorice or the lemonade,' said William with interest. "'I wish you'd shut up talking about them,' snapped Ginger. "'Well, I feel almost dying of hunger,' said William. "'In books they draw lots, and then one kills the other and eats them.' "'I wouldn't mind anyone killing and eating me,' said Ginger. "'I've nothing to kill you with anyway, so it's no good talking about it,' said William. "'Seems to me,' said Ginger, raising his head from his gloomy contemplation of the waves, "'that we keep changing the direction we're going in. "'We're like as not in America or China or somewhere, and our folks will think we're drowned.' "'We'll probably find gold mines in China or somewhere and make our fortunes.' and we'll come home changed and old and they won't know us their spirits rose suddenly william called excitedly i see land just look they were certainly rapidly nearing land oh, thank goodness murmured ginger an uninhabited island i spect said william or an island inhabited by wild savages said ginger the boat was pushed gently on to land by the incoming tide ginger and william disembarked "'I don't care where we are,' said Ginger firmly, "'but I'm going to stop here all my life. "'I'm not going in that old boat again.' A faint color had returned to his cheeks. "'You can't stop on an uninhabited island all your life,' said William aggressively. "'You'll have to go away. "'You needn't go and eat dead crabs just before you start, "'but you can't live on an uninhabited island all your life.' "'Oh, do shut up talking about dead crabs,' said Ginger.' "'Here's a hole in a hedge,' said William. "'Let's creep through and see what there is on the other side. "'Creep, mine, and don't breathe. "'It'll probably be wild savages or cannibals or something.' "'They crept through the hedge. "'There, in a wide green space, "'some lightly clad beings were dancing backwards and forwards. "'One in the front called out unintelligible commands in a shrill voice. "'William and Ginger crept behind a tree.' savages said william in a hoarse whisper cannibals crumbs said ginger what'll we do the white-clad figures began to leap into the air 
charge em said william his freckled face set in a determined frown charge em and put em to flight utterin wild yells to scare em before they've got time to know we're here all right said ginger come on ready said william through set lips steady go the new school of greek dancing was a few miles down the coast from where william and ginger had originally set forth in the boat the second afternoon open-air class was in progress weedy males and aesthetic-looking females dressed in abbreviated tunics with sandals on their feet and fillets about their hair mostly wearing horn spectacles ran and sprang and leapt and gambled and struck angular attitudes at the shrill command of the instructress and the somewhat unmusical efforts of the very amateur flute player now run so hands extended uh, so left leg up so head looking over shoulder so N no try not to overbalance that piece again uh, never mind the music just do as i say so ow ow go two tornadoes rushed out from behind a tree and charged wildly into the crowd of aesthetic and bony revellers with heads and arms and legs they fought and charged and kicked and pushed and bit they might have been a dozen instead of two a crowd of thin lightly clad females ran screaming indoors one young man nimbly climbed a tree and another lay prone in a rose bush we put em to flight said william breathlessly pausing for a moment from his labors yes said ginger dispiritedly and what'll we do next oh just keep em at bay and live on their food said william vaguely and perhaps they'll soon begin to worship us as gods but william was unduly optimistic the flute player had secured some rope from an outhouse and accompanied by some other youths he was already creeping up behind william in a few moments time william and ginger found themselves bound to neighbouring trees they struggled wildly they looked a strange couple the struggle had left them tieless and collarless their hair stood on end their faces were stained with licorice juice they'll eat us for supper said william to ginger sure as fate they'll eat us for supper they're probably boiling the water to cook us in now go on try and bite through your rope i have tried said ginger wearily it's nearly pulled all my teeth out i wish i'd told em to give jumble to henry said william sadly they'll probably keep him to themselves or sell him they'll be sorry they took my trumpet off me when they hear i'm eaten by savages said ginger with a certain satisfaction the greek dancers were drawing near by degrees from their hiding places mad they were saying one of them bit me and he's probably got hydrophobia i'm going to call on my doctor he simply charged me in the stomach i think it's given me appendicitis kicked my leg i can see the bruise quite spoiled the atmosphere william said ginger faintly isn't it funny they talk english when she expect them to talk some savage language i expect they've learnt it off folks they've eaten from the open window of the house behind the trees came the loud tones of a lady who was evidently engaged in speaking through a telephone yes wild absolutely mad must have escaped from the asylum no one escaped from the asylum then they must have been going to the asylum and escaped on the way well if they aren't lunatics they're criminals please send a large force it was when two stalwart and quite obviously english policemen appeared that william's bewilderment finally took from him the power of speech crumbs was all he said he was quite silent all the way home he coldly repulsed all the policemen's friendly overtures mrs brown screamed when from the lounge window she saw her son and his friend approaching with their escort it was mr brown who went boldly out to meet them paid vast sums of hush money to the police force and brought in his son by the scruff of his neck well said william almost tearfully at the end of a long and painful course of home truths if they'd really been cannibals and meet me you'd probably perhaps have been sorry mr brown whose peace had been disturbed and reputation publicly laid low by william's escort and appearance looked at him you flatter yourself my son he said with bitterness what'll we do to-day said ginger the next morning let's start with watchin the punch and judy said william 
i'm not going in no boats said ginger firmly all right said william cheerfully but if we find another dead crab i've thought of a better way of cooking it End of chapter 10chapter eleven of still william by rickmall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven william spoils the party the bots were going to give a fancy dress dance at the hall on new year's eve and william and all his family had been invited the inviting of william of course was the initial mistake and if only the bots had had the ordinary horse sense it was robert who said this not to invite william the thing might have been a success it wasn't as if they didn't know william if they hadn't known william robert said one might have been sorry for them but knowing william and deliberately inviting him to a fancy dress dance well they jolly well deserved all they got on the other hand william's own family didn't and it was jolly hard lines on them again i quote robert knowing that they had william all day and every day at home any one would think they'd have had the decency to invite them out without him i mean whatever you said or whatever you did uh, you couldn't prevent it he spoilt your life wherever he went but the bots of bots famous digestive sauce had a ballroom that held two hundred guests and they wanted to fill it moreover the bots had a cherished daughter of tender years named violet elizabeth and violet elizabeth with her most engaging lisp and that hint of tears that was her most potent weapon had said that she wanted her friend to be invited too and she'd scream and scream and scream till she was thick if they didn't invite her friend to the party too all right pet had said mr bott soothingly after all we may as well give a real slap-up show while we're about it and swell out the whole place kids and all mr botts was self-made and considering all things had made quite a decent job of himself but his manners had not the repose that stamps the cast of vere de vere violet elizabeth on the other hand had been brought up from infancy in the lap of luxury and refinement provided by the successful advertising of bott's famous digestive sauce the delight with which robert and ethel william's elder brother and sister received the invitation to the fancy dress dance was as i have said considerably tempered by the fact of william's inclusion in the invitation and william with his natural perversity was eager to go any show we want him to go to said robert bitterly he raises cane about but when a thing like this comes along a thing that he'll completely spoil for us if he comes like he always does he spread out his arm with the eloquent gesture of one tried almost beyond endurance and left the sentence unfinished well let's accept for ourselves and say that william can't go because he's got a previous engagement suggested ethel but i haven't said william indignantly i haven't got anything at all wrong with me i'm quite well and i want to go i don't see why everyone else should go but me besides using an argument that he knew would appeal to them you'll all be there and you'll be able to see that i'm not doing anything wrong but if i was alone at home you wouldn't know what i was doing not he added hastily that i want to do anything wrong all i want to do is to make others happy and i'll have a better chance of doing that at a party than if i was all alone at home these virtuous sentiments did not increase the suspicious distrust of his family the general feeling was that far worse things happened when william was out to be good than when he was frankly out to be bad oh i i think william must go said mrs brown in her placid voice it will be so interesting for him and i'm sure he'll be good mrs brown's rather pathetic faith in william's latent powers of goodness was unshared by any others of his family anyway she went on hastily seeing only incredulity on the faces around her the thing to do now is to decide what we're all going as i think i'll go as a lion said william i should think you could buy a lion skin quite cheap oh quite said robert sarcastically oh, why not shoot one while you're about it 
"'Yes, and I will,' said William. "'If you'll show me one, I bet my bow and arrow would kill a few lions.' "'No, William, darling,' interposed Mrs. Brown again quickly. "'I think you'll find a lion's skin too hot for a crowded room.' Well, "'I won't go into the room,' said William. "'I want to crawl about the garden in it, roaring and springing out of folks, scaring them. "'And you just said you wanted to go and make people happy,' said Robert sternly. "'Well, that'd make em happy,' said William unabashed. "'It'd be fun for em. "'Not a lion, darling,' said his mother firmly. "'Well, um, a brigand, then,' suggested William. "'A brigand with knives all over me.' mrs brown shuddered no william i believe aunt emma has a fancy dress suit of little lord fauntleroy that cousin jimmy once wore i expect she'd lend it but i'm not sure whether it wouldn't be too small wild shouts greeted this suggestion well william said offended i don't know who he was but i don't know why you should think me being him so funny the little lord fauntleroy suit proved too small much to the relief of william's family but another cousin was found to have a page's costume which just fitted william but it certainly did not suit him as mrs brown put it i don't know quite what's wrong with the costume but somehow it looks so much more attractive off than on robert was to go as henry v and ethel as knight william to his delight found that all the members of his immediate circle of friends known to themselves as the outlaws had been invited to the fancy dress dance all had wished to go as animals or brigands or pirates but family opposition and the offer of the loan of costumes from other branches of their families had been too strong in every case ginger was to be an ace of clubs henry a gondolier don't know what it is remarked henry despondently but you bet it's nothing exciting or they wouldn't have let me be it douglas was to be a goatherd it's an old little boy blue set out he explained mournfully but i said i wouldn't go if they didn't call it something else not but what everyone'll know he ended gloomily and we could have been brigands so easy so easy said ginger indignantly why you only want a shirt and a pair of trousers and a colored handkerchief round your head and a scarf thing round your waist with a few knives and choppers and things in it no trouble at all for em and they just won't let us just cause we want to there was a short silence then william spoke well let's he said let's get brigands things and change into em when we've got there they'll never know they'll never notice we'll hide em in the old summer house by the lake and go and change there and and, and we won't wear their rotten old boy blues and gone to what a variates we'll be brigands we'll be brigands agreed the outlaws joyfully the bots were having a large house party for the occasion lord merton is going to be here said mrs brown to her husband looking up from her usual occupation of darning socks as he entered the room just fancy he's in the cabinet mr botts got to know his son in business and he's coming down for it and going to stay the night that fellow snorted mr brown he ought to be shot mr brown's political views were always very decided and very violent he's ruining the country is he dear said mrs brown in her usual placid voice but i'm sure he'll look awfully nice as a toreador she says he's going as a toreador toreador snorted mr brown very appropriate too he is a toreador and we're the bull i tell you that man's policy is bringing the country to rack and ruin when you're dying of starvation you can think of the fellow toreadoring toreador indeed i wonder decent people have him in their houses toreador indeed i tell you he's bleeding the country to death he ought to be hung for murder that man's policy i tell you is wicked criminal leave him alone and in ten years time you'll have wiped out half the population of england by slow starvation he's killing trade he's ruining the country yes dear murmured mrs brown i'm sure you're right i think these blue socks of yours are almost done don't you ruining it snorted mr brown going out of the room and slamming the door william looked up from the table where he was engaged theoretically in doing his homework 
practically he was engaged in sticking pins into the lid of his pencil case why's he not in prison if he's like that said william who darling said mrs brown your father no the man he was talking about and what's a toreador oh uh, a man who fights bulls william's spirits rose will there be bulls there oh i hope not dear shall i go as a bull it seems silly to have a tor what it you said without a bull i could easily get a bull skin i expect the butcher would give me one mrs brown shuddered no dear most certainly not now go get on with your homework william having fixed all his pins except one into the lid now took the last pin and began to twang them with it they made different noises according as they were twanged near the head or near the point mrs brown looked up then bent her head again over her darning what funny things they taught children nowadays she thought the day of the dance drew nearer robert was still feeling sore at the prospect of william's presence he relieved his feelings by jeering at william's costume william himself as it happened was not quite happy about the costume it was a long stretch from the animal skin and brigand's apparel of his fancy to this pale blue sateen of reality when he heard a visitor to whom mrs brown showed it say that it was picturesque his distrust of it grew deeper robert was never tired of alluding to it won't william look sweet he would say and don't frown like that william that won't go with the little prince charming costume at all william accepted these taunts with outward indifference but no one insulted william with impunity robert might have taken warning from past experiences when not engaged in tempting the fates by teasing william robert was engaged in trying to win the affection of a female epitome of all the virtues and graces who had come to stay with the crews for the dance this celestial creature was called glory tompkins robert called her gloire as being more romantic at least he spelt it gloire but pronounced it glore through robert's life there passed a never-ending procession of young females endowed with every beauty of form and soul to each one in turn he sincerely vowed eternal fidelity each one was told in hoarse accents how from now onwards his whole life would be dedicated to making himself more worthy of her then after a week or two her startling perfection would seem less startling and some one yet more perfect would dawn upon the horizon shattering poor robert's susceptible soul yet again fortunately the fidelity of these youthful radiant beings was about on par with robert's own anyway glory was the latest and robert called on the cruise every evening to tell glory with his eyes the expression that he fondly imagined to express lifelong passion as a matter of fact was suggestive chiefly of acute indigestion or with his lips how empty and worthless his life had been till he met her william had his eye on the affair he generally followed robert's love affairs with interest though it was difficult to keep pace with them a handle against robert was useful and more than once robert's love affairs had afforded useful handles robert's physical size and strength made william wary in his choice of weapons but it was generally william who scored on the day before the dance robert had written a note to miss tompkins beloved gloire robert preferred writing gloire to saying it because he had a vague suspicion that he didn't pronounce it quite right you will know with what deep feelings i'm looking forward to to-morrow will you have the first and third and fourth and seventh and eighth with me the fourth is the blues you know that we have been practising if it is fine and the moon is out shall we sit out the first in the rose garden on the seat by the sundial it will be my first meeting with you for two days and i do not want it profaned by other people who know and care nothing of our deep feeling for each other all about us 
when the music starts will you be there and just for the few sacred moments we will tell each other all that is in our souls then we will be gay for the rest of the evening but the memory of those few sacred minutes of the first dance in the rose garden just you and me and the moon and the roses will be with us in our souls all the evening your night robert he was going to take it himself though he knew that his idol had gone away for the day however a friend hailed him just as he was setting out so he put the note on the hat-stand and went out to join his friend meaning to take the note later he met william just coming in hello little pay uh, he said in mock affection william looked at him his brows drawn into a frown his most sphinx-like expression upon his freckled face william's stubbly hair as usual stood up round his face like a halo william was not beautiful robert whistling gaily went down the steps to join his friend at the gate william took up the note read the address and went into the drawing-room where mrs brown was as usual darning socks shall i take this note for robert he said assuming his earnestly virtuous expression mrs brown was touched oh yes dear she said how thoughtful of you an hour later robert returned i say he said where's that note i left a note here has it been taken round yes dear said mrs brown absently at that moment william was sitting on a gate far from the main road reading the note on his face was a smile of pure bliss there was a look of purpose in his eye the evening arrived william as a page ginger as ace of clubs douglas as a goatherd henry as a gondolier stood in a sheepish group and were gazed at proudly by their fond mothers they looked far from happy but the thought of the brigands clothes concealed in the summer-house comforted them robert as henry v was having a good deal of trouble with his costume he had closed the visor of his helmet and it refused to open several of his friends were trying to force it muffled groans came from within violet elizabeth was dressed as a star she was leaping up and down and squeaking look at me i'm a star she shed stars at every leap and an attendant nurse armed with needle and cotton sewed them on again pierrots peasant girls harlequins kings queens gypsies and representatives of every nationality filled the room it was noticed with no particular interest on any one's part that william the page was no longer the centre of the sheepish group of fancy dressed outlaws william the page had crept into the ladies dressing-room and in the temporary absence of the attendant who was engaged in carrying on an impromptu flirtation with a good-looking chauffeur in the drive he purloined a lady's black velvet evening cloak and a filmy scarf fortunately the cloak had a hood robert helmetless and rather purple in the face as the result of his prolonged sojourn behind his visor from which he had finally been freed by a tin opener borrowed from the kitchen came to the rose garden upon the seat that was the appointed trysting place a petite figure was awaiting him shrouded in a cloak glory breathed robert softly the figure seemed to sway towards him though its face was still completely hidden by its scarf and hood robert slipped his strong arm around it and it nestled on his shoulder just to think murmured robert that this time last week i didn't know you you've given an entirely new meaning to my life i feel that everything will be different now i shall give up all my life to trying to be more worthy of you the figure gave a sudden snort and robert started glor are you ill the figure hastily emitted a deep groan robert sprang up glor he cried in distress i'll get you some water i'll call a doctor i'll he fled into the house where he got a glass of water and actually found a doctor a very unhappy doctor in a hired italian costume that was too small for him when he found the seat empty he turned upon robert indignantly but she was here said the bewildered robert i left her here in the most awful agony my god if she's dead 
if she's dead said the doctor coldly i'm afraid i can't do anything i'm sorry to seem unsympathetic but if you knew the pain it causes me to walk in these clothes you'd understand my saying that i'll let the whole world die in awful agony before i come out here again on your wild goose chase after dying females robert was hunting distractedly under all the bushes around the seat the outlaws had changed their clothes they stood arrayed as brigands in all the glory of coloured scarves and handkerchiefs and murderous-looking weapons upon the floor lay the limp outer coating of the page the ace of clubs the gondolier and the goatherd they leapt with joy and brandished kitchen choppers and bread knives and trowels now what are we going to do said ginger everyone else is dancing suggested douglas mildly dancing repeated william scornfully do you think we put these things on to dance well what are we going to do said ginger there's one thing we must do first of all said william he spoke in his leader's manner and his freckled face was stern there's a man here dressed as a tor as a bull killer a toreador said douglas with an air of superior knowledge william looked at him crushingly well didn't i say that he said then turned to the others well this man this tory dour man's been starvin folks and killin em i heard my father say so well we gotta do something we never may get a chance of gettin him again he's a starver and a murderer i heard my father say so and we've gotta do something to him how said the brigands well you listen to me said william the brigands gathered round william crept round the outside of the ballroom through the open window came the sound of the band and looking in william could see couples of gaily dancing youths and maidens in fantastic dresses near one open window henry v stood with a small and dainty columbine but it is my dance with you glor henry v was saying hoarsely i wrote to you and asked you and oh i'm so glad that you're better i've been through hours of agony thinking you were dead you're absolutely mad glory replied impatiently i've no idea what you're talking about you never wrote and you've never asked me for a dance i've never seen you all evening till this minute except in the distance with every one trying to pull your head off you shouldn't come in a costume like that if you don't know how to open and shut it and now you suddenly come and begin to talk nonsense about me being dead glor i wish you'd stop calling me by that silly name but glor glory you must have got my note you were in the rose garden you let me put my arm around you i've been treasuring the memory all evening when i wasn't racked with agony at the thought of you being ill or dead i never met you in the rose garden you're mad i'm not you did oh glor stop calling me that it sounds like a patent medicine or a new kind of metal polish and as you don't care for me enough to get a dance in decent time and as you go mooning about the garden with other girls girls who seem to go dying all over the place from your account and pretend you think they're me well i didn't pretend i thought it was it must have been oh glor stop saying that i've simply finished with you well if you don't care about me enough to know who is me and well, thank you when i want to die i'll do it at home and not in a beastly old rose garden so there and i've finished with you robert brown so there columbine flounced off and henry v pale and distraught pursued her with a ghostly oh glor the brigand passed on a faint smile on his face the toreador had found a quiet corner in the empty smoking-room and was relaxing his weary limbs in an armchair he had indulged in a quiet smoke and was now indulging in a quiet doze he did not like dancing he did not like wearing fancy dress he did not like the bots he did not like the noise of the band he did not like anything he opened his eyes with a start conscious of an alien presence by his side he saw a small and very villainous-looking brigand with a stern freckled face a row of gardening tools and a carving-knife round his waist and a red handkerchief tied round his head 
there's a russian wants to meet you said the brigand in a dramatic whisper he's waiting for you in the coach-house he's got a message for you from the russians private the toreador sat up and rubbed his eyes the brigand was still there please say it again said the toreador there's a russian wants to meet you he's waiting for you in the coach-house he's got a message for you from the russians repeated the brigand where did you say he was said the toreador in the coach-house and what do you say he's got a message from the russians what russians all the russians good lord said the toreador just pinch me will you william obeyed without a flicker of expression upon his face still here said the toreador in a resigned tone of voice i thought it might be a nightmare well there's no harm in going to see what's he like oh just like a russian said william vaguely R russian clothes and russian face and, and and russian boots how did he get here walked said william calmly walked all the way from russia does he speak english no russian how do you know what he says then i learn russian at school said william with admirable presence of mind you're a linguist commented the toreador no i'm not corrected william i'm english like you they were on the way to the coach-house i may as well see it through said the toreador it's so intriguing it's like alice in wonderland a russian brought a message from all the russians and walked all the way from russia he must have started when he was quite a child it's better than being bored to death watching idiots making still greater idiots of themselves this is the coach-house said the brigand it's dark yes said the brigand he's right in the corner over there he's just having a little sleep the toreador stepped into the coach-house the door was immediately slammed and bolted from outside the toreador took out his pocket torch and looked round the room it was empty no russian in russian boots etc with a message from all the russians slept in a corner the only means of exit were the door and a barred window he went to the barred window four small stern brigands stood outside i say said the toreador oh, look here the freckled frowning brigand who had led him there spoke we're not going to let you out he said till you've promised to go away from england and never come back but why said the toreador why should i i know it's all a dream but just tell me why i should anyway because you're starvin and killin folks said the brigand sternly you're ruinin the country i do hope i remember all this when i wake up said the toreador it's too priceless but look here if you don't let me out i'll kick the door down i've never starved any one and i've never killed any one and i we don't want to argue said william remembering a frequent remark of his father's and trying to imitate his tone of voice but we're not going to let you out till you promise to go out of england and never come back with that the brigands turned and went slowly back to the house the sound of a mighty kick against the coach-house door followed them into the night what are we going to do now said ginger oh just look around a bit said william again they went around the outside of the house passing by each open window and just inside one sat henry v with a very demure spring i can't tell you what a difference it's made to me getting to know you henry v was saying by another a group of people stood around a yes the brigands rubbed their eyes and there he was a toreador a tall angular helen of troy well past her first youth and quite obviously never having possessed a face that could launch a thousand ships was sitting in the window recess with an emaciated henry the eighth look she was saying that toreador's lord merton on the cabinet you know quite important the brigands gaped at each other a few minutes later helen of troy looking down saw a small meek boy dressed in a sort of pirate's costume sitting by her please he said politely would you kindly tell me who dat man in a bullfighter's dress is that's lord merton dear said helen of troy kindly he's in the cabinet do you know what that means then is there are there two toreadors yes the other's mr joshlin he's a writer i believe uh, nobody important we've took the wrong one said william in a hoarse whisper as he rejoined the brigands 
there was two crumbs said the brigands aghast what are we going to do now said ginger william was not one to relinquish a task half done we'll have to put this one in and let the other out he said a few minutes later the toreador came out onto the lawn smoking a cigar if you please said a miniature brigand who seemed to rise up from the ground at his feet someone wants to see you special he says he's a german with a message quite private he doesn't want anyone else to know ah snorted the toreador throwing away his cigar show me boy he followed william to the coach-house the other brigands came behind a thrill for whatever would happen william flung open the door of the coach-house the second toreador entered the first toreador who had by this time completely lost sight of any humorous aspect the affair might previously have had in his eyes had worked himself up into a blind fury sprang upon the second toreador as he entered and threw him to the ground the second toreador pulled the first down with him and they fought fiercely in the dark upon the floor of the coach-house with inarticulate bellows of rage and rendings of clothes and hurling of curses aghast and apprehensive of consequences the brigands turned and went quickly towards the house so as to be as far as possible from the scene of the crime but all was changed at the house there was no dancing the band was mute in the middle of the ballroom was a little heap of clothes a page's costume an ace of clubs costume a gondolier's costume and a goatherd's costume and over it stood four distraught mothers mrs brown was almost hysterical the guests stood in wondering groups around the clothes have been found near the lake sobbed mrs brown there's no trace of them anywhere sobbed ginger's mother the grounds have been searched they're nowhere in the house they must have taken off their clothes to swim and they're drowned drowned now don't take on said mrs bott soothingly to the distraught mothers don't take on so dearies body'll have the lake dragged at once there's nothing to worry about the mothers went down to the lake followed by the whole assembly the brigands feeling that the situation had got far beyond their control followed cautiously in the rear keeping well in the shadow of the bushes it was bright moonlight all the guests stood round the lake gazing with mournful anticipation at its calm surface the mothers clung to each other sobbing he was always such a good boy sobbed mrs brown and he looked so sweet in his little blue suit henry v with one arm round spring was leaning over the lake and vaguely fishing in it with a garden rake that he had picked up near by you didn't know him of course he said to spring but he was such a dear little chap and so fond of me then the toreadors arrived torn and battered and cobwebby and grimy where are they they panted as they ran we've been insulted we've been outraged we've been shamefully treated we demand those boys we ah uh... they caught sight of four brigands cowering behind the bushes and sprang at them the brigands fled from them towards the lake henry v and spring blocked william's way he pushed them on to one side and both fell with a splash into the lake then the guests and fate closed round the brigands in the scene of retribution that followed robert showed himself unsympathetic even glorying in william's afflictions for a whole week after the fancy dress dance robert repeatedly proclaimed that william had spoilt his life again she'll never look at me now of course he said bitterly to his mother how could she look at the brother of the boy who nearly drowned her and the only girl i've ever met who really understood me and her mother says she's had a cold in her head ever since what was her name glory something wasn't it dear no mother impatiently that's a girl i knew ever so long ago and who never really understood me this one william entered and robert stopped abruptly how do you like those new socks i made for you dear said his mother to william are they all right william felt that his hour had come he'd had a rotten time but he was going to do just a little scoring on his own oh yes said william slowly and just to think that this time last week i didn't know them they've given an entirely new meaning to my life 
i shall give up all my life trying to be more worthy of them i've not got them on now because i don't want them profaned by people who don't know or care about them then william gave a little groan and flopped into a chair in a fainting position william said mrs brown whatever's the matter with you but robert had gone a deep purple and was creeping quickly from the room william watched him smoothing back his unsmoothable hair oh glor he ejaculated softly End of chapter 11chapter 12 of still william by rick mall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 12 the cat and the mouse william's signal failure as a student of science was not due to any lack of interest it was due to excess of zeal rather than to lack of zeal william liked to experiment he liked to experiment with his experiments he liked to put in one or two extra things and see what happened he liked to heat things when he was not told to heat them just to see what happened and strange things happened on several occasions william was deprived of his eyebrows and front hair william in this condition felt proud of himself he felt that everyone who saw him must imagine him to be the hero of some desperate adventure he cultivated a stern frown with his hairless eyebrows old stinks the science master rather liked william he kept him in for hours in the lab after school washing up innumerable test tubes and cleaning the benches as atonement for his unauthorized experiments but he would generally stay there himself as well smoking by the fire and drawing from william his views on life in general on more than one occasion he gravely accepted from william the peace offering of a licorice stick in spite of william's really well-meant efforts old stinks generally had to re-wash all the test tubes and other implements when william had gone occasionally he invited william to tea and sat fascinated at the sight of the vast amount of nourishment that william's frame seemed able to assimilate in return william lent him his original stories and plays to read for william rather fancied himself as an author and had burnt much midnight candle over the hand of death and the true story of an indian brave it is not too much to say that stinks enjoyed these far more than he did many works of better known authors but this term old stinks having foolishly contracted scarlet fever on the last days of the holidays was absent and his place was taken by mr evelyn courtenay an elegant young man with spats very sleek hair and a microscopic moustache from the moment he first saw him william felt that mr evelyn courtenay was the sort of man who would dislike him intensely his fears were not ill-founded mr courtenay disliked william's voice and william's clothes and william's appearance he disliked everything about william it is only fair to add that this dislike was heartily reciprocated by william william however was quite willing to lie low it was mr courtenay who opened the campaign he set william a hundred lines for overbalancing on his stool in an attempt to regain a piece of his litmus paper that had been taken with felonious attempt by his vis-a-vis -vis. when william expostulated he increased it to three hundred when william turning his back to his desk and encountering a whiff of hydrochloric acid gas of his neighbor's manufacture sneezed he increased it to four hundred then came a strange time for william william had previously escaped scot-free for most of his crimes now to his amazement and indignation he found himself in the unfamiliar position of a scapegoat any disturbance in william's part of the room was visited on william and quite occasionally william was not guilty of it mr evelyn courtenay having taken a dislike to william gratified his dislike to the full most people considered that this was very good for william but it was a view that was not shared by william himself he wrote lines in most of his spare time and made a thorough and systematic study of mr courtenay silently he studied his habits and his mode of life and his character 
he did this because he had a vague idea that fate might some day deliver his enemy into his hand william rarely trusted fate in vain he gleaned much of his knowledge of the ways of mr courtenay from eliza mr courtenay's maid who occasionally spent the evening with ellen the brown's housemaid his aunt's coming to dine with him to-morrow night said eliza one evening william who was whittling sticks in the back garden near the open kitchen door put his penknife in his pocket scowled and began to listen yeah it's going to be a set out and no mistake went on eliza from what i makes out he's expectin of money from her and oh my the fuss such a set out of a dinner and all i can't abide a young man what fusses to the extent he does and he says the last time she ad dinner with him she seed a mouse and screamed the place down and went orf in a off so there's got to be mouse traps down in the dining room all night before she comes as well as all the other fuss well i never said ellen william took out his penknife and moved away in search of fresh sticks to whittle but he moved away thoughtfully the next morning william had a science lesson he was still thoughtful mr evil and courtenay was jocular and facetious in the course of a few jocular remarks to the front row he said the feline species is as abhorrent to me as it was to the great napoleon contact with it destroys my nerve entirely what's he mean whispered william to his neighbor he means he don't like cats said william's neighbor well why don't he say so then said william scornfully some one near william dropped a test tube mr courtenay turned his languid eyes upon william a hundred lines brown he said pleasantly it wasn't me that did it sir said william indignantly two hundred said mr courtenay well gasped william in outraged innocence four hundred said mr courtenay william was too infuriated to reply he angrily mixed two liquids from the nearest bottles and heated them over his bunsen burner to relieve his feelings there was a loud report william blinked and wiped something warm off his face his hand was bleeding from the broken glass mr courtenay watched from a distance six hundred he said as william took a bit of test tube from his hair and to be done before saturday please down to em said ginger as he walked homeward with william yes said william bitterly and that means go to the head and you know what that means well douglas and henry and me'll all help said ginger william's countenance softened then became sphinx-like thanks he said i've thought of a better plan than that but thanks all the same william walked slowly down the road one hand was in his pocket the other held a covered basket he approached with a stern frown and many cautious glances around him the house of mr evelyn courtenay he entered the back gate warily his entry did not suggest the welcome guest or even any one who had the right of entry there was something distinctly furtive about it he made his way round to the house by the wall behind the bushes he peeped in at the dining-room window the perspiring eliza was engaged in putting the last touches to the dining table he peeped into the drawing-room window there sat mr evelyn courtenay in the most elegant of elegant dress suits engaged in the process of charming his aunt miss felicia courtenay miss felicia courtenay was elderly and grim and not very susceptible to charm but her nephew was doing his best through the open window william could hear plainly oh yes i get on splendidly aunt i'm so fond of children devoted to them in some ways of course teaching is a waste of my talent but on the whole it was here that william drew his hand from his pocket and noiselessly deposited something on the floor through the open window the something scuttled along the floor by the skirting board william withdrew into the shadow suddenly a piercing scream came from within it's a mouse evelyn help 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 more screams followed william peeped in at the window and enjoyed the diverting spectacle of miss felicia courtenay standing on a chair holding up her skirts and screaming and of mr evelyn courtenay on his knees with the poker in one hand trying to reach the mouse who had taken refuge beneath a very low sofa it was at that moment that william took terence from the basket and deposited him upon the floor 
now terence william's cat though he disliked william intensely was of a sociable disposition he found himself in a strange room with a fire upon the hearth he liked fires he did not like the basket in which he had just made his journey with william he did not wish to go in the basket again he wished to stay in the room he decided that the best policy was to make up to the occupants of the room in the hopes that they would allow him to sit on the hearth-rug in front of the fire he approached the only occupant he could see terence may have known that there was a mouse in the room or he may not he was not interested he was a lover of comfort only he was no mouser mr evelyn courtenay who was now lying at full length on the floor trying to look beneath the low sofa felt suddenly something soft and warm and furry and purring rub itself hard against his face he sprang up with a yell and leapt upon the grand piano the brute he screamed the brute it, it touched me the episode seemed to have driven him into a state closely bordering on lunacy william's cat purred ingratiatingly at the foot of the grand piano catch the mouse screamed miss felicia courtenay get down catch the mouse i can't while that brute's in the room screamed mr evelyn courtenay from the grand piano i i can't i tell you i, I can't bear him it, it touched me you coward i'm going to faint in a minute so am i i tell you i can't get down he's looking at me i shall never forget this never you brute you 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 tyrant i shan't either go away you nasty beast go away at that moment two things happened the mouse put its little whiskered head out of its retreat to reconnoitre and terence determined to make friends with this new and strange acquaintance leapt upon the grand piano on to the very top of mr evelyn courtenay two screams rent the air one a fine soprano one a fine tenor i can see it oh this will kill me get down you brute get down at this critical moment william entered like a deus ex machina he swooped down upon the mouse before it realized what was happening caught it by its tail and dropped it through the open window then he picked up terence and did the same with him miss felicia courtenay tearful and trembling descended from her chair and literally fell upon william's neck oh you brave boy she sobbed you brave boy what should i have done without you i happened to see you through the window trying to catch the mouse said william looking at her with an inscrutable expression and wide innocent eyes and i didn't want to disturb you by coming in myself so i just put the cat in and when i saw that wasn't no good i just come in myself mr evelyn courtenay had descended hastily from his grand piano and was smoothing his hair with both hands and glaring at william thank the dear little boy evelyn said miss felicia giving her nephew a cold glance i don't know what i should ever have done without his protection he practically saved my life mr evelyn courtenay glared still more ferociously at william and muttered threateningly a little child rushing in where grown men fear to tread misquoted miss felicia sententiously still beaming fondly at william he must certainly stay to dinner after that mr evelyn courtenay to his fury had to provide william with a large meal to which william did full justice munching in silence except when miss felicia's remarks demanded an answer miss felicia ignored her nephew and talked with fond and grateful affection to william only it was william who volunteered the information that her nephew taught him science i hope he's kind to you said miss felicia william gave her a pathetic glance like one who wishes to avoid a dark and painful subject i, I expect he means to be he said sadly william departed immediately after dinner he seldom risked an anticlimax. he possessed the artistic instinct mr evelyn courtenay accompanied him to the door no need to talk of this my boy said mr courtenay with elaborate nonchalance william made no answer and uh, no need to do those lines said mr courtenay uh, thank you said william good night he walked briskly down the road he'd enjoyed the evening its only drawback was that he could never tell anyone about it for william with all his faults was a sportsman but he'd scored he'd scored he had scored
cord and old stinks was coming back next week unable to restrain his feelings william turned head over heels in the road end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of still william by rick mall crompton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. William and Uncle George It was William who bought the horn-rimmed spectacles. He bought them for sixpence from a boy who had bought them for a shilling from a boy to whose dead aunt's cousin's grandfather they had belonged. William was intensely proud of them. He wore them in school all the morning. They made everything look vague and blurred, but he bore that inconvenience gladly, for the sake of the prestige they lent him. Ginger borrowed them for the afternoon, and got all his sums wrong, because he could not see the figures, but that was a trifling matter, compared with the joy of wearing horn-rimmed spectacles. Douglas bagged them for the next day, and Henry for the day after that william had many humble requests for the loan of them from other boys which he coldly refused the horn-rimmed spectacles were to be the badge of superiority of the outlaws on the third day one of the masters who discovered that the horn-rimmed spectacles were the common property of william and his boon companions and were optically speaking unnecessary forbade their future appearance in school the outlaws then wore them in turn on the way to school and between lessons my father said douglas proudly as he and william and ginger strolled through the village together got a pair of spectacles and's got her wear em always not like these objected william who was wearing the horn-rimmed spectacles not great thick uns like these well anyway said ginger i've got a aunt what's got false teeth that's nothing said william false teeth isn't like spectacles they look just like ornery teeth you can't see they're false teeth no but you can hear em said ginger they tick well anyway said douglas my cousin knows a man what's got her false eye it stays still while the other looks around well said william determined not to be outdone my father knows a man what's got her false leg i think i remember once hearing said ginger somewhat vaguely about a man with all false arms and legs and only his body real that's nothing said william giving rein to his glorious imagination i once heard of a man with a false body and only legs and arms real his companion's united yell of derision intimated to him that he had overstepped the bounds of credulity and adjusting his horn-rimmed spectacles with a careless flourish he continued unperturbed or i might have dreamed about him i don't quite remember which i bet you dreamed about him said ginger indignantly i bet it is impossible how the stomach work if he hadn't got a real one and i bet it is possible said william stoutly it work with machinery and wheels and springs and things same as clockworks and he's apt to wind it up every morning the other outlaws were impressed by william's tone of certainty well said ginger guardedly i don't say it isn't possible i only say it improbable the last knowledge of the resources of the english language displayed by this remark vaguely depressed the others and they dropped the subject hastily i can walk like a man with a false leg said william and he began to walk along swinging one stiff leg with a flourish well i can click my teeth as if they were false said ginger and proceeded to bite the air vigorously i bet i can look as if i got a glass eye said douglas making valiant if unsuccessful efforts to keep one eye still and roll the other they walked on in silence each of them wholly and frowningly absorbed in his task william limping stiffly ginger clicking valiantly and douglas rolling his eyes a little short-sighted man who met them stopped still and stared in amazement dear me he said i've got a false leg william condescended to explain and he indicating douglas got a glass eye and he's got false teeth dear me gasped the little old man how very extraordinary they left him staring after them douglas wildly cross-eyed set off at the turning to his home he was laboring under the delusion that he had at last acquired the knack of keeping one eye still while he rolled the other though william and ginger informed him repeatedly that he was mistaken they're both movin 
they're not i tell you one's keeping still i can feel it keeping still well we can see it can't we we ought to know i don't care what you can see i know what i do don't i it's my eye and i move it and i ought to be able to tell him when i'm not moving it so there he rolled both eyes at them fiercely as he departed william and ginger went on together stumping and clicking with great determination suddenly they both stopped on the footpath just outside a door that opened straight on to the street stood a bath chair in it were a rug and a scarf here's my bath chair said william stirring walking like this with a false leg all the time he sat down in the chair with such a jerk that his horn-rimmed spectacles fell off though it was somewhat of a relief to see the world clearly he missed the air of distinction that he imagined they imparted to him and picking them up adjusted them carefully on his nose the sensation of being the possessor of both horn-rimmed spectacles and a false leg had been a proud and happy one he wrapped the rug round his knees you'd better push me a bit he said to ginger's not tyrin havin false teeth you better be the one to push but ginger unlike william was not quite lost in his role it's not our bath chair someone'll be comin out and makin a fuss if we start playin with it besides with some indignation how do you know havin false teeth isn't tyrin ever tried em and let me tell you clickin is tyrin it's makin my jaws ache somethin terrible oh come on said william impatiently do stop talkin about your false teeth anyway couldn't rest your jaws ridin in a chair could it a chair couldn't rest your jaw or your teeth could it well it could rest my false leg and anyway we're only go a bit and whosoever it is won't miss it before we bring it back and anyway i don't suppose they mind lending it to help a poor old man with a false leg and another with false teeth not much helpin me pushin you said ginger bitterly your false teeth seems to be makin you very grumpy said william severely oh come on they'll be comin out soon ginger began to push the bath chair at first reluctantly but finally warmed to his task he tore along at a breakneck speed william's face was wreathed in blissful smiles he held the precious horn-rimmed spectacles in place with one hand and with the other clutched on to the side of the bath chair which swayed wildly as ginger pursued his lightning and uneven way they stopped for breath at the end of the street you're a jolly good pusher said william praise from william was rare ginger in spite of his breathlessness looked pleased oh that's nothing he eh? said modestly i could do it ten times as fast as that i'm a bit tired of false teeth though i'm going to stop clickin for a bit william tucked in his rug and adjusted his spectacles again do i look like a poor old man he said proudly ginger gave a scornful laugh no you don't you've got her boy's face you've got no lines nor whiskers nor screwed upness like an old man william drew his mouth down and screwed up his eyes into a hideous contortion do i now he said as clearly as he could through his distorted mask of twisted muscles ginger looked at him dispassionately you look like a kinder monkey now he said william took the long knitted scarf that was at the bottom of the bath chair and wound it round and round his head and face till only his horn-rimmed spectacles could be seen do i now he said in a muffled voice ginger stared at him in critical silence for a minute and said yes you do now at least you look as if you might be anything now all right said william in his faraway muffled voice pretend i'm an old man wheel me back now slowly mind cause i'm an old man they began the return journey ginger walked very slowly chiefly because it was uphill and he was still out of breath william leant back feebly in his chair enjoying the role of aged invalid his horn-rimmed spectacles peering out with an air of deep wisdom from a waist of woolen muffler suddenly a woman who was passing stopped uncle george she said in a tone of welcome and surprise she was tall and thin and gray-haired and skittish-looking and gaily dressed well this is a pleasant surprise she said when you didn't answer our letter we thought you really weren't going to come to see us we really did and now i find you on your way to our house 
what a treat for us i'd have known you anywhere dear uncle george even if i hadn't recognized the bath chair and the muffler that i knitted for you on your last birthday how sweet of you to wear it and you're looking so well she dropped a vague kiss upon the woolen muffler and then turned to ginger this little boy can go i can take you on to the house she slipped a coin into ginger's hand now run away little boy i'll look after him ginger after one bewildered look fled and the lady began to push william's chair along briskly william was so entirely taken aback that he could for the moment devise no plan of action and meekly allowed himself to be propelled down the village street with an instinctive desire to conceal his identity he had pulled the rug up to his elbows and arranged the flowing ends of the all-enveloping scarf to cover the front of his coat wistfully he watched ginger's figure which was fast disappearing in the distance then the tall female bent down and shouted into his ear and how are you dear uncle george william looked desperately round for some chance of escape but saw none feeling that some reply was necessary and not wishing to let his voice betray him he growled oh so glad yelled the tall lady into the muffler so glad if you think you're better you will be better you know as i always used to tell you to his horror william saw that he was being taken in through a large gateway and up a drive he felt as though he had been captured by some terrible enemy would he ever escape what would the dreadful woman do to him when she found out he couldn't breathe and he could hardly see and he didn't know what was going to happen to him he growled again rather ferociously and she leant down to the presumptive region of his ear and shouted much better dear uncle george ever so much better it's only a question of will-power she left him on a small lawn and went through an opening in the box hedge william could hear her talking to some people on the other side he's come uncle george has come she said in a penetrating whisper oh dear said another voice he's so trying what shall we do he's wealthy anyway we may as well try to placate him a bit hush he'll hear you oh no he's been as deaf as a post for years how did you meet him frederica darling i met him quite by accident said frederica darling in her shrill and cheerful voice he was being brought here by a boy and did you recognize him it's ten years since you saw him last i recognize the bath chair it's the one poor dear aunt ferdinanda used to have and the darling was wearing that scarf i knitted for him oh but i think i'd have recognized the old man anyway he hadn't changed a bit though he's dreadfully muffled up you know he was always so frightened of fresh air and he shrunk a bit i think you know old people do and i'm afraid he's as touchy as ever he was quite huffy on the way here because i said that if he'd will to be better he would be better that always annoyed him but i must be true to my principles mustn't i hadn't someone better go to him wouldn't it annoy him to be left alone oh i don't know he's not sociable you know and as deaf as a post and perhaps you'd better explain to the boys frederica oh yes it's your great uncle george you know ever so old and we've not seen him for ten years and he's just come to live here with his male attendant you know taken a furnished house and though we asked him to come to see us he's most eccentric you know simply won't see any one at his own house he never even answered and we thought he must be still annoyed i told him the last time i saw him ten years ago that if only he'd think he could walk he'd be able to walk and it annoyed him but i must be true to my principles anyway to my surprise i found him on his way to our house this afternoon and frederica paused for breath we'd better go to him dear he might be feeling lonely william was far from lonely he was listening with mingled interest and apprehension to the conversation on the other side of the hedge and revolving in his mind the question whether they'd see him if he crawled across the lawn to the gate or perhaps it would be better to make a dash for it tear off the rug and muffler and run for all he was worth to the gate and down the road he had almost decided to do that when they all suddenly appeared through the opening in the hedge william gave a gasp as he saw them first came frederica the tall and agile lady who had captured him 
next a very old lady with a roman nose and expression of grim determination and a pair of lorgnettes next came a young curate next a muscular young man in a college blazer and last a little girl william knew the little girl her name was emmeline and she went to the same school as william and william detested her william now allowed himself the slight satisfaction of putting out his tongue at her beneath his expansive muffler but his heart sank as they surrounded him they all surveyed him with the greatest interest he looked about desperately once more for some way of escape but his opportunity has gone like the psalmist enemies they closed him in on every side nervously he pulled up his rug spread out his muffler and crouched yet further down in his bath chair you remember mother dear uncle george don't you screamed frederica into the muffler the dignified dame raised the lorgnette and held out a majestic hand william merely growled he was beginning to find the growl effective they all hastily took a step back sulking explained frederica in her penetrating whisper sulking just because i told him on the way here that if he willed to be well he would be well it always annoyed him but i must be true to my principles mustn't i even if it makes him sulk even if he cuts me out of his will i must hush frederica he'll hear you no dear he's almost stone deaf she leant down again to his ear is your deafness any better uncle she screamed she seemed to regard uncle george as her own special property william growled again the circle drew another step farther back the old lady looked anxious i'm afraid he's ill she said i hope it's nothing infectious james i think you'd better examine him federica drew one of the bashful and unwilling young men forward this is your great nephew james she shouted dear uncle george he's a medical student and he's so loved to talk to you the rest withdrew to the other end of the lawn and watched proceedings from a distance it would be difficult to say whether james or william felt the more desperate er how are you uncle george said james politely then remembering uncle george's deafness changed his soft bass to a shrill tenor how are you william did not answer he was wondering how long it would be before one of them tore off his rug and muffler and horn-rimmed spectacles and hoping that it would not be either of the young men who would administer punishment er uh, may i uh, feel your pulse went on james then remembered and yelled pulse william sat on his hands and growled james mopped his brow oh if i could see your tongue uh, uh, tongue you seem to be in pain perhaps tongue allow me he took hold of the muffler about William's head. William gave a sudden shake and a fierce growl, and James started back as though he had been bitten. William was certainly perfecting the growl. It was gaining a note of savage, almost blood-curdling ferocity. James gazed at him apprehensively. Then, as another growl began to arise from the depth of William's chair, hastily rejoined the others i've uh, uh, exa examined him he said making a gesture as though to loosen his collar and still gazing apprehensively in the direction of uncle george i've uh, examined him there's nothing uh, fundamentally wrong with him he's just uh, got a foul temper that's all it is a case for you then i think jonathan said the old lady grimly frederica drew the second reluctant youth across the lawn this is your great nephew jonathan she yelled into the muffler he's in the church he's looking forward so much to a talk with you dear uncle george with a sprightly nod at the horn-rimmed spectacles she departed jonathan smiled mirthlessly and then he proceeded to shout at william with sotto voce interjections good afternoon uncle george confound you we're so glad to see you don't think we expect to see a lot of you now worse luck we want to be a happy united family you crusty old mummy we hope uh, we hope uh he couldn't think what else to hope so purple with the effort of shouting he stopped for breath william who was enjoying this part chuckled jonathan with a sigh of relief departed he went to the others who were watching expectantly it's all right he said airily the old chap's quite good-tempered now my few words seem to hit the spot william watched the group wondering what was going to be done next and who was going to do it 
he hardly dared move in case his spectacles or muffler or rug fell off and revealed him to the cold light of day he felt instinctively that the cold light of day would have little pity on him then he saw two maids come round the house to the lawn one carried a table and the other a tray on which were some cakes that made william's mouth water would he oh would he have to sit fasting and watch these unworthy people eat those glorious cakes and oh scrummy there was a bowl of fruit salad surely oh surely he deserved a bit of food after all he'd been through his eyes shone eagerly and hungrily through his horn-rimmed spectacles if he just undid his muffler enough to eat a bit of fruit salad and that chocolate cake and the one with green icing oh and that one with nuts on the top surely eating just a little like that wouldn't give him away he wouldn't starve forever and what was going to happen to him anyway he couldn't stay all his life in a bath chair in that garden starving and growling at people he was jolly sick of it already but he didn't know what to do they'd have to find out at some time and he didn't know what they'd do when they did find out and he was sick of the whole thing and it was all ginger's fault going off and leaving him and he looked across the lawn at them his gaze through the horn-rimmed spectacles was wistful to his horror he saw emmeline being launched across the lawn to him by frederica emmeline wore a super sweet expression and carried in her hand a bunch of roses she laid them on the bath chair with an artless and confiding smile dear great uncle george she said in her squeaky little voice we're all so glad to see you and love you so much and the elders were watching the tableau with proud smiles and william was summoning his breath for a really ferocious growl when suddenly everyone turned around a little old man purple with anger had appeared running up the drive where is he screamed the little old man in fury they said he came in here my bath chair where is he the thief the blackguard how dare he i'll teach him where is he william did not wait to be taught with admirable presence of mind he tore off his wrappings flung away his horned spectacles and dashed with all his might through the opening in the hedge and across the back lawn the little old man caught up a trowel that the gardener had left near a bed and flung it after william it caught him neatly on the ankle and changed his swift flight to a limp dear uncle george cooed frederica to the old man i don't know what's happened but i always said you could walk quite well if you liked with a howl of fury the old man turned on her snatched up the bowl of fruit salad and emptied it over her meanwhile the muscular young medical student had overtaken william just as he was disappearing through the gate and in spite of william's struggles was administering a fairly adequate physical correction occasionally nemesis did overtake william the next day william met ginger on the way to school well you're brave aren't you he said sarcastically going off and leaving me and not rescuing me nor nothing oh i like that said ginger indignantly what could i do i'd like to know you would ride and me push for you been selfish and pushed me and rode you'd have got off this was unanswerable but while william was trying to think out an answer ginger said scornfully you still practice in having a false leg i stopped clicking ever so long ago i should think you was tired of that old game well i'm not said william with great self-possession i'm going to go on some time yet just to show i can just then emmeline appeared on the road wearing the horn-rimmed spectacles i say those are ours said ginger oh no said emmeline with a shrill triumphant laugh <laughs> i found them on our front lawn they're mine now you ask william brown how i found them on our front lawn but they're mine now so there for a moment william was nonplussed then a beatific smile overspread his freckled face dear great uncle george he mimicked in a shrill falsetto we're so glad to see you we love you so much emmeline gave a howl of anger and ran down the road holding her horn-rimmed spectacles on as she ran boo-hoo she sobbed nasty william brown a-coming into our garden and breathing our air and running over our beds and making uncle george cross and wasting our fruit salad and being nasty to me nasty william brown they're my spectacles they is oh boo i say what happened yesterday said ginger when she had disappeared 
oh i almost forgot said william evasively i growled at him and scared him no end and i didn't get any tea and he threw something at me oh a lot of things like that i almost forgot but with sudden interest how much did she give you sixpence said ginger proudly taking it out of his pocket come on said william joyfully giving a cheerful little limp forward come on and let's spend it End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen of Still William by Rick Mall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen William and Saint Valentine. William was, as not infrequently, under a cloud. His mother had gone to put some socks into one of his bedroom drawers, and had found that most of the drawer space was occupied by insects of various kinds, including a large stag beetle, and that along the side of the drawer was their larder, consisting of crumbly bits of bread and a little pool of marmalade. "'But it eats marmalade,' pleaded William. "'The stag beetle does. I know it does. The marmalade gets a little less every day.' because it's soaking into the wood said mrs brown sternly that's why i don't know why you do such things william but they're doing no harm said william they're friends of mine they know me the stag beetle does anyway and the others will soon i'm teaching the stag beetle tricks honest it knows me and it knows its name call albert to it and see if it moves i shall do nothing of the sort william take the creatures out at once i shall have to scrub the drawers and have everything washed you've got marmalade and crumbs all over your socks and handkerchiefs well i moved em right away when i put them in they're sort of spread back why ever didn't you keep the things outside i wanted to have em and play with em at night and morning and here's one of them dead i hope it didn't die of anything catching said william anxiously i shouldn't like albert to get anything there's no reason for him to die they got plenty of food and plenty of room to play about in and air gets in through the keyhole take them away william lovingly gathered up his stag beetle and wood lice and centipedes and earwigs and took them downstairs leaving his mother groaning over the crumbly marmalady drawer he put them into cardboard boxes and punched holes in the tops he put albert the gem of the collection in a small box in his pocket then it began to rain and he came back to the house there was nothing to do he wandered from room to room no one was in the only sounds were the sounds of the rain and his mother furiously scrubbing at the drawer upstairs he wandered into the kitchen it was empty on the table by the window was a row of jam jars freshly filled and covered his mother had made jam that morning william stood by the table half sprawling over it resting his head on his hands and watched the rain disconsolately there was a small knife on the table william took it up and still watching the rain absent-mindedly nicked in all the taut parchment covers one by one he was thinking of albert as he nicked in the parchment he was vaguely conscious of a pleasant sensation like walking through heaped-up fallen leaves or popping fuchsia buds or breaking ice or treading on nice fat acorns he was vaguely sorry when the last one was nicked then his mother came in william she screamed as she saw the jam jars what have i done now said william innocently oh, oh the, those i just wasn't thinking what i was doing sorry mrs brown sat down weakly on a kitchen chair i don't think anyone ever had a boy like you ever before william she said with deep emotion the work of hours and it's after time for you to get ready for miss loma's class do go and then perhaps i'll get a little peace miss lomas lived at the other end of the village she held a bible class for the sons and daughters of gentlefolk every saturday afternoon she did it entirely out of the goodness of her heart and she had more than once regretted the goodness of her heart since that son of gentlefolk known to the world as william brown had joined her class she had worked hard to persuade mrs brown to send him she thought that she could influence william for good she realized when william became a regular attendant of her class that she had considerably overestimated her powers william could only be persuaded to join the class because most of his friends not without much exertion of maternal authority went there every saturday 
but something seemed to have happened to the class since william joined it the beautiful atmosphere was destroyed no beautiful atmosphere was proof against william every saturday miss lomas hoped that something would have happened to william so that he could not come and every saturday william hoped equally fervently that something would have happened to miss lomas so that she could not take the class there was something dispirited and hopeless in their greeting of each other william took his seat in the dining-room where miss lomas always held her class he glanced round at his fellow students greeting his friends ginger and henry and douglas with a hideous contortion of his face then he took a large nut out of his pocket and cracked it with his teeth not in here william said miss lomas faintly i was going to put the bits of shell into my pocket said william i wasn't going to put it on your carpet or anything but if you don't want me to do it's all right he said obligingly putting nut and dismembered shell into his pocket now we'll say our verses said miss lomas brightly but keeping a fascinated apprehensive eye on william william you begin Afraid I didn't learn em, said William very politely. I was going to last night, and I got out my Bible, and I got reading about Jonah in the whale's belly, and I thought maybe it'd do me more good than St. Stephen's speech, and it was ever so much more interesting. That will do, William, said Miss Lomas. We'll uh, all take our verses for granted this afternoon, I think. Now I want to give you a little talk on brotherly love. Who's St. Valentine? said William, who was burrowing in his prayer book why william said miss lomas patiently well his day seems to be coming this month said william miss lomas with a good deal of confusion launched into a not very clear account of the institution of st valentine's day well i don't think much of him as a saint was william's verdict as he took out another nut and absent-mindedly cracked it writing soppy letters to girls instead of getting martyred properly like peter and the others miss lomas put her hand to her head you misunderstand me william she said what i meant to say was uh, well suppose we leave st valentine till later and have our little talk on brotherly love first so oh, ow albert's box had been accidentally opened in william's pocket and albert was now discovered taking a voyage of discovery up miss lomas's jumper miss lomas's spectacles fell off she tore off albert and rushed from the room William gathered up Albert and carefully examined him. She might have hurt him, throwing him about like that, he said sternly. She ought to be more careful. Then he replaced Albert tenderly in his box. Give us a nut, said Ginger. Soon all the sons and daughters of gentlefolk were cracking nuts, and William was regaling them with a racy account of Jonah in the whale's belly and trying to entice Albert to show off his tricks seems to me said william at last thoughtfully looking round the room we might get up a good game in this room something sort of quiet i mean just till she comes back but the room was mercifully spared one of william's quiet games by the entrance of miss dobson miss lomas's cousin who was staying with her miss dobson was very young and very pretty she had short golden curls and blue eyes and small white teeth and an attractive smile my cousin's not well enough to finish the lesson she said so i'm going to read to you till it's time to go home now let's be comfortable come and sit on the hearth rug that's right i'm going to read to you scalped by the reds william drew a deep breath of delight at the end of the first chapter he had decided that he wouldn't mind coming to this sort of bible class every day at the end of the second he had decided to marry miss dobson as soon as he grew up when william woke up the next morning his determination to marry miss dobson was unchanged he had previously agreed quite informally to marry joan crew his friend and playmate and adorer but joan was small and dark-haired and rather silent she was not gloriously grown up and tall and fair and vivacious william was aware that marriage must be preceded by courtship and that courtship was an arduous business it was not for nothing that william had a sister who was acknowledged to be the beauty of the neighbourhood and a brother who was generally involved in a passionate if short-lived affaire d'amour william had ample opportunities of learning how it was done so far he had wasted these opportunities or only used them in a spirit of mockery and ridicule but now he determined to use them seriously and to the full 
he went to the garden shed directly after breakfast and discovered that he had made the holes in his cardboard boxes rather too large and the inmates had all escaped during the night it was a blow but william had more serious business on hand than collecting insects and he still had albert he put his face down to where he imagined albert's ear to be and yelled albert with all the force of his lungs albert moved in fact scuttled wildly up the side of his box well he certainly knows his name now said william with a sigh of satisfaction it's took enough trouble to teach him that i'll go on with tricks now he went to school after that albert accompanied him but was confiscated by the french master just as william and ginger were teaching it a trick the trick was to climb over a pencil and albert who was laboring under a delusion that freedom lay beyond the pencil was picking it up surprisingly well william handed him to the french master shut up in his box and was slightly comforted for his loss by seeing the master on opening it get his fingers covered with albert's marmalade ration for the day which was enclosed in the box with albert the master emptied albert out of the window and william spent break in fruitless search for him calling albert in his most persuasive tones in vain for albert had presumably returned to his mourning family for a much-needed rest cure well i call it stealin said william sternly takin beetles that belong to other people it'd serve em right if i turned a bolshevist i don't suppose they'd mind what you turn said ginger unfeelingly but with perfect truth it was a half-holiday that afternoon and to the consternation of his family william announced his intention of staying at home instead of as usual joining his friends the outlaws in their lawless pursuits but william some people are coming to tea said mrs brown helplessly i know said william i thought perhaps you'd like me to be in to help with him the thought of this desire for william's social help attributed to her by william left mrs brown speechless but ethel was not speechless well of course she remarked to the air in front of her that means that the whole afternoon is spoilt william could think of no better retort to this than oh yes it does does it well i never though he uttered these words in a tone of biting sarcasm and with what he fondly imagined to be a sarcastic smile even william felt them to be rather feeble and added hastily in his normal manner "Fraid i'll eat up all the cakes i suppose well i will if i get the chance william dear said mrs brown roused to effort by the horror of the vision thus called up do you think it's quite fair to your friends to desert them like this it's the only half holiday in the week you know oh it's all right said william i've told em i'm not coming they'll get on all right oh yes they'll be all right said ethel in a meaning voice and william could think of no adequate reply but william was determined to be at home that afternoon he knew that lawrence henlock ethel's latest admirer was expected and william wished to study at near quarters the delicate art of courtship he realized that he could not marry miss dobson for many years to come but he did not see why his courtship of her should not begin at once he was going to learn how it was done from lawrence henlock and ethel he spent the earlier part of the afternoon collecting a few more insects for his empty boxes he was still mourning bitterly the loss of albert he deliberately did not catch a stag beetle that crossed his path because he was sure that it was not albert he found an earwig that showed distinct signs of intelligence and put it in a large airy box with a spider for company and some leaves and crumbs and a bit of raspberry jam for nourishment he did not give it marmalade because marmalade reminded him so poignantly of albert then he went indoors there were several people in the drawing-room he greeted them rather coldly his eye roving round the while for what he sought he saw it at last ethel and a tall lank young man sitting in the window alcove in two comfortable chairs talking vivaciously and confidentially william took a chair from the wall and carried it over to them put it down by the young man's chair and sat down good afternoon said william at last uh good afternoon said the young man there was another silence hadn't you better go and speak to the others said ethel i spoke to them said william there was another silence don't you want to go and play with your friends asked the young man 
No, thank you, said William. Silence again. I think Mrs. Franks would like you to go and talk to her, said Ethel. No, I don't think she would, said William, with perfect truth. The young man took out a shilling and handed it to William. Go and buy some sweets for yourself, he said. William put the shilling in his pocket. Thanks, he said. I'll go and get them tonight when you've all gone. There was another and yet deeper silence. Then Ethel and the young man began to talk together again. They had evidently decided to ignore William's presence. William listened with rapt attention. He wanted to know what you said and the sort of voice you said it in. St. Valentine's Day next week, said Lawrence soulfully. Oh, no one takes any notice of that nowadays, said Ethel. I'm going to, said Lawrence. I thought it's a beautiful idea. It's meaning, you know, true love. If I send you a valentine, will you accept it? Oh, that depends on the valentine, said Ethel with a smile. It's the thought that's behind it that's the vital thing, said Lawrence soulfully. It's that that matters, Ethel. You're in all my waking dreams. Oh, I'm sure I'm not, said Ethel. You are. Has anyone told you before that you're a perfect Botticelli? Heaps of people, said Ethel calmly. I was thinking about love last night, said Lawrence. Love at first sight. That's the only sort of love. When first I saw you, my heart leapt at the sight of you. Lawrence was a great reader of romances. I think that we're predestined for each other. We must have known each other in former existences. We do speak up, said William irritably. You're speaking so low that I can't hear what you're saying. What? The young man turned a flaming face of fury on to him. William returned his gaze quite unabashed. I don't mean I want you to shout, said William. Just speak up so I can hear. The young man turned to Ethel. Can you get a wrap and come into the garden, he said. Oh, yes, I've got one in the hall, said Ethel, rising. William fetched his coat and patiently accompanied them round the garden. What do people mean by saying they'll send a valentine, mother, said William that evening. I thought he was a sort of saint. I don't see how you can send a saint to anyone, especially when he's dead and in the prayer book. Oh, it's just a figure of speech, William, said Mrs. Brown vaguely. A figure of what? said William blankly. I mean, it's a kind of Christmas card, only it's a valentine, I mean. Well, it had gone out in my day, but I remember your grandmother showing me some that had been sent to her, dried ferns and flowers pasted on cardboard. Very pretty. Seems sort of silly to me, said William, after silent consideration. People were more romantic in those days, said Mrs. Brown with a sigh. Oh, I'm romantic, said William, if that means being in love. I'm that all right, but I don't see any sense in sending pasted ferns and dead saints and things. But still, determinately, I'm going to do all the sort of thing they do. What are you talking about, William? said Mrs. Brown. Then Ethel came in. She looked angrily at William. Mother, William behaved abominably this afternoon. Well, I thought he was rather good, dear, said Mrs. Brown mildly. What did I do wrong? said William with interest. Followed us around everywhere, listening to everything we said. Well, I just listened, didn't I? said William rather indignantly. I didn't interrupt, except when I couldn't hear or couldn't understand. There's nothing wrong with just listening, is there? But we didn't want you, said Ethel furiously. Oh, that, said William. Well, I can't help people not wanting me, can I? That's not my fault. Interest in St. Valentine's Day seemed to have infected the whole household. On February 13th, William came upon his brother Robert, wrapping up a large box of chocolates. What's that? said William. A valentine, said Robert shortly. Well, Miss Lomas said it was a dead saint, and Mother said it was a pasted fern, and now you start saying it's a box of chocolates. No one seems to know what it is. Who's it for, anyway? Doreen Dobson, said Robert, answering without thinking and with a glorifying blush. Oh, I say, said William indignantly, you can't. I've bagged her. I'm going to do a firm for her. I've had her ever since the Bible class. Shut up and get out, said Robert. Robert was twice William's size. William shut up and got out. The Lomas family was giving a party on St. Valentine's Day, and William had been invited with Robert and Ethel. William spent two hours on his valentine. He could not find a fern, so he picked a large spray of yew tree instead. There was no time to dry it, so he tried to affix it to paper as it was. 
at first he tried with a piece of note paper and flour and water but except for a generous coating of himself with the paste there was no result the ewe refused to yield to treatment it was too strong and too large for its paper fortunately however he found a large piece of thick cardboard about the size of a drawing board and a bottle of glue in the cupboard of his father's writing desk it took the whole bottle of glue to fix the spray of yew tree on to the cardboard and the glue mingled freely with the flour and water on william's clothing and person finally he surveyed his handiwork well i don't see much in it now it's done he said but i'm jolly well going to do all the things they do do he went to put on his overcoat to hide the ravages beneath and met mrs brown in the hall why are you wearing your coat dear she said solicitously are you feeling cold no i'm just getting ready to go out to tea that's all said william but you aren't going out to tea for half an hour or so yet no but but you always say that i ought to start gettin ready in good time said william virtuously yes of course dear that's very thoughtful of you said mrs brown touched william spent the time before he started to the party inspecting his insect collection he found that the spider had escaped and the earwig was stuck fast in the raspberry jam he freed it washed it and christened it fred it was beginning to take albert's place in his affection then he set off to miss lomas carrying his valentine under his arm he started out before ethel and robert because he wanted to begin his courtship of miss dobson before any one else was in the field miss lomas opened the door she paled slightly as she saw william oh uh, william she said without enthusiasm i've come to tea william said and added hastily i've been invited you're rather early said miss lomas yes i thought i'd come early so's to be sure to be on time said william entering and wiping his feet on the mat which room are we going to have tea in with a gesture of hopelessness miss lomas showed him into the empty drawing-room it's miss dobson i've really come for exclaimed william obligingly as he sat down miss lomas fled but miss dobson did not appear william spent the interval wrestling with his valentine he had carried its sticky side towards his coat, and it now adhered closely to him. He managed at last to tear it away, leaving a good deal of glue and bits of yew tree still attached to his coat. No one came. He resisted the temptation to sample a plate of cakes on a side table, and amused himself by pulling sticky bits of yew off his coat and throwing them into the fire from where he sat. A good many landed on the hearthrug one attached itself to a priceless chinese vase on the mantelpiece william looked at what was left of his valentine with a certain dismay well he didn't call it pretty but if it was the sort of thing they did he was jolly well going to do it that was all then the guests began to arrive robert and ethel among the first miss dobson came in with robert he handed her a large box of chocolates a valentine he said oh thank you said miss dobson blushing william took up his enormous piece of gluey cardboard with bits of battered yew adhering at intervals a valentine he said miss dobson looked at it in silence then uh, 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 what is it william she said faintly a valentine repeated william shortly annoyed at its reception oh said miss dobson robert led her over to the recess by the window which contained two chairs william followed carrying his chair he sat down beside them both ignored him quite a nice day isn't it said robert oh, isn't it said miss dobson miss dobson said william i'm always dreaming of you when i'm awake what a pretty idea of yours to have a valentine's day party said robert do you think so said miss dobson coyly has anyone ever told you that you're like a bottled cherry said william doggedly do you know this is the first valentine i've ever given anyone said robert miss dobson lowered her eyes oh is it she said i've been thinking about love at first sight said william monotonously i got such a fright when i first saw you i think we're pre-existed for each other i will you allow me to take you out in my side-car to-morrow said robert oh how lovely said miss dobson no uh, predestined that's it said william 
neither of them took any notice of him he felt depressed and disillusioned she wasn't much catch anyway he didn't know why he'd ever bothered about her quite a lady killer william said general moult from the hearthrug beg pardon said william i say you're a lady killer i'm not said william indignant at the aspersion i've never killed no ladies i mean you're fond of ladies i think insects is nicer said william dispiritedly he was quiet for a minute or two no one was taking any notice of him and then he took up his valentine which was lying on the floor and walked out the outlaws were in the old barn they greeted william joyfully joan the only girl member was there with them william handed her his cardboard a valentine he said what's a valentine said joan who did not attend miss lomas's class some say it's a saint what wrote soppy letters to girls instead of getting martyred properly like peter and the others and some say it's a bit of fern like this and some say it's a box of chocolates well i never said joan surprised but it's beautiful of you to give it to me william it's a jolly good piece of cardboard said ginger if we scrape away this messy leaves and stuff william joined with zest in the scraping how's albert said joan after all there was no one quite like joan he'd never contemplate marrying anyone else ever again he's been took off me said william oh what a shame william but i've got another an earwig called fred i'm so glad but i like you better than any insect joan he said generously oh william do you really said joan deeply touched yes and i'm going to marry you when i grow up if you won't want me to talk a lot of soppy stuff that no one can understand oh thank you william no i won't all right now come on and let's play red indians End of chapter 14 End of Still William by Rick Mall Crompton